Part 1 of Volume 4 of Plutarch's Parallel Lives This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Berlinson Volume 4 of Plutarch's Parallel Lives of the Noble Greeks and Romans Translated by Bernadotte Perrin Alcibiades Part One. The family of Alcibiades, it is thought, may be traced back to Eurysicus, the son of Aias, as its founder, and on his mother's side he was an Alcmeonid, being the son of Dionomache, the daughter of Megacles. His father, Clinius, fitted out a trireme at his own cost, and fought it gloriously at Artemisium. He was afterwards slain at Coronea, fighting the Boeotians, and Alcibiades was therefore reared as the ward of Pericles and Ariphron, the sons of Xanthippus, his near kinsman. It is said, and with good reason, that the favour and affection which Socrates showed him contributed not a little to his reputation. Certain it is that Nicias, Demosthenes, Lamachus, Formio, Thrasybulus, and Theramenes were prominent men and his contemporaries, and yet we cannot so much as name the mother of any of them, whereas in the case of Alcibiades, we even know that his nurse, who was a Spartan woman, was called Amicla, and his tutor Zopyrus. The one fact is mentioned by Antisthenes, the other by Plato. As regards the beauty of Alcibiades, it is perhaps unnecessary to say aught, except that it flowered out of each successive season of his bodily growth, and made him, alike in boyhood, youth, and manhood, lovely and pleasant. The saying of Euripides, that beauty's autumn too is beautiful, is not always true, but it was certainly the case with Alcibiades, as with few besides, because of his excellent natural parts. Even the list that he had became his speech, they say, and made his talk persuasive and full of charm. Aristophanes notices this lisp of his in the verses wherein he ridicules Theorus. Sosius. Then Alcibiades came to me with a lisp. Said he, Quemach Theoquas, what a quaven's head he has. Xanthius. That lisp of Alcibiades hit the mark for once. And Archippus ridiculing the son of Alcibiades, says, He walks with utter wantonness, trailing his long robe behind him, that he may be thought the very picture of his father. Yes, he slants his neck awry and overworks the lisp. His character in later life displayed many inconsistencies and marked changes as was natural amid his vast undertakings and varied fortunes. He was naturally a man of many strong passions, the mightiest of which were the love of rivalry and the love of pre-eminence. This is clear from the stories recorded of his boyhood. He was once hard-pressed in wrestling, and to save himself from getting a fall, set his teeth in his opponent's arms, where they clutched him, and was like to have bitten through them. His adversary, letting go his hold, cried, You bite Alcibiades as women do. Not I, said Alcibiades, but as lions do. While still a boy he was playing knuckle-bones in the narrow street, and just as it was his turn to throw, a heavy-laden wagon came along. In the first place he bade the driver halt, since his cask lay right in the path of the wagon. 
The driver, however, was a boorish fellow, and paid no heed to him, but drove his team along. Whereupon, while the other boys scattered out of the way, Alcibiades threw himself flat on his face in front of the team, stretched himself out at full length, and bade the driver go on if he pleased. At this the fellow pulled up his beasts sharply, in terror. The spectators, too, were affrighted, and ran with shouts to help the boy. At school he usually paid due heed to his teachers, but he refused to play the flute, holding it to be an ignoble and illiberal thing. The use of the plectrum and the lyre, he argued, wrought no havoc with the bearing and appearance which were becoming to a gentleman. But let a man go to blowing on a flute, and even his own kinsman could scarcely recognize his features. Moreover, the lyre blended its tones with the voice or song of its master, whereas the flute closed and barricaded the mouth, robbing its master both of voice and speech. Flutes, then, said he, for the son of Thebes. They know not how to converse. But we Athenians, as our fathers say, have Athene for foundress and Apollo for patron, one of whom cast the flute away in disgust, and the other flayed the presumptuous flute player. Thus, half in jest and half in earnest, Alcibiades emancipated himself from this discipline, and the rest of the boys as well. For word soon made its way to them that Alcibiades loathed the art of flute-playing, and scoffed at its disciples, and rightly, too. Wherefore the flute was dropped entirely from the program of a liberal education, and was altogether despised. Among the calumnies which Antiphon heaps upon him, it is recorded that, when he was a boy, he ran away from home to Democritus, one of his lovers, and that Ariphron was all for having him proclaimed by town crier as a castaway. But Pericles would not suffer it. If he is dead, said he, we shall know it only a day the sooner for the proclamation. Whereas, if he is alive, he will, in consequence of it, be as good as dead for the rest of his life. Antiphon says also that with a blow of his stick he slew one of his attendants in the palastra of Sabertius. But these things are perhaps unworthy of belief, coming as they do from one who admits that he hated Alcibiades and abused him accordingly. It was not long before many men of high birth clustered about him, and paid him their attentions. Most of them were plainly smitten with his brilliant youthful beauty, and fondly courted him. But it was the love which Socrates had for him, that bore strong testimony to the boy's native excellence and good parts. These Socrates saw radiantly manifest in his outward person, and, fearful of the influence upon him of wealth and rank, and the throng of citizens, foreigners, and allies, who sought to preempt his affections by flattery and favor, he was fain to protect him, and not suffer such a fair flowering plant to cast its native fruit to perdition. For there is no man whom fortune so envelops and compasses about with the so-called good things of life, that he cannot be reached by the bold and caustic reasonings of philosophy, and pierced to the heart. And so it was that Alcibiades, although he was pampered from the very first, and was prevented by the companions who sought only to please him, from giving ear to one who would instruct and train him, nevertheless, through the goodness of his parts, at last saw all that was in Socrates, and clave to him, putting away his rich and famous lovers. And speedily, from choosing such an associate, and giving ear to the words of a lover 
who was in the chase for no unmanly pleasures, and begged no kisses and embraces, but sought to expose the weakness of his soul and rebuke his vain and foolish pride. He crouched, the warrior bird, like slave with drooping wings. And he came to think that the work of Socrates was really a kind of provision of the gods for the care and salvation of youth. Thus, by despising himself, admiring his friend, loving that friend's kindly solicitude, and revering his excellence, he insensibly acquired an image of love, as Plato says, to match love. And all were amazed to see him eating, exercising, and tenting with Socrates, while he was harsh and stubborn with the rest of his lovers. Some of these he actually treated with the greatest insolence, as, for example, Anitus, the son of Anthemion. This man was a lover of his, who, entertaining some friends, asked Alcibiades also to the dinner. Alcibiades declined the invitation, but after having drunk deep at home with some friends, went in revel rout to the house of Anitus took his stand at the door of the man's chamber, and observing the tables full of gold and silver beakers, ordered his slaves to take half of them and carry them home for him. He did not deign to go in, but played this prank and was off. The guests were naturally indignant, and declared that Alcibiades had treated Anitus with gross and overweening insolence. Not so, said Anatus, but with moderation and kindness. He might have taken all there were. He has left us half. He treated the rest of his lovers also after this fashion. There was one man, however, a resident alien, as they say, and not possessed of much, who sold all that he had, and brought the hundred status which he got for it to Alcibiades, begging him to accept them. Alcibiades burst out with delight at this and invited the man to dinner. After feasting him and showing him every kindness, he gave him back his gold and charged him on the morrow to complete with the farmers of the public revenues and outbid them all. The man protested because the purchase demanded a capital of many talents, but Alcibiades threatened to have him scourged if he did not do it, because he cherished some private grudge against the ordinary contractors. In the morning, accordingly, the alien went into the marketplace and increased the usual bid for the public lands by a talent. The contractors clustered angrily about him and bade him name his surety, supposing that he could find none. The man was confounded and began to draw back, when Alcibiades, standing afar off, cried to the magistrates, Put my name down, he is a friend of mine, I will be his surety. When the contractors heard this, they were at their wit's end, for they were in the habit of paying what they owed on a first purchase with the profits of a second, and saw no way out of their difficulty. Accordingly, they besought the man to withdraw his bid, and offered him money to do so. But Alcibiades would not suffer him to take less than a talent. On their offering the man the talent, he bade him take it and withdraw. To this lover he was of service in such a way. But the love of Socrates, though it had many powerful rivals, somehow mastered Alcibiades for he was of good natural parts, and the words of his teacher took hold of him, and wrung his heart and brought tears to his eyes, but sometimes he would surrender himself to the flatterers who tempted him with many pleasures, and slip away from Socrates, and suffer himself to be actually hunted down by him like a runaway slave. And yet he feared and reverenced Socrates alone, 
and despised the rest of his lovers. It was Cleanthes who said that any one beloved of him must be downed, as the wrestlers say, by the ears alone, though offering to rival lovers many other holds which he himself would scorn to take, meaning the various lusts of the body. And Alcibiades was certainly prone to be led away into pleasure. That lawless self-indulgence of his, of which Thucydides speaks, leads one to suspect this. However, it was rather his love of distinction and love of fame to which his corruptors appealed, and thereby plunged him all too soon into the ways of presumptuous scheming, persuading him that he had only to enter public life, and he would straightway cast into total eclipse the ordinary generals and public leaders. And not only that, he would even surpass Pericles in power and reputation among the Hellenes. Accordingly, just as iron, which has been softened in the fire, is hardened again by cold water, and has its particles compacted together, so Alcibiades, whenever Socrates found him filled with vanity and wantonness, was reduced to shape by the master's discourse, and rendered humble and cautious. He learned how great were his deficiencies, and how incomplete his excellence. Once, as he was getting on past boyhood, he accosted a schoolteacher and asked him for a book of Homer. The teacher replied that he had nothing of Homer's, whereupon Alcibiades fetched him a blow with his fist, and went his way. Another teacher said he had a Homer, which he had corrected himself. What? said Alcibiades. Are you teaching boys to read when you are competent to edit Homer? You should be training young men. He once wished to see Pericles, and went to his host. But he was told that Pericles could not see him. He was studying how to render his accounts to the Athenians. Were it not better for him, said Alcibiades as he went away, to study how not to render his accounts to the Athenians? While still a stripling, he served as a soldier in the campaign of Potidaea, and had Socrates for his tent-mate and comrade in action. A fierce battle took place, wherein both of them distinguished themselves. But when Alcibiades fell wounded, it was Socrates who stood over him and defended him, and with the most conspicuous bravery saved him, armor and all. The prize of valor fell to Socrates, of course, on the justest calculation, but the generals, owing to the high position of Alcibiades, were manifestly anxious to give him the glory of it. Socrates, therefore, wishing to increase his pupil's honorable ambitions, led all the rest in bearing witness to his bravery, and in begging that the crown and the suit of armor be given to him. On another occasion, in the rout of the Athenians which followed the battle of Delium, Alcibiades, on horseback, saw Socrates retreating on foot with a small company, and would not pass by, but rode by his side and defended him, though the enemy were pressing them hard and slaying many. This, however, was a later incident. He once gave Hipponicus a blow with his fist. Hipponicus, the father of Callias, a man of great reputation and influence owing to his wealth and family, not that he had any quarrel with him, or was a prey to anger, but simply for the joke of the thing, on a wager with some companions. The wanton deed was soon noised about the city, and everybody was indignant, as was natural. Early the next morning Alcibiades went to the house of Hipponicus, knocked at his door, and on being shown into his presence, laid off the cloak he wore, and bade Hipponicus scourge and chastise him as he would. 
but hipponicus put away his wrath and forgave him and afterwards gave him his daughter hipparete to wife some say however that it was not hipponicus but callias his son who gave hipparete to alcibiades with a dowry of ten talents and that afterwards when she became a mother alcibiades extracted other ten talents besides on the plea that this was the agreement should children be born and callias was so afraid of the scheming of alcibiades to get his wealth that he made public proffer to the people of his property and house in case it should befall him to die without lineal heirs hipparete was a decorous and affectionate wife but being distressed because her husband would consort with courtesans native and foreign she left his house and went to live with her brother alcibiades did not mind this but continued his wanton ways and so she had to put in her plea for divorce to the magistrate and that not by proxy but in her own person on her appearing publicly to do this as the law required alcibiades came up and seized her and carried her off home with him through the marketplace no man daring to oppose him or take her from him she lived with him moreover until her death but she died shortly after this when alcibiades was on a voyage to ephesus such violence as this was not thought lawless or cruel at all indeed the law prescribes that the wife who would separate from her husband shall go to court in person to this very end it would seem that the husband may have a chance to meet and gain possession of her possessing a dog of wonderful size and beauty which had cost him seventy minas he had its tail cut off and a beautiful tail it was too his comrades chid him for this and declared that everybody was furious about the dog and abusive of its owner but alcibiades burst out laughing and said that's just what i want i want athens to talk about this that it may say nothing worse about me his first entrance into public life they say was connected with a contribution of money to the state and was not of design he was passing by when the athenians were applauding in their assembly and asked the reason for the applause on being told that a contribution of money to the state was going on he went forward to the bima and made a contribution himself the crowd clapped their hands and shouted for joy so much so that alcibiades forgot all about the quail which he was carrying in his cloak and the bird flew away in a fright thereupon the athenians shouted all the more and many of them sprang to help him hunt the bird the one who caught it and gave it back to him was antiochus the sea captain who became in consequence a great favorite with alcibiades though great doors to public service were open to him by his birth his wealth and his personal bravery in battle and though he had many friends and followers he thought that nothing should give him more influence with the people than the charm of his discourse and that he was a powerful speaker not only do the comic poets testify but also the most powerful of orators himself who says in his speech against medius that alcibiades was a most able speaker in addition to his other gifts and if we are to trust theophrastus the most versatile and learned of the philosophers alcibiades was of all men the most capable of discovering and understanding what was required in a given case but since he strove to find not only the proper thing to say but also the proper words and phrases in which to say it and since in this last regard he was not a man of large resources he would often stumble in the midst of his speech come to a stop and pause a while 
but particular phrase eluding him. Then he would resume, and proceed with all the caution in the world. His breeds of horses were famous the world over, and so was the number of his racing chariots. No one else ever entered seven of these at the Olympic Games, neither commoner nor king, but he alone. And his coming off first, second, and fourth victor, as Thucydides says, third according to Euripides, transcends in the splendor of its renown all that ambition can aspire to in this field. The ode of Euripides to which I refer runs thus. Thee will I sing, O child of Clinius. The fair thing is victory, but fairest is what no other Helene has achieved. To run first and second and third in the contest of racing chariots, and to come off unwearied and wreathed with the olive of Zeus, to furnish theme for herald's proclamation. End of Alcibiades, Part 1《プルタークス・パラレル・ライブス》。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Berlinson. Volume 4 of Plutarch's Parallel Lives of the Noble Greeks and Romans. Translated by Bernadotte Perrin. Alcibiades. Part two. Moreover, this splendor of his at Olympia was made even more conspicuous by the emulous rivalry of the cities in his behalf. The Ephesians equipped him with a tent of magnificent adornment. The Chians furnished him with provender for his horses, and with innumerable animals for sacrifice the lesbians with wine and other provisions for his unstinted entertainment of the multitude. However, a grave calumny, or malpractice on his part, connected with this rivalry, was even more in the mouths of men. It is said, namely, that there was at Athens one Diomedes, a reputable man, a friend of Alcibiades, and eagerly desirous of winning a victory at Olympia. He learned that there was a racing chariot at Argos, which was the property of that city, and, knowing that Alcibiades had many friends and was very influential there, got him to buy the chariot. Alcibiades bought it for his friend, and then entered it, in the racing lists as his own, bidding Diomedes go hang. Diomedes was full of indignation, and called on gods and men to witness his wrongs. It appears also that a lawsuit arose over this matter, and a speech was written by Isocrates for the son of Alcibiades concerning the team of horses. In this speech, however, it is Tisius, not Diomedes, who is the plaintiff. On entering public life, though still a mere stripling, he immediately humbled all the other popular leaders except Phaeax, the son of Verestratus, and Nicias, the son of Nicaratus. These men made him fight hard for what he won. Nicias was already of mature years, and had the reputation of being a most excellent general. But Phaeax, like himself, was just beginning his career, and though of illustrious parentage, was inferior to him in other ways, and particularly as a public speaker. He seemed affable and winning in private conversation, 
rather than capable of conducting public debates. In fact, he was, as Eupolis says, a prince of talkers, but in speaking most incapable. And there is extant a certain speech written by Phaeax, against Alcibiades, wherein, among other things, it is written that the city's numerous ceremonial utensils of gold and silver were all used by Alcibiades at his regular table as though they were his own. Now there was a certain hyperbolus of the Demi Perithodiae, whom Thucydides mentions, as a base fellow, and who afforded all the comic poets, without any exception, constant material for jokes in their plays. But he was unmoved by abuse, and insensible to it, owing to his contempt of public opinion. This feeling some call courage and valor, but it is really mere shamelessness and folly. No one liked him, but the people often made use of him when they were eager to besmirch and calumniate men of rank and station. Accordingly, at the time of which I speak, persuaded by this man, they were about to exercise the vote of ostracism, by which they cripple and banish whatever man from time to time may have too much reputation and influence in the city to please them, assuaging thus their envy rather than their fear. When it was clear that the ostracism would fall on one of three men, Phaeax, Alcibiades, or Nicias, Alcibiades had a conference with Nicias, united their two parties into one, and turned the vote of ostracism upon Hyperbolus. Some say, however, that it was not Nicias, but Phaeax, with whom Alcibiades had the conference, which resulted in winning over that leader's party and banishing Hyperbolus who could have had no inkling of his fate. For no worthless or disreputable fellow had ever before fallen under this condemnation of ostracism. As Plato, the comic poet, has somewhere said in speaking of Hyperbolus, and yet he suffered worthy fate for men of old, a fate unworthy though of him and of his brands, for such as he, the Ostracon, was ne'er devised. However, the facts which have been ascertained about this case have been stated more at length elsewhere. Alcibiades was sore distressed to see Nicias no less admired by his enemies than honoured by his fellow citizens. For, although Alcibiades was resident counsel for the Lacedaemonians at Athens, and had ministered to their men who had been taken prisoners at Pylos, still they felt that it was chiefly due to Nicias that they had obtained a peace, and the final surrender of those men, and so they lavished their regard upon him and Hellenes everywhere said that it was Pericles who had plunged them into war, but Nicias who had delivered them out of it, and most men called the peace the peace of Nicias. Alcibiades was therefore distressed beyond measure, and in his envy planned a violation of the solemn treaty. To begin with, he saw that the Argives hated and feared the Spartans, and sought to be rid of them. So he secretly held out hopes to them of an alliance with Athens, and encouraged them, by conferences with the chief men of their popular party, not to fear nor yield to the Lacedaemonians, 
but to look to Athens and await her action, since she was now all but repentant, and desirous of abandoning the peace which she had made with Sparta. And again, when the Lacedaemonians made a separate alliance with the Boeotians, and delivered up Panactum to the Athenians not intact, as they were bound to do by the treaty, but dismantled, he took advantage of the Athenians' wrath at this to embitter them yet more. He raised a tumult in the assembly against Nicias, and slandered him with accusations all too plausible. Nicias himself, he said, when he was general, had refused to capture the enemy's men, who were cut off on the island of Sphecteria, and when others had captured them, he had released and given them back to the Lacedaemonians, whose favor he sought, and then he did not persuade those same Lacedaemonians, tried friend of theirs as he was, not to make a separate alliance with the Boeotians, or even with the Corinthians, and yet whenever any Hellenes wished to be friends and allies of Athens, he tried to prevent it, unless it were the good pleasure of the Lacedaemonians. Nicias was reduced to great straits by all this, but just then, by rare good fortune, as it were, an embassy came from Sparta with reasonable proposals to begin on, and with assurances that they came with full powers to adopt any additional terms that were conciliatory and just. The council received them favorably and the people were to hold an assembly on the following day for their reception. But Alcibiades feared a peaceful outcome, and managed to secure a private conference with the embassy. When they were convened, he said to them, What is the matter with you, men of Sparta? Why are you blind to the fact that the council is always moderate and courteous, towards those who have dealings with it, while the people's assembly is haughty, and has great ambitions. If you say to them that you are come with unlimited powers, they will lay their commands and compulsions upon you without any feeling. Come now, put away such simplicity as this, and if you wish to get moderate terms from the Athenians, and to suffer no compulsion at their hands, which you cannot yourselves approve, then discuss with them what would be a just settlement of your case, assuring them that you have not full powers to act. I will cooperate with you out of my regard for the Lacedaemonians. After this speech he gave them his oath, and so seduced them wholly away from the influence of Nicias. They trusted him implicitly, admired his cleverness and sagacity, and thought him no ordinary man. On the following day the people convened in assembly, and the embassy was introduced to them. On being asked by Alcibiades in the most courteous tone with what powers they had come, they replied that they were not come with full and independent powers. At once, then, Alcibiades assailed them with angry shouts, as though he were the injured party, not they, calling them faithless and fickle men, who were come on no sound errand whatsoever. The council was indignant, the assembly was enraged, and Nicias was filled with consternation and shame at the men's change of front. He was unaware of the deceitful trick which had been played upon him. After this fiasco on the part of the Lacedaemonians, Alcibiades was appointed general, and straightway brought the Argives, Mantineans, and Eleans into alliance with Athens. 
the manner of this achievement of his no one approved but the effect of it was great it divided and agitated almost all peloponnesus it arrayed against the lacedaemonians at mantinea so many warlike shields upon a single day it set at farthest remove from athens the struggle with all its risks in which when the lacedaemonians conquered their victory brought them no great advantage whereas had they been defeated the very existence of sparta would have been at stake after this battle of mantinea the oligarchs of argos the thousand set out at once to depose the popular party and make the city subject to themselves and the lacedaemonians came and deposed the democracy but the populace took up arms again and got the upper hand then alcibiades came and made the people's victory secure he also persuaded them to run long walls down to the sea and so to attach their city completely to the naval dominion of athens he actually brought carpenters and masons from athens and displayed all manner of zeal thus winning favor and power for himself no less than for his city in like manner he persuaded the people of patre to attach their city to the sea by long walls thereupon some one said to the patrensians athens will swallow you up perhaps so said alcibiades but you will go slowly and feet first whereas sparta will swallow you head first and at one gulp however he counselled the athenians to assert dominion on land also and to maintain in very deed the oath regularly propounded to their young warriors in the sanctuary of agraulus they take oath that they will regard wheat barley the vine and the olive as the natural boundaries of attica and they are thus trained to consider as their own all the habitable and fruitful earth but all this statecraft and eloquence and lofty purpose and cleverness was attended with great luxuriousness of life with wanton drunkenness and lewdness with effeminacy in dress he would trail long purple robes through the market-place and with prodigal expenditures he would have the decks of his triremes cut away that he might sleep more softly his bedding being slung on cords rather than spread on the hard planks he had a golden shield made for himself bearing no ancestral device but an eros armed with a thunderbolt the reputable men of the city looked on all these things with loathing and indignation and feared his contemptuous and lawless spirit they thought such conduct as his tyrant-like and monstrous how the common folk felt towards him has been well set forth by aristophanes in these words it yearns for him and hates him too but wants him back and again veiling a yet greater severity in his metaphor a lion is not to be reared within the state but once you've reared him up consult his every mood and indeed his voluntary contributions of money his support of public exhibitions his unsurpassed munificence towards the city the glory of his ancestry the power of his eloquence the comeliness and vigor of his person together with his experience and prowess in war made the athenians lenient and tolerant towards everything else they were forever giving the mildest of names to his transgressions calling them the product of youthful spirits and ambition 
For instance, he once imprisoned the painter Agatharchus in his house until he had adorned it with paintings for him, and then dismissed his captive with a handsome present. And when Taurius was supporting a rival exhibition, he gave him a box on the ear, so eager was he for the victory. And he picked out a woman from among the prisoners of Milos to be his mistress, and reared a son she bore him. This was an instance of what they called his kindness of heart, but the execution of all the grown men of Milos was chiefly due to him, since he supported the decree therefore. Aristophon painted Nemea with Alcibiades seated in her arms, whereat the people were delighted, and ran in crowds to see the picture. But the elders were indignant at this too, they said it smacked of tyranny and lawlessness, and it would seem that Archistratus, in his verdict on the painting, did not go wide of the mark when he said that Hellas could not endure more than one Alcibiades. Timon the misanthrope once saw Alcibiades after a successful day, being publicly escorted home from the assembly. He did not pass him by nor avoid him, as his custom was with others, but met him and greeted him, saying, It's well you're growing so, my child. You'll grow big enough to ruin all this rabble. At this some laughed, and some railed, and some gave much heed to the saying. So undecided was the public opinion about Alcibiades by reason of the unevenness of his nature. On Sicily the Athenians had cast longing eyes, even while Pericles was living, and after his death they actually tried to lay hands upon it. The lesser expeditions which they sent thither from time to time ostensibly for the aid and comfort of their allies on the island, who were being wronged by the Syracusans, they regarded merely as stepping-stones to the greater exhibition of conquest. But the man who finally fanned this desire of theirs into flame, and persuaded them not to attempt the island any more in part, and little by little, but to sail thither with a great armament and subdue it utterly, was Alcibiades. He persuaded the people to have great hopes, and he himself had greater aspirations still. Such were his hopes that he regarded Sicily as a mere beginning, and not, like the rest, as an end of the expedition. So, while Nicias was trying to divert the people from the capture of Syracuse as an undertaking too difficult for them, Alcibiades was dreaming of Carthage and Libya, and after winning these, of at once encompassing Italy and Peloponnesus. He almost regarded Sicily as the ways and means provided for his greater war. The young men were at once carried away on the wings of such hopes, and their elders kept recounting in their ears many wonderful things about the projected expedition. Many were they who sat in the palestres and lounging places mapping out in the sand the shape of Sicily and the position of Libya and Carthage. Socrates the philosopher, however, and Meton the astrologer, were said to have had no hopes that any good would come to the city from this expedition. Socrates, as it is likely, because he got an inkling of the future from the divine guide who was his familiar. Meton, whether his fear of the future arose from mere calculation, or from his use of some sort of divination, feigned madness, and seizing a blazing torch, was like to have set fire to his own house. Some say, however, that Meton made no pretense of madness, but actually did burn his house down in the night, 
and then, in the morning, came before the people begging and praying that, in view of his great calamity, his son might be released from the expedition. At any rate, he succeeded in cheating his fellow citizens, and obtained his desire. Nicias was elected general against his will, and he was anxious to avoid the command most of all because of his fellow commander. For it had seemed to the Athenians that the war would go on better if they did not send out Alcibiades unblended, but rather tempered his rash daring with the prudent forethought of Nicias. As for the third general, Lamachus, though advanced in years, he was thought, age notwithstanding, to be no less fiery than Alcibiades, and quite as fond of taking risks in battle. During the deliberations of the people on the extent and character of the armament, Nicias again tried to oppose their wishes, and put a stop to the war. But Alcibiades answered all his arguments, and carried the day. And then Demostratus, the orator, formally moved that the generals have full and independent powers in the matter of the armament and of the whole war. After the people had adopted this motion, and all things were made ready for the departure of the fleet, there were some unpropitious signs and portents, especially in connection with the festival, namely the Aedonia. This fell at that time, and little images like dead folk carried forth to burial were in many places exposed to view by the women, who mimicked burial rites, beat their breasts, and sang dirges, Moreover, the mutilation of the herme, most of which, in a single night, had their faces and forms disfigured, confounded the hearts of many, even among those who usually set small store by such things. It was said it is true that Corinthians had done the deed, Syracuse being a colony of theirs, in the hope that such portents would check or stop the war. The multitude, however, were not moved by this reasoning, nor by that of those who thought the affair no terrible sign at all, but rather one of the common effects of strong wine, when dissolute youth in mere sport are carried away into wanton acts. They looked on the occurrence with wrath and fear, thinking it the sign of a bold and dangerous conspiracy. They therefore scrutinized keenly every suspicious circumstance, the council and the assembly convening for this purpose many times within a few days. During this time, Androcles, the popular leader, produced sundry aliens and slaves who accused Alcibiades and his friends of mutilating other sacred images, and of making a parody of the mysteries of Eleusis in a drunken revel. They said that one Theodorus played the part of the herald, Pollution that of the torch-bearer, and Alcibiades that of the high priest, and that the rest of his companions were there in the role of initiates, and were dubbed Mystae. Such indeed was the purport of the impeachment which Thessalus, the son of Simon, brought in to the assembly, impeaching Alcibiades for impiety towards the Eleusian goddesses. The people were exasperated and felt bitterly towards Alcibiades, and Androcles, who was his mortal enemy, egged them on. At first Alcibiades was confounded, but perceiving that all the seamen and soldiers who were going to sail for Sicily were friendly to him, and hearing that the Argive and Mantinean men-at-arms, a thousand in number, declared plainly that it was all because of Alcibiades, that they were making their long expedition across the seas, 
and that if any wrong should be done him, they would at once abandon it, he took courage, and insisted on an immediate opportunity to defend himself before the people. His enemies were now in their turn dejected. They feared lest the people should be too lenient in their judgment of him, because they needed him so much. Accordingly they devised that certain orators who were not looked upon as enemies of Alcibiades, but who really hated him no less than his avowed foes, should rise in the assembly and say that it was absurd when a general had been appointed with full powers over such a vast force, and when his armament and allies were all assembled, to destroy his beckoning opportunity by casting lots for jurors and measuring out time for the case. Nay, they said, let him sail now, and heaven be with him. But when the war is over, then let him come and make his defense. The laws will be the same then as now. Of course, the malice in this postponement did not escape Alcibiades. He declared in the assembly that it was a terrible misfortune to be sent off at the head of such a vast force, with his case still in suspense, leaving behind him vague accusations and slanders. He ought to be put to death if he did not refute them. But if he did refute them and proved his innocence, he ought to proceed against the enemy without any fear of the public informers at home. He could not carry his point, however, but was ordered to set sail. So he put to sea along with his fellow generals, having not much fewer than one hundred and forty triremes, fifty-one hundred men-at-arms, about thirteen hundred archers, slingers, and light-armed folk, and the rest of his equipment to correspond. On reaching Italy and taking Regium, he proposed a plan for the conduct of the war. Nicias opposed it, but Lamachus approved it, and so he sailed to Sicily. He secured the allegiance of Catana, but accomplished nothing further, since he was presently summoned home by the Athenians to stand his trial. At first, as I have said, sundry vague suspicions and calumnies against Alcibiades were advanced by aliens and slaves. Afterwards, during his absence, his enemies went to work more vigorously. They brought the outrage upon the Herme and upon the Eleusinian mysteries under one and the same design. Both, they said, were fruits of a conspiracy to subvert the government, and so all who were accused of any complicity whatsoever therein were cast into prison without trial. The people were provoked with themselves for not bringing Alcibiades to trial and judgment at the time on such grave charges, and any kinsman or friend or comrade of his who fell foul of their wrath against him found them exceedingly severe. Thucydides neglected to mention the informers by name, but others give their names as Diocledes and Teuser. For instance, Phrynichus, the comic poet, referred to them thus, Look out too, dearest Hermes, not to get a fall, and mar your looks, and so equip with calumny another Diocledes bent on wreaking harm. And the Hermes replied, I'm on the watch, there's Teuser too. I would not give a prize for tattling to an alien of his guilt. And yet there was nothing sure or steadfast in the statements of the informers. One of them, indeed, was asked how he recognized the faces of the Herme de faces, and replied, By the light of the moon. This vitiated his whole story, since there was no moon at all when the deed was done. Sensible men were troubled thereat, 
but even this did not soften the people's feeling toward the slanderous stories as they had set out to do in the beginning so they continued hailing and casting into prison any one who was denounced among those thus held in bonds and imprisonment for trial was andocides the orator whom hellanicus the historian included among the descendants of odysseus he was held to be a foe to the popular government and an oligarch but what most made him suspected of the mutilation of the herme was the tall hermes which stood near his house a dedication of the aegean tribe this was almost the only one among the very few statues of like prominence to remain unharmed for this reason it is called to this day the hermes of andocides everybody gives it that name in spite of the adverse testimony of the inscription now it happened that of all those lying in prison with him under the same charge andocides became most intimate and friendly with a man named timaeus of less repute than himself it is true but of great sagacity and daring this man persuaded andocides to turn state's evidence against himself and a few others if he confessed so the man argued he would have immunity from punishment by decree of the people whereas the result of the trial while uncertain in all cases was most to be dreaded in that of influential men like himself it was better to save his life by a false confession of crime than to die a shameful death under a false charge of that crime one who had an eye to the general welfare of the community might well abandon to their fate a few dubious characters if he could thereby save a multitude of good men from the wrath of the people by such arguments of timaeus and Docides was at last persuaded to bear witness against himself and others. He himself received the immunity from punishment which had been decreed, but all those whom he named, excepting such as took to flight, were put to death, and Andocides added to their number some of his own household servants that he might the better be believed still the people did not lay aside all their wrath at this point but rather now that they were done with the herme defacers as if their passion had all the more opportunity to vent itself they dashed like a torrent against alcibiades and finally dispatched the solomonian state galley to fetch him home they shrewdly gave its officers explicit command not to use violence nor to seize his person but with all moderation of speech to bid him accompany them home to stand his trial and satisfy the people for they were afraid that their army in an enemy's land would be full of tumult and mutiny at the summons and alcibiades might easily have effected this had he wished for the men were cast down at his departure and expected that the war under the conduct of nicias would be drawn out to a great length by delays and inactivity now that their goad to action had been taken away lamachus it is true was a good soldier and a brave man but he lacked authority and prestige because he was poor alcibiades had no sooner sailed away than he robbed the athenians of messana there was a party there who were on the point of surrendering the city to the athenians but alcibiades knew them and gave the clearest information of their design to the friends of syracuse in the city and so brought the thing to naught arrived at thurii he left his trireme and hid himself so as to escape all quest when someone recognized him and asked 
Can you not trust your country, Alcibiades? In all else, he said, but in the matter of life, I wouldn't trust even my own mother not to mistake a black for a white ballot when she cast her vote. And when he afterwards heard that the city had condemned him to death, I'll show them, he said, that I'm alive. His impeachment is on record, and runs as follows. Thessalus, son of Simon, of the Deme Lasiade, impeaches Alcibiades, son of Clinius, of the Deme Scambonidae, for committing crime against the goddesses of Eleusis, Demeter, and Cora, by mimicking the mysteries and showing them forth to his companions in his own house, wearing a robe such as the high priest wears when he shows forth the sacred secrets to the initiates, and calling himself high priest, Pulician torch-bearer, and Theodorus of the Deme Phygia, herald, and hailing the rest of his companions as Miste and Epopte, contrary to the laws and institutions of the Eumolpidae, heralds and priests of Eleusius. His case went by default, his property was confiscated, and besides that, it was also decreed that his name should be publicly cursed by all priests and priestesses. Theano, the daughter of Menon, of the Dime Agraule, they say, was the only one who refused to obey this decree. She declared that she was a praying, not a cursing, priestess. End of Alcibiades, Part 2 Part 3 of Volume 4 of Plutarch's Parallel Lives This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Burlinson. Volume 4 of Plutarch's Parallel Lives of the Noble Greeks and Romans Translated by Bernadotte Perrin Alcibiades, Part 3 When these great judgments and condemnations were passed upon Alcibiades, he was tarrying in Argos, for as soon as he had made his escape from Thuriae, he passed over into Peloponnesus. But fearing his foes there, and renouncing his country altogether, he sent to the Spartans, demanding immunity and confidence, and promising to render them aid and service greater than all the harm he had previously done them as an enemy. The Spartans granted this request, and received him among them. No sooner was he come, than he zealously brought one thing to pass. They had been delaying and postponing assistance to Syracuse. He roused and incited them to send Gylippus thither for a commander, and to crush the force which Athens had there. A second thing he did was to get them to stir up the war against Athens at home, and the third and most important of all, to induce them to fortify Decelea. This, more than anything else, wrought ruin and destruction to his native city. At Sparta he was held in high repute publicly, and privately was no less admired. The multitude was brought under his influence, and was actually bewitched by his assumption of the Spartan mode of life. When they saw him with his hair untrimmed, taking cold baths, on terms of intimacy with their coarse bread, and supping black porridge, they could scarcely trust their eyes, and doubted whether such a man as he now was had ever had a cook in his own house, had even so much as looked upon a perfumer, 
or endured the touch of Milesian wool. He had, as they say, one power which transcended all others and proved an implement of his chase for men, that of assimilating and adapting himself to the pursuits and lives of others, thereby assuming more violent changes than the chameleon. That animal, however, as it is said, is utterly unable to assume one color, namely white. But Alcibiades could associate with good and bad alike, and found naught that he could not imitate and practice. In Sparta he was all for bodily training, simplicity of life, and severity of countenance, in Ionia for luxurious ease and pleasure, in Thrace for drinking deep, in Thessaly for riding hard, and when he was thrown with Tessaphernes the satrap, he outdid even Persian magnificence in his pomp and lavishness. It was not that he could so easily pass entirely from one manner of man to another, nor that he actually underwent in every case a change in his real character, but when he saw that his natural manners were likely to be annoying to his associates, he was quick to assume any counterfeit exterior which might in each case be suitable for them. At all events in Sparta, so far as the outside was concerned, it was possible to say of him, No child of Achilles he, but Achilles himself. Such a man is Lycurgus trained. But, judging by what he actually felt and did, one might have cried with the poet, "'Tis the self-same woman still." For while Aegis the king was away on his campaigns, Alcibiades corrupted Timica, his wife, so that she was with child by him, and made no denial of it. When she had given birth to a male child, it was called Leotychides in public, but in private, the name which the boy's mother whispered to her friends and attendants, was Alcibiades. Such was the passion that possessed the woman. But he, in his mocking way, said he had not done this thing for a wanton insult, nor at the behest of mere pleasure but in order that descendants of his might be kings of the Lacedaemonians. Such being the state of things, there were many to tell the tale to Aegis, and he believed it, more especially owing to the lapse of time. There had been an earthquake, and he had run in terror out of his chamber and the arms of his wife, and then, for ten months, had had no further intercourse with her. And since Leotychides had been born at the end of this period, Aegis declared that he was no child of his. For this reason, Leotychides was afterwards refused the royal succession. After the Athenian disaster in Sicily, the Chians, Lesbians, and Cicicenes sent embassies at the same time to Sparta, to discuss a revolt from Athens. But, though the Boeotians supported the appeal of the Lesbians, and Pharnabasis that of the Cicenes, the Spartans, under the persuasion of Alcibiades, elected to help the Chians first of all. Alcibiades actually set sail in person, and brought almost all Ionia to revolt, and, in constant association with the Lacedaemonian generals, wrought injury to the Athenians. But Aegis was hostile to him because of the wrong he had suffered as a husband, and he was also vexed at the repute in which Alcibiades stood for most of the successes won were due to him, as report had it. The most influential and ambitious of the other Spartans 
also were already envious and tired of him, and soon grew strong enough to induce the magistrates at home to send out orders to Ionia that he be put to death. His stealthy discovery of this put him on his guard, and while in all their undertakings he took part with the Lacedaemonians, he sedulously avoided coming into their hands. Then, resorting to Tissaphernes, the king's satrap, for safety, he was soon first and foremost in that grandee's favor, for his versatility and surpassing cleverness were the admiration of the barbarian, who was no straightforward man himself, but malicious and fond of evil company, and indeed no disposition could resist and no nature escape Alcibiades, so full of grace was his daily life and conversation. Even those who feared and hated him felt a rare and winning charm in his society and presence. And thus it was that Tissaphernes, though otherwise the most ardent of the Persians in his hatred of the Hellenes, so completely surrendered to the flatteries of Alcibiades as to outdo him in reciprocal flatteries. Indeed, the most beautiful park he had, both for its refreshing waters and grateful lawns, with resorts and retreats, decked out in regal and extravagant fashion, he named Alcibiades. Everyone always called it by that name. Alcibiades now abandoned the cause of the Spartans, since he distrusted them and feared Aegis, and began to malign and slander them to Tissaphernes. He advised him not to aid them very generously, and yet not to put down the Athenians completely, but rather by niggardly assistance to straighten and gradually wear out both, and so make them easy victims for the king when they had weakened and exhausted each other. Tissaphernes was easily persuaded, and all men saw that he loved and admired his new adviser so that Alcibiades was looked up to by the Hellenes on both sides, and the Athenians repented themselves of the sentence they had passed upon him, now that they were suffering for it. Alcibiades himself also was presently burdened with the fear that if his native city were altogether destroyed, he might come into the power of the Lacedaemonians, who hated him. At this time almost all the forces of Athens were at Samos. From this island as their naval base of operations, they were trying to win back some of their Ionian allies who had revolted, and were watching others who were disaffected. After a fashion they still managed to cope with their enemies on the sea, but they were afraid of Tissaphernes and of the fleet of one hundred and fifty Phoenician triremes, which was said to be all but at hand. If this once came up, no hope of safety was left for their city. Alcibiades was aware of this, and sent secret messages to the influential Athenians at Samos, in which he held out the hope that he might bring Tissaphernes over to be their friend. He did not seek, he said, the favor of the multitude, nor trust them, but rather that of the aristocrats, in case they would venture to show themselves men, put a stop to the insolence of the people, take the direction of affairs into their own hands, and save their cause and city. Now the rest of the aristocrats were much inclined to Alcibiades, but one of the generals, Phrynichus, of the Deme Diorades, suspected what was really the case, that Alcibiades had no more use for an oligarchy than for a democracy, but merely sought in one way or another a recall from exile, and therefore invade against the people merely to court betimes the favor of the aristocrats, 
and ingratiate himself with them. He therefore opposed him. When his opinion had been overborne, and he was now become an open enemy of Alcibiades, he sent a secret messenger to Astyochus, the enemy's naval commander, bidding him beware of Alcibiades and arrest him, for that he was playing a double game. But without knowing it, it was a case of traitor dealing with traitor. For Astyochus was as much in awe of Tissaphernes, and seeing that Alcibiades had great power with the satrap, he disclosed the message of Phrynichus to them both. Alcibiades at once sent men to Samos to denounce Phrynichus. All the Athenians there were incensed and banded themselves together against Phrynichus, who, seeing no other escape from his predicament, attempted to cure one evil by another and a greater. He sent again to Astyochus, chiding him indeed for his disclosure of the former message, but announcing that he stood ready to deliver into his hands the fleet and army of the Athenians. However, this treachery of Phrynichus did not harm the Athenians at all, because of the fresh treachery of Astyochus. This second message of Phrynichus also he delivered to Alcibiades. But Phrynichus knew all the while that he would do so, and expected a second denunciation from Alcibiades. So he got the start of him by telling the Athenians himself that the enemy were going to attack them, and advising them to have their ships manned and their camp fortified. The Athenians were busy doing this, when again a letter came from Alcibiades, bidding them beware of Phrynichus, since he had offered to betray their fleet to the enemy. This letter they disbelieved at the time, supposing that Alcibiades, who must know perfectly the equipment and purposes of the enemy, had used his knowledge in order to calumniate Phrynichus falsely. Afterwards, however, when Hermon, one of the frontier guard, had smitten Phrynichus with a dagger and slain him in the open marketplace, the Athenians tried the case of the dead man, found him guilty of treachery, and awarded crowns to Hermon and his accomplices. But at Samos, the friends of Alcibiades soon got the upper hand and sent Pisander to Athens to change the form of government. He was to encourage the leading men to overthrow the democracy and take control of affairs, with the plea that on these terms alone would Alcibiades make Tissaphernes their friend and ally. This was the pretense, and this the pretext of those who established the oligarchy at Athens. But as soon as the so-called five thousand, they were really only four hundred, got the power and took control of affairs, they at once neglected Alcibiades entirely, and waged the war with less vigor, partly because they distrusted the citizens, who still looked askance at the new form of government, and partly because they thought that the Lacedaemonians, who always looked with favor on an oligarchy, would be more lenient towards them. The popular party in the city was constrained by fear to keep quiet, because many of those who openly opposed the four hundred had been slain. But when the army in Samos learned what had been done at home, they were enraged, and were eager to sail forthwith to the Piraeus, and sending for Alcibiades, they appointed him general, and bade him lead them in putting down the tyrants. An ordinary man, thus suddenly raised to a great power by the favor of the multitude, would have been full of complacence, thinking that he must at once gratify them in all things, and oppose them in nothing, since they had made him, 
instead of a wandering exile leader and general of such a fleet and of so large an armed force but alcibiades as became a great leader felt that he must oppose them in their career of blind fury and prevented them from making a fatal mistake therefore in this instance at least he was the manifest salvation of the city for had they sailed off home their enemies might at once have occupied all ionia the hellespont without a battle and the islands while athenians were fighting athenians and making their own city the seat of war such a war alcibiades more than any other one man prevented not only persuading and instructing the multitude together but also taking them man by man supplicating some and constraining others he had a helper too in thrasybulus of styrus who went along with him and did the shouting for he had it is said the biggest voice of all the athenians a second honorable proceeding of alcibiades was his promising to bring over to their side the phoenician ships which the king had sent out and the lacedaemonians were expecting or at least to see that those expectations were not realized and his sailing off swiftly on this errand the ships were actually seen off aspendus but tissaphernes did not bring them up and thereby played the lacedaemonians false alcibiades however was credited with this diversion of the ships by both parties and especially by the lacedaemonians the charge was that he instructed the barbarian to suffer the hellenes to destroy one another for it was perfectly clear that the side to which such a naval force attached itself would rob the other altogether of the control of the sea after this the four hundred were overthrown the friends of alcibiades now zealously assisting the party of the people then the city willingly ordered alcibiades to come back home but he thought he must not return with empty hands and without achievement through the pity and favor of the multitude but rather in a blaze of glory so to begin with he set sail with a small fleet from samos and cruised off Cnidus and Cos. There he heard that Mindarus, the Spartan admiral, had sailed off to the Hellespont with his entire fleet, followed by the Athenians, and so he hastened to the assistance of their generals. By chance he came up with his eighteen triremes at just that critical point when both parties having joined battle with all their ships off abydos and sharing almost equally in victory and defeat until evening were locked in a great struggle the appearance of alcibiades inspired both sides with a false opinion of his coming the enemy were emboldened and the athenians were confounded but he quickly hoisted athenian colors on his flagship and darted straight upon the victorious and pursuing peloponnesians routing them he drove them to land and following hard after them rammed and shattered their ships their crews swam ashore and here pharnabazus came to their aid with his infantry and fought along the beach in defense of their ships but finally the athenians captured thirty of them rescued their own and erected a trophy of victory taking advantage of a success so brilliant as this and ambitious to display himself at once before Tissaphernes, alcibiades supplied himself with gifts of hospitality and friendship and proceeded at the head of an imperial retinue to visit the satrap his reception, however, was not what he expected. 
Tissaphernes had for a long time been accused by the Lacedaemonians to the king, and being in fear of the king's condemnation, it seemed to him that Alcibiades had come in the nick of time. So he arrested him and shut him up in Sardis, hoping that such an outrage upon him as this would dispel the calumnies of the Spartans. After the lapse of thirty days Alcibiades ran away from his guards, got a horse from some one or other, and made his escape to Clazomene. To repay Tissaphernes he alleged that he had escaped with that satrap's connivance, and so brought additional calumny upon him. He himself sailed to the camp of the Athenians, where he learned that Mindarus, along with Pharnabasus, was in Sisychus. Thereupon he roused the spirits of the soldiers, declaring that they must now do sea-fighting, and land-fighting, and even siege-fighting, too, against their enemies, for poverty stared them in the face unless they were victorious in every way. He then manned his ships and made his way to Proconesus, giving orders at once to seize all small trading craft and keep them under guard, that the enemy might get no warning of his approach from any source soever. Now it chanced that copious rain fell all of a sudden, and thunder peals and darkness cooperated with him in concealing his design. Indeed, not only did he elude the enemy, but even the Athenians themselves had already given up all expectation of fighting, when he suddenly ordered them aboard ship and put out to sea. After a little the darkness cleared away, and the Peloponnesian ships were seen hovering off the harbour of Sisychus. Fearing then lest they catch sight of the full extent of his array and take refuge ashore, he ordered his fellow commanders to sail slowly and so remain in the rear, while he himself with only forty ships hove in sight and challenged the foe to battle. The Peloponnesians were utterly deceived, and, scorning what they deemed the small numbers of their enemy, put out to meet them, and closed at once with them in a grappling fight. Presently, while the battle was raging, the Athenian reserves bore down upon their foe, who were panic-stricken and took to flight. Then Alcibiades, with twenty of his best ships, broke through their line, put to shore, and, disembarking his crews, attacked his enemy as they fled from their ships, and slew many of them. Mindarus and Pharnabasus, who came to their aid, he overwhelmed. Mindarus was slain, fighting sturdily, but Pharnabasus made his escape. Many were the dead bodies and the arms of which Athenians became masters, and they captured all their enemies' ships. Then they also stormed Sisychus, which Pharnabasus abandoned to its fate, and the Peloponnesians in it were annihilated. Thus the Athenians not only had the Hellespont under their sure control, but even drove the Lacedaemonians at a stroke from the rest of the sea. A dispatch was captured, announcing the disaster to the ephors in true laconic style. Our ships are lost. Mindarus is gone. Our men are starving. We know not what to do. But the soldiers of Alcibiades were now so elated and filled with pride that they disdained longer to mingle with the rest of the army, since it had often been conquered, while they were unconquered. For not long before this, Thrasyllus had suffered a reverse at Ephesus, and the Ephesians had erected their bronze trophy of the victory to the disgrace of the Athenians. 
This was what the soldiers of Alcibiades cast in the teeth of Thrasyllus's men, vaunting themselves and their general, and refusing to share either training or quarters in camp with them. But when Pharnabazus, with much cavalry and infantry, attacked the forces of Thrasyllus, who had made a raid into the territory of Abydos, Alcibiades sallied out to their aid, routed Pharnabazus, and pursued him till nightfall, along with Thrasyllus. Thus the two factions were blended, and returned to their camp with mutual friendliness and delight. On the following day, Alcibiades set up a trophy of victory and plundered the territory of Pharnabazus, no one venturing to defend it. He even captured some priests and priestesses, but let them go without ransom. On setting out to attack Chalcedon, which had revolted from Athens and received a Lacedaemonian garrison and governor, he heard that its citizens had collected all their goods and chattels out of the country and committed them for safekeeping to the Bithynians who were their friends. So he marched to the confines of Bithynia with his army and set on a herald with accusations and demands. The Bithynians, in terror, gave up the booty to him and made a treaty of friendship. End of Alcibiades Part 3of Volume 4 of Plutarch's Parallel Lives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Burlinson. Volume 4 of Plutarch's Parallel Lives of the Noble Greeks and Romans. Translated by Bernadotte Perrin. Alcibiades, Part 4. While Chalcedon was being walled in from sea to sea, Pharnabasus came to raise the siege, and at the same time Hippocrates, the Spartan governor, held his forces out of the city and attacked the Athenians. But Alcibiades arrayed his army so as to face both enemies at once, put Pharnabasus to shameful flight, and slew Hippocrates together with many of his vanquished men. Then he sailed in person into the Hellespont, and levied monies there. He also captured Salimbria, where he exposed himself beyond all bounds for there was a party in the city which offered to surrender it to him, and they had agreed with him upon the signal of a lighted torch displayed at midnight. But they were forced to give this signal before the appointed time, through fear of one of the conspirators, who suddenly changed his mind. So the torch was displayed before his army was ready. But Alcibiades took about thirty men, and ran to the walls, bidding the rest of his force follow with all speed. The gate was thrown open for him, and he rushed into the city, his thirty men of arms reinforced by twenty targeteers. But he saw at once that the Salimbrians were advancing in battle array to attack him. In resistance he saw no safety and for flight, undefeated as he was in all his campaigns down to that day, he had too much spirit. He therefore bade the trumpet signal silence, and then ordered formal proclamation to be made, that Salimbria must not bear arms against Athens. This proclamation made some of the Salimbrians less eager for battle, if, as they supposed, their enemies were all inside the walls, and others were mollified by hopes of a peaceful settlement. While they were thus parleying with one another, 
up came the army of Alcibiades. Judging now, as was really the case, that the Salimbrians were disposed for peace, he was afraid that his Thracian soldiers might plunder the city. There were many of these, and they were zealous in their service, through the favor and good will they bore Alcibiades. Accordingly he sent them all out of the city, and then, at the plea of the Salimbrians, did their city no injury whatever, but merely took a sum of money from it, set a garrison in it, and went his way. Meanwhile the Athenian generals who were besieging Chalcedon made peace with Pharnabazus, on condition that they receive a sum of money, that Chalcedon be subject again to Athens, that the territories of Pharnabazus be not ravaged, and that the said Pharnabazus furnish safe escort for an Athenian embassy to the king. Accordingly, when Alcibiades came back from Salimbria, Pharnabazus demanded that he too take oath to the treaty, but Alcibiades refused to do so until Pharnabazus had taken his oath to it. After the oaths had been taken, he went up against Byzantium, which was in revolt against Athens, and compassed the city with a wall. But after Anaxileus, Lycurgus, and certain men besides had agreed to surrender the city to him on condition that it be not plundered, he spread abroad the story that threatening complications in Ionia called him away. Then he sailed off in broad daylight with all his ships, but in the night time stealthily returned. He disembarked with the men-at-arms under his own command, and stationed himself quietly within reach of the city's walls. His fleet, meanwhile, sailed to the harbor, and forcing its way in with much shouting and tumult and din, terrified the Byzantians by the unexpectedness of its attack, while it gave the party of Athens in the city a chance to admit Alcibiades in all security, since everybody had hurried off to the harbor and the fleet. However, the day was not won without a battle. The Peloponnesians, Boeotians, and Megarians, who were in garrison at Byzantium, routed the ship's crews and drove them back on board again. Then, perceiving that the Athenians were inside the city, they formed in battle array, and advanced to attack them. A fierce battle followed, but Alcibiades was victorious with the right wing, as well as Theramenes with the left, and they took prisoners no less than three hundred of the enemy who survived. Not a man of the Byzantians was put to death or sent into exile after the battle, for it was on these conditions that the men who surrendered the city had acted, and this was the agreement with them. They exacted no special grace for themselves. Therefore it was that when Anaxileus was prosecuted at Sparta for treachery, his words showed clearly that his deeds had not been disgraceful. He said that he was not a Lacedaemonian, but a Byzantian, and it was not Sparta that was in peril. Considering, therefore, the case of Byzantium, he saw that the city was walled up, that no help could make its way in, and that the provisions already in the city were being consumed by Peloponnesians and Boeotians, while the Byzantians were starving together with their wives and children. He had, therefore, not betrayed the city to its enemies, but set it free from war and its horrors, therein imitating the noblest Lacedaemonians, in whose eyes the one unqualifiedly honorable and righteous thing is their country's good. The Lacedaemonians, on hearing this, were moved with sincere respect, and acquitted the men. 
but Alcibiades, yearning at last to see his home, and still more desirous of being seen by his fellow citizens, now that he had conquered their enemies so many times, set sail. His attic triremes were adorned all round with many shields and spoils of war. Many that he had captured in battle were towed along in his wake, and still more numerous were the figureheads he carried of triremes, which had been overwhelmed and destroyed by him. There were not less than two hundred of these altogether. Durus, the Samian, who claims that he was a descendant of Alcibiades, gives some additional details. He says that the oarsmen of Alcibiades rode to the music of a flute, blown by Chrysogonus, the Pythian victor, that they kept time to a rhythmic call from the lips of Callipides, the tragic actor, that both these artists were arrayed in long tunics, flowing robes, and other adornment of their profession, and that the commander's ship put into harbour with a sail of purple hue, as though, after a drinking bout, he were off on a revel. But neither Theopompus, nor Yephorus, nor Xenophon mentions these things. Nor is it likely that Alcibiades put on such airs for the Athenians, to whom he was returning after he had suffered exile and many great adversities. Nay, he was an actual fear, as he put into the harbour, and once in, he did not leave his trireme until, as he stood on deck, he caught sight of his cousin Eurypteleimus on shore, with many other friends and kinsmen, and heard their cries of welcome. When he landed, however, people did not deign so much as to look at other generals whom they met, but ran in throngs to Alcibiades with shouts of welcome escorting him on his way, and putting wreaths on his head as they could get to him, while those who could not come to him for the throng gazed at him from afar, the elderly men pointing him out to the young. Much sorrow, too, was mingled with the city's joy, as men called to mind their former misfortunes, and compared them with their present good fortune, counting it certain that they had neither lost Sicily, nor had any other great expectation of theirs miscarried, if they had only left Alcibiades at the head of that enterprise, and the armament therefore. For now he had taken the city when she was almost banished from the sea, when on land she was hardly mistress of her own suburbs, and when factions raged within her walls, and had raised her up from this wretched and lowly plight, not only restoring her dominion over the sea, but actually rendering her victorious over her enemies everywhere on land. Now the decree for his recall had been passed before this, on motion of Critias, the son of Callaeschrus, as Critias himself has written in his elegies, where he reminds Alcibiades of the favour in these words. Mine was the motion that brought thee back. I made it in public. Words and writing were mine. This the task I performed. Signet and seal of words that were mine give warrant as follows. At this time, therefore, the people had only to meet an assembly and Alcibiades addressed them. He lamented and bewailed his own lot, but had only little and moderate blame to lay upon the people. The entire mischief he ascribed to a certain evil fortune and envious genius of his own. Then he descanted at great length upon the vain hopes which their enemies were cherishing and wrought his hearers up to courage. At last they crowned him with crowns of gold, 
and elected him general with sole powers by land and sea. They voted also that his property be restored to him, and that the Eumolpidae and heralds revoked the curses wherewith they had cursed him at the command of the people. The others revoked their curses, but Theodorus the high priest said, Nay, I invoked no evil upon him, if he does no wrong to the city. But while Alcibiades was thus prospering brilliantly, some were nevertheless disturbed at the particular season of his return, for he had put into harbour on the very day when the plinteria of the goddess Athene were being celebrated. The Praxiergidae celebrate these rites on the twenty-fifth day of Thargelion, in strict secrecy, removing the robes of the goddess and covering up her image. Wherefore the Athenians regarded this day as the unluckiest of all days for business of any sort. The goddess, therefore, did not appear to welcome Alcibiades with kindly favour and good will, but rather to veil herself from him and repel him. However, all things fell out as he wished, and one hundred triremes were manned for service, with which he was minded to sail off again, but a great and laudable ambition took possession of him, and detained him there until the Eleusinian mysteries. Ever since Decalea had been fortified, and the enemy by their presence there commanded the approaches to Elensis, the festal site had been celebrated with no splendor at all, being conducted by sea. Sacrifices, choral dances, and many of the sacred ceremonies usually held on the road, when Iacus is conducted forth from Athens to Eleusis, had of necessity been omitted. Accordingly, it seemed to Alcibiades that it would be a fine thing, enhancing his holiness in the eyes of the gods and his good repute in the minds of men, to restore its traditional fashion to the sacred festival by escorting the rite with his infantry along past the enemy by land. He would thus either thwart and humble Aegis, if the king kept entirely quiet, or would fight a fight that was sacred and approved by the gods, in behalf of the greatest and holiest interests, in full sight of his native city, and with all his fellow citizens eye-witnesses of his valour. When he had determined upon this course, and made known his design to the Eumolpidae and heralds, he stationed sentries on the heights, sent out an advance guard at break of day, and then took the priests, Mistae, and Mystagogues, encompassed them with his men-at-arms, and led them over the road to Eleusis, in decorous and silent array. So august and devout was the spectacle which, as general, he thus displayed, that he was hailed by those who were not unfriendly to him as high priest, rather, and mystagogue. No enemy dared to attack him, and he conducted the procession safely back to the city. At this he was exalted in spirit himself, and exalted his army with the feeling that it was irresistible and invincible under his command. People of the humbler and poorer sort, he so captivated by his leadership, that they were filled with an amazing passion to have him for their tyrant, and some proposed it, and actually came to him in solicitation of it. He was to rise superior to envy, abolish decrees and laws, and stop the mouths of the babblers who were so fatal to the life of the city, that he might bear an absolute sway and act without fear of the public informer. 
What thoughts he himself had about a tyranny is uncertain, but the most influential citizens were afraid of it, and therefore anxious that he should sail away as soon as he could. They even voted him, besides everything else, the colleagues of his own choosing. Setting sail, therefore, with his one hundred ships, and assaulting Andros, he conquered the islanders in battle, as well as the Lacedaemonians, who were there. But he did not capture the city. This was the first of the fresh charges brought against him by his enemies. And it would seem that if ever a man was ruined by his own exalted reputation, that man was Alcibiades. His continuous successes gave him such repute for unbounded daring and sagacity, that when he failed in anything, men suspected his inclination. They would not believe in his inability. Were he only inclined to do a thing, they thought, naught could escape him. So they expected to hear that the Chians also had been taken, along with the rest of Ionia. They were, therefore, incensed to hear that he had not accomplished everything at once and speedily to meet their wishes. They did not stop to consider his lack of money. This compelled him, since he was fighting men who had an almoner of bounty in the great king, to leave his camp frequently and sail off in quest of money for rations and wages. The final and prevailing charge against him was due to this necessity. Lysander, who had been sent out as admiral by the Lacedaemonians, paid his sailors four obols a day instead of three, out of the monies he received from Cyrus, while Alcibiades, already hard put to it to pay even his three obols, was forced to sail for Caria to levy money. The man whom he left in charge of his fleet, Antiochus, was a brave captain, but otherwise a foolish and low-lived fellow. Although he had received explicit commands from Alcibiades not to hazard a general engagement, even though the enemy sailed out to meet him, he showed such wanton contempt of them as to man his own trireme and one other and stand for Ephesus, indulging in many shamelessly insulting gestures and cries as he cruised past the prows of the enemy's ships. At first Lysander put out with a few ships only and gave him chase. Then, when the Athenians came to the aid of Antiochus, Lysander put out with his whole fleet, won the day, slew Antiochus himself, captured many ships and men, and set up a trophy of the victory. As soon as Alcibiades heard of this, he came back to Samos, put out to sea with his whole armament, and challenged Lysander to battle. But Lysander was satisfied with his victory and would not put out to meet him. There were those who hated Alcibiades in the camp, and of these Thrasybulus, the son of Thraso, his particular enemy, set sail for Athens to denounce him. He stirred up the city against him by declaring to the people that it was Alcibiades who had ruined their cause and lost their ships by his wanton conduct in office. He had handed over, so Thrasybulus said, the duties of commander to men who won his confidence merely by drinking deep and reeling off sailors' yarns, in order that he himself might be free to cruise about collecting monies and committing excesses of drunkenness and revelry with courtesans of Abydos and Ionia, and this while the enemy's fleet lay close to him. His enemies also found for accusation against him in the fortress which he had constructed in Thrace, near Bysanthi. 
it was to serve they said as a refuge for him in case he either could not or would not live at home the athenians were persuaded and chose other generals in his place thus displaying their anger and ill will towards him on learning this alcibiades was afraid and departed from the camp altogether and assembling mercenary troops made war on his own account against the thracians who acknowledge no king he got together much money from his captives and at the same time afforded security from barbarian inroads to the hellenes on the neighboring frontier tidius menander and adimantus the generals who had all the ships which the athenians could finally muster in station at the agaspontomy were wont to sail out at daybreak against lysander who lay with his fleet at lampsacus and challenge him to battle then they would sail back again to spend the rest of the day in disorder and unconcern since forsooth they despised their enemy alcibiades who was near at hand could not see such conduct with calmness or indifference but rode up on horseback and read the generals a lesson he said their anchorage was a bad one the place had no harbor and no city but they had to get their supplies from sestos a long way off and they permitted their crews whenever they were on land to wander and scatter about at their own sweet wills while there lay at anchor over against them an armament which was trained to do everything silently at a word of absolute command in spite of what alcibiades said and in spite of his advice to change their station to sestos the generals paid no heed tidius actually insulted him by bidding him be gone he was not general now but others so alcibiades departed suspecting that some treachery was on foot among them he told his acquaintances who were escorting him out of the camp that had he not been so grievously insulted by the generals within a few days he would have forced the lacedaemonians to engage them whether they wished to do so or not or else lose their ships some thought that what he said was arrant boasting but others that it was likely since he had merely to bring up his numerous thracian javelineers and horsemen to assault by land and confound the enemy's camp however that he saw only too well the errors of the athenians the event soon testified lysander suddenly and unexpectedly fell upon them and only eight of their triremes escaped with conon the rest something less than two hundred were captured and taken away three thousand of their crews were taken alive and executed by lysander in a short time he also captured athens burned her ships and tore down her long walls alcibiades now feared the lacedaemonians who were supreme on land and sea and betook himself into bithynia taking booty of every sort with him but leaving even more behind him in the fortress where he had been living in bithynia he again lost much of his substance being plundered by the thracians there and so he determined to go up to the court of artaxerxes he thought to show himself not inferior to themistocles if the king made trial of his services and superior in his pretext for offering them for it was not to be against his fellow countrymen as in the case of that great man but in behalf of his country that he would assist the king and beg him to furnish forces against a common enemy thinking that pharnabazus 
could best give him facilities for safely making this journey up to the king, he went to him in Phrygia, and continued there with him, paying him court and receiving marks of honour from him. The Athenians were greatly depressed at the loss of their supremacy. But when Lysander robbed them of their freedom, too, and handed the city over to thirty men, then, their cause being lost, their eyes were opened to the course they would not take when salvation was yet in their power. They sorrowfully rehearsed all their mistakes and follies, the greatest of which they considered to be their second outburst of wrath against Alcibiades. He had been cast aside for no fault of his own, but they got angry because a subordinate of his lost a few ships disgracefully, and then they themselves, more disgracefully still, robbed the city of its ablest and most experienced general. And yet, in spite of their present plight, a vague hope still prevailed that the cause of Athens was not wholly lost so long as Alcibiades was alive. He had not, in times past, been satisfied to live his exile's life in idleness and quiet. Nor now, if his means allowed, would he tolerate the insolence of the Lacedaemonians and the madness of the Thirty. It was not strange that the multitude indulged in such dreams, when even the Thirty were moved to anxious thought and inquiry and made the greatest account of what Alcibiades was planning and doing. Finally, Critias tried to make it clear to Lysander that as long as Athens was a democracy, the Lacedaemonians could not have safe rule over Hellas, and that Athens, even though she were very peacefully and well disposed towards oligarchy, would not be suffered, while Alcibiades was alive, to remain undisturbed in her present condition. However, Lysander was not persuaded by these arguments until a dispatch roll came from the authorities at home, bidding him put Alcibiades out of the way, either because they too were alarmed at the vigor and enterprise of the man, or because they were trying to gratify Aegis. Accordingly, Lysander sent to Pharnabasis and bade him do this thing, and Pharnabasis commissioned Megaeus, his brother, and Susamithras, his uncle, to perform the deed. At that time Alcibiades was living in a certain village of Phrygia, where he had Tamandra the courtesan with him, and in his sleep he had the following vision. He thought he had the courtesan's garments upon him, and that she was holding his head in her arms, while she adorned his face like a woman's, with paints and pigments. Others say that in his sleep he saw Megaeus's followers cutting off his head and his body burning. All agree in saying that he had the vision not long before his death. The party sent to kill him did not dare to enter his house, but surrounded it, and set it on fire. When Alcibiades was aware of this, he gathered together most of the garments and bedding in the house, and cast them on the fire. Then, wrapping his cloak about his left arm, and drawing his sword with his right, he dashed out, unscathed by the fire, before the garments were in flames, and scattered the barbarians, who ran at the mere sight of him. Not a man stood ground against him, or came to close quarters with him, but all held aloof and shot him with javelins and arrows. Thus he fell, and when the barbarians were gone, Tamandra took up his dead body, covered and wrapped it in her own garments, and gave it such brilliant and honorable burial as she could provide. 
This Tamandra, they say, was the mother of that Lais, who was called the Corinthian, although she was a prisoner of war from Hicara, a small city of Sicily. But some, while agreeing in all other details of the death of Alcibiades with what I have written, say that it was not Pharnabasis who was the cause of it, nor Lysander, nor the Lacedaemonians, but Alcibiades himself. He had corrupted a girl belonging to a certain well-known family, and had her with him, and it was the brothers of this girl who, taking his wanton insolence much to heart, set fire by night to the house where he was living, and shot him down, as has been described, when he dashed out through the fire. End of Alcibiades Part 4Five of Volume Four of Plutarch's Parallel Lives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Burlinson. Volume 4 of Plutarch's Parallel Lives of the Noble Greeks and Romans Translated by Bernadotte Perrin Caius Martius Coriolanus, Part 1 The patrician house of the Marcii at Rome furnished many men of distinction. One of them was Ancus Martius, the grandson of Numa, by his daughter and the successor of Tullus Hostilius in the kingdom. To this family belonged also Publius and Quintus Martius, the men who brought into Rome its best and most abundant supply of water. So likewise did Censorinus, whom the Roman people twice appointed censor, and then at his own instance made a law by which it was decreed that no one should hold that office twice. Caius Martius, whose life I now write, lost his father at an early age, and was reared by his widowed mother. He showed, however, that such loss of a father, although otherwise bad for a boy, need not prevent him from becoming a worthy and excellent man and that it is wrong for worthless men to lay upon it the blame for their perverted natures, which are due, as they say, to early neglect. On the other hand, the same Martius bore witness for those who hold that a generous and noble nature, if it lack discipline, is apt to produce much that is worthless, along with its better fruits like a rich soil, deprived of the husbandman's culture. For while the force and vigor of his intelligence, which knew no limitations, led him into great undertakings, and such as were productive of the highest results, still, on the other hand, since he indulged a vehement temper and displayed an unswerving pertinacity, it made him a difficult and unsuitable associate for others. They did indeed look with admiration upon his insensibility to pleasures, toils, and mercenary gains, to which they gave the names of self-control, fortitude, and justice. But in their intercourse with him as a fellow-citizen, they were offended by it as ungracious, burdensome, and arrogant. Verily, among all the benefits which men derive from the favor of the muses, none other is so great as that softening of the nature which is produced by culture and discipline, the nature being induced by culture to take on moderation and cast off excess, 
it is perfectly true however that in those days rome held in highest honour that phase of virtue which concerns itself with warlike and military achievements and evidence of this may be found in the only latin word for virtue which signifies really manly valour they made valour a special form of virtue stand for virtue in general and so martius who was by nature exceedingly fond of warlike feats began at once from his very boyhood to handle arms and since he thought that adventitious weapons were of little avail to such as did not have their natural and native armor developed and prepared for service he so practised himself in every sort of combat that he was not only nimble of foot but had also such a weight in grapplings and wrestlings that an enemy found it hard to extricate himself at any rate those who from time to time contended with him in feats of courage and valour laid the blame for their inferiority upon his strength of body which was inflexible and shrank from no hardship he made his first campaign while yet a stripling when tarquin who had been king of rome and then had been expelled after many unsuccessful battles staked his all as it were upon a final throw most of the people of latium and many also of other peoples of italy were assisting him and marching with him upon rome to reinstate him there not so much from a desire to gratify him as because fear and envy led them to try to overthrow the growing power of the romans in the ensuing battle which long favoured now this side and now that martius who was fighting sturdily under the eyes of the dictator saw a roman soldier struck down near by he ran to him at once stood in front of him defended him and slew his assailant accordingly after the roman general had won the day he crowned martius among the first with a garland of oak leaves this is the civic crown which the law bestows upon one who has saved the life of a fellow citizen in battle either because the oak was held in special honour for the sake of the arcadians who were called acorn eaters in an oracle of apollo or because they could speedily find an abundance of oak wherever they fought or because it was thought that the garland of oak leaves being sacred to jupiter the city's guardian was fittingly bestowed upon one who saved the life of a citizen the oak moreover has the most beautiful fruit of all wild trees and is the sturdiest of all trees under cultivation its acorn used to be food and the honey found in it used to be drink for men and it furnished them with the flesh of most grazing creatures and birds since it bore the mistletoe from which they made bird lime for snares in the battle of which i was speaking it is said that castor and pollux appeared and that immediately after the battle they were seen their horses all adrip with sweat in the forum announcing the victory by the fountain where their temple now stands therefore the day on which this victory was won the ides of july was consecrated to the dioscuri it would seem that when a young man's ambition is no integral part of his nature it is apt to be quenched by an honourable distinction which is attained too early in life his thirst and fastidious appetite are speedily satisfied but serious and firm spirits are stimulated by the honours they receive and glow brightly as if roused by a mighty wind to achieve the manifest good 
they do not feel that they are receiving a reward for what they have done but rather that they are giving pledges of what they will do and they are ashamed to fall behind their reputation instead of surpassing it by their actual exploits it was in this spirit that martius vied with himself in manly valour and being ever desirous of fresh achievement he followed one exploit with another and heaped spoils upon spoils so that his later commanders were always striving with their predecessors in their efforts to do him honour and to surpass in their testimonials to his prowess many indeed were the wars and conflicts which the romans waged in those days and from none did he return without laurels and rewards of valour but whereas other men found in glory the chief end of valour he found the chief end of glory in his mother's gladness that she should hear him praised and see him crowned and embrace him with tears of joy this was what gave him as he thought the highest honour and felicity and it was doubtless this feeling which epaminondas also is said to have confessed in considering it his greatest good fortune that his father and mother lived to know of his generalship and victory at leuctra but he was so blessed as to have both his parents share in his pleasure and success whereas martius who thought he owed his mother the filial gratitude also which would have been due to his father could not get his fill of gladdening and honouring volumnia nay he even married according to her wish and request and continued to live in the same house with his mother after children were born to him the reputation and influence procured by his valour were already great in the city when the senate taking the part of the wealthy citizens began to be at variance with the common people who thought they suffered many grievous ills at the hands of the money-lenders for those of them that were possessed of moderate means were stripped of all they had by means of pledges and sales while those who were altogether without resources were led away in person and put in prison although their bodies bore many marks of wounds received and hardships undergone in campaigns for the defence of their country the last of these had been against the sabines and they had undertaken it upon a promise of their wealthiest creditors to deal moderately with them and after a vote of the senate that marcus valerius the consul should guarantee the promise but after they had fought zealously in that battle also and had conquered the enemy no consideration was shown them by their creditors and the senate did not even pretend to remember its agreements but again suffered them to be seized in pledge of payments and haled away to prison then there were tumults and disorderly gatherings in the city and the enemy not unaware of the popular confusion burst in and ravaged the country and when the consuls summoned those of military age to arms no one responded in this crisis the opinions of those in authority were again at variance some thought that concessions should be made to the plebeians and the excessive rigour of the law relaxed but others opposed this and among them was martius he did not regard the financial difficulties as the main point at issue and exhorted the magistrates to be wise enough to check and quell this incipient attempt at bold outrage on the part of a populace in revolt against the laws the senate met to debate this question many times within the space of a few days but came to no definite conclusion the plebeians therefore banded together on a sudden and after mutual exhortations 
forsook the city, and taking possession of what is now called the Sacred Mount, established themselves beside the river Agno. They committed no acts of violence or sedition, but only cried aloud that they had, for a long time, been banished from the city by the rich, and that Italy would everywhere afford them air, water, and a place of burial, which was all they had if they dwelt in Rome, except for the privilege of wounds and death in campaigns for the defense of the rich. These proceedings alarmed the Senate, and it sent out those of its older members who were most reasonably disposed towards the people to treat with them. The chief spokesman was Menenius Agrippa, and after much entreaty of the people and much plain speaking in behalf of the Senate, he concluded his discourse with a celebrated fable. He said, namely, that all the other members of a man's body once revolted against the belly, and accused it of being the only member to sit idly down in its place and make no contribution to the common welfare, while the rest underwent great hardships and performed great public services, only to minister to its appetites, but that the belly laughed at their simplicity in not knowing that it received into itself all the body's nourishment only to send it back again and duly distribute it among the other members. Such, then, said Agrippa, is the relation of the Senate, my fellow citizens, to you. The matters for deliberation which there receive the necessary attention and disposition bring to you all and severally what is useful and helpful. A reconciliation followed, after the people had asked and obtained from the Senate the privilege of electing five men as protectors of those who needed succor, the officers now called tribunes of the people, and the first whom they chose to this office were Junius Brutus and Sicinius Veletus, who had been their leaders in the secession. When the city was thus united, the common people at once offered themselves as soldiers, and the consuls found them ready and eager for service in the war. As for Martius, though he was displeased himself to have the people increase in power at the expense of the aristocracy, and though he saw that many of the other patricians were of the same mind, he nevertheless exhorted them not to fall behind the common people in contending for their country's welfare, but to show that they were superior to them in valor rather than in political power. Among the Volscians, with whom the Romans were at war, the city of Corioli took highest rank. When, therefore, Cominius the consul had invested this place, the rest of the Volscians, fearing for its safety, came to its aid against the Romans from all parts, designing to give them battle in front of the city and to attack them on both sides. Thereupon Cominius divided his forces, going forth himself to meet the Volscians who were coming up outside and leaving Titus Lartius, one of the bravest Romans of his day, in charge of the siege. Then the men of Corioli, despising the forces that were left, sallied out against them, overcame them in battle at first, and pursued the Romans to their camp. At this point Martius darted out with a small band, and after slaying those who came to close quarters and bringing the rest of the assailants to a halt, called the Romans back to the fight with loud cries. For he had, as Cato thought a soldier should have, not only a vigor of stroke, but a voice and look which made him a fearful man for a foe to encounter, and hard to withstand. Many of his men rallied to support him, 
and the enemy withdrew in terror. With this, however, he was not satisfied, but followed hard upon them, and drove them at last in headlong flight up to the gate of their city. There, although he saw the Romans turning back from the pursuit, now that many missiles from the walls were reaching them, and although not a man of them dared to think of bursting into the city along with the fugitives, full as it was of enemies in arms, he nevertheless took his stand and exhorted and encouraged them to the exploit, crying out that fortune had opened the city for the pursuers rather than for the pursued. Only a few were willing to follow him, but he pushed his way through the enemy, leaped against the gate, and burst in along with them, no man daring to oppose him at first or resist him. Then, however, when the citizens saw that few of the enemy all told were inside, they rallied and attacked them. Enveloped thus by friends and foes alike, Martius is said to have waged a combat in the city which, for prowess of arms, speed of foot, and daring of soul, passes all belief. He overwhelmed all whom he assailed, driving some to the remotest parts of the city, while others gave up the struggle and threw down their arms. Thus he made it abundantly safe for Lartius to lead up the Romans who were outside. The city having been captured in this manner, most of the soldiers fell to plundering and pillaging it. At this, Martius was indignant, and cried out that he thought it a shame, when their consul and their fellow citizens who were with him had perhaps fallen in with the enemy, and were fighting a battle with them, that they on their part should be going about after booty, or, under pretext of getting booty, should run away from the danger. Only a few paid any heed to his words whereupon he took those who were willing to follow, and set out on the road by which, as he learned, the consul's army had marched before him, often urging his companions on, and beseeching them not to slacken their efforts, and often praying the gods that he might not be too late for the battle, but might come up in season to share in the struggles and perils of his fellow-citizens. It was a custom with the Romans of that time, when they were going into action, and were about to gird up their cloaks and take up their bucklers, to make at the same time an unwritten will, naming their heirs in the hearing of three or four witnesses. This was just what the soldiers were doing when Martius overtook them, the enemy being now in sight. At first, some of them were confounded when they saw that he had a small following, and was covered with blood and sweat. But when he ran to the consul with a glad countenance, gave him his hand, and announced the capture of the city, and when Cominius embraced and kissed him, then they were encouraged, some hearing of the success which had been gained, and some but guessing at it and all called loudly upon the consul to lead them into battle. But Martius asked Cominius how the enemy were arrayed, and where their best fighting men were placed, and when the consul told him he thought the troops in the centre were those of the Antietes, who were the most warlike of all, and yielded to none in bravery, I ask and demand of you then, said Martius, post us opposite these men. The consul, accordingly, granted his request, astonished at his ardor. As soon as spears began to fly, Martius darted out before the line, and the Volsians who faced him could not withstand his charge, but where he fell upon their ranks they were speedily cut asunder. Those on either side, however, wheeled about and encompassed him with their weapons, so that the consul, fearing for his safety, sent to his aid the choicest men he had about his person. 
Then a fierce battle raged around Martius, and many were slain in short space of time. But the Romans pressed hard upon their enemies and put them to rout, and as they set out in pursuit of them, they insisted that Martius, who was weighed down with fatigue and wounds, should retire to the camp. He answered, however, that weariness was not for victors, and took after the flying foe. The rest of their army also was defeated. Many were slain, and many taken captive. On the following day, when Lartius had come up, and the rest of the army was assembled before the consul, Cominius mounted the rostra, and after rendering to the gods the praise that was their due for such great successes, addressed himself to Martius. In the first place he rehearsed with praise his astonishing exploits, some of which he had himself beheld in the battle, while to others Lartius bore witness. Then, out of the abundant treasures and the many horses and prisoners that had been taken, he ordered him to choose out a tenth before any distribution to the rest of the army, and besides all this he presented him with a horse, duly caparisoned, as a prize of valor. After the Romans had applauded this speech, Martius came forward and said that he accepted the horse, and was delighted with the praises of the consul, but that he declined the rest, holding it to be pay, not honor, and would be content with his single share of the booty. But I do ask one special favor, he said, and beg that I may receive it. I had a guest friend among the Volsians, a man of kindliness and probity. This man is now a prisoner, and from wealth and happiness is reduced to subjection. Since then, many evils have befallen him. Let me at least free him from one, that of being sold into bondage. At such words as these still louder shouts greeted Martius, and he found more admirers of his superiority to gain than of the bravery he had shown in war. For the very ones who secretly felt a certain jealous envy of him for his conspicuous honors, now thought him worthy of great rewards because he would not take them, and they were more delighted with the virtue which led him to despise such great rewards than with the exploits which made him worthy of them. For the right use of wealth is a fairer trait than excellence in arms, but not to need wealth is loftier than to use it. When the multitude had ceased shouting their applause, Cominius took up the word again, and said, Ye cannot indeed, my fellow soldiers, force these gifts of yours upon the man when he does not accept them, and is unwilling to take them but there is a gift which he cannot refuse when it is offered. Let us give him this gift, and pass a vote that he be surnamed Coriolanus, unless, indeed, before such act of ours, his exploit has itself given him this name. Thence came his third name of Coriolanus. From this it is perfectly clear that Caius was the proper name that the second name, in this case Martius, was the common name of family or clan, and that the third name was adopted subsequently, and bestowed because of some exploit or fortune, or bodily feature, or special excellence in a man. So the Greeks used to give surnames from an exploit, as for instance Soter and Callinicus, or from a bodily feature, as Physcon and Grippus, or from special excellence, as Euergetes and Philadelphus, or from some good fortune, as Eudaemon, the surname of the second Battus. And some of their kings have actually had surnames given them in mockery, 
as Antigonus Dosen and Ptolemy Lathyrus. Surnames of this sort were even more common among the Romans. For instance, one of the Metalli was called Diadematus, because for a long time he suffered from a running sore and went about with a bandage on his forehead. Another member of this family was called Seller, because he exerted himself to give the people funeral games of gladiators within a few days of his father's death, and the speed and swiftness of his preparations excited astonishment. And at the present day some of them are named from casual incidents at their birth. Proculus, for instance, if a child is born when his father is away from home, or posthumous if after his death. And when one of twin children arrives while the other dies, he is called Vabiscus. Moreover, from bodily features they not only bestow such surnames as Sulla, Niger, and Rufus, but also such as Caicus and Claudius. And they do well thus to accustom men to regard neither blindness nor any other bodily misfortune as a reproach or a disgrace, but to answer to such names as though their own. This topic, however, would be more fittingly discussed elsewhere. The war was no sooner over than the popular leaders revived the internal dissensions, without any new cause of complaint or just accusations, but making the very evils which had necessarily followed in the wake of their previous quarrels and disturbances a pretext for opposing the patricians. For the greater part of the land had been left unsown and untilled, and the war left no opportunity to arrange an importation of market supplies. There was, therefore, a great scarcity of food, and when the popular leaders saw that there were no market supplies, and that if there were, the people had no money to buy them, they assailed the rich with slanderous accusations of purposely arraying the famine against them, in a spirit of revenge. Moreover, there came an embassy from the people of Velitre, who offered to hand their city over to the Romans, and begged them to send out colonists for it. For a pestilential disease had assailed them, and wrought such death and destruction among their citizens, that hardly the tenth part of the whole number was left. Accordingly, such of the Romans as were sensible thought that this request of the people of Velitre had come at an advantageous and opportune time, since the scarcity of food made it needful to ease the city of its burdensome members. At the same time, they also hoped to dissipate its sedition, if the most turbulent elements in it and those which made most response to the exciting appeals of the popular leaders, should be purged away like unhealthy and disturbing refuse from the body. Such citizens, therefore, the consuls selected as colonists, and ordered them forth to Velitre. They also enlisted others in a campaign against the Volsians contriving thus that there should be no leisure for intestine tumults, and believing that when rich and poor alike, plebeians as well as patricians, were once again united in military service and in common struggles for the public good, they would be more gently and pleasantly disposed towards one another. But the popular leaders, Sicinius and Brutus, with their following, at once rose up in oppositions, crying out that the consuls were disguising a most cruel deed under that most inoffensive name, a colony, and were really pushing poor men into a pit of death, as it were, by sending them forth into a city which was full of deadly air and unburied corpses to be associated with a strange and abominable deity. 
and then as if not satisfied with destroying some of their fellow-citizens by famine and exposing others to pestilence they proceeded further to bring on a war of their own choosing that no evil might spare the city which had but refused to continue in servitude to the rich with their ears full of such speeches as these the people would neither answer the consular summons for enlistment nor look with any favor on the colony the senate was in perplexity but Martius, who was now full of importance, and had grown lofty in spirit, and was looked upon with admiration by the most powerful men of the city, openly took the lead in resisting the popular leaders. The colony was sent out, those that were chosen for it by lot being compelled to go forth under severe penalties, and when the people utterly refused military service, Martius himself mustered his clients and as many others as he could persuade, and made an incursion into the territory of Antium. There he found much corn and secured large booty in cattle and captives, no part of which did he take out for himself, but brought his followers back to Rome, laden with large spoils of every sort. The rest of the citizens, therefore, repented themselves, envied their more fortunate fellows, and were filled with hostility to Martius, not being able to endure the reputation and power of the man, which was growing, as they thought, to be detrimental to the people. But not long after, when Martius stood for the consulship, the multitude relented, and the people felt somewhat ashamed to slight and humble a man who was foremost in birth and valor, and had performed so many and such great services. Now it was the custom with those who stood for the office to greet their fellow citizens and solicit their votes, descending into the forum in their toga, without a tunic under it. This was either because they wished the greater humility of their garb to favor their solicitations, or because they wished to display the tokens of their bravery, in case they bore wounds. It was certainly not owing to a suspicion of the dispensing of money in bribery that the candidate for the votes of the citizens was required to present himself before them without a tunic and ungirt. For it was long after this time that the buying and selling of votes crept in, and money became a feature of the elections. But afterwards, bribery affected even courts and camps, and converted the city into a monarchy, by making armies the utter slaves of money. For it has been well said that he first breaks down the power of the people, who first feasts and bribes them. But at Rome the mischief seems to have crept in stealthily and gradually, and not to have been noticed at once. For we do not know who was the first man to bribe her people or her courts of law, whereas at Athens Anitus, the son of Anthemion, is said to have been the first man to give money to jurors when he was on trial for the treacherous failure to relieve Pylos during the close of the Peloponnesian War, a time when the pure race of the Golden Age still possessed the Roman Forum. End of Caius Martius Coriolanus, Part 1《of Volume Four of Plutarch's Parallel Lives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Burlinson. Volume Four of Plutarch's Parallel Lives of the Noble Greeks and Romans, translated by Bernadotte Perrin. Caius Martius Coriolanus, Part Two. 
so when marcius disclosed his many scars from many contests wherein he had been a foremost soldier for seventeen years together the people were put out of countenance by his valour and agreed with one another to elect him but when the day for casting their votes came and marcius made a pompous entry into the forum escorted by the senate and all the patricians about him were clearly more bent on success than ever before the multitude fell away again from their good will towards him and drifted into feelings of resentment and envy these feelings were reinforced by their fear that if an aristocrat who had such weight with the patricians should become supreme in the government he might altogether deprive the people of their liberties so being in such a state of mind they rejected marcius and others were proclaimed elected the senators were indignant thinking the insult directed rather at them than at marcius and he himself could not treat the occurrence with restraint or forbearance he had indulged the passionate and contentious side of his nature with the idea that there was something great and exalted in this and had not been imbued under the influence of reason and discipline with that gravity and mildness which are the chief virtues of a statesman nor did he know that one who undertakes public business must avoid above all things that self-will which as plato says is the companion of solitude must mingle with men and be a lover of that submissiveness to injury which some people ridicule so much but since he was ever a straightforward man and obstinate and since he thought that conquest and mastery in all things and at all times was the prerogative of bravery rather than of effeminate weakness which breaks out in anger like a swelling sore from the troubled and wounded spirit he went away full of indignation and bitterness towards the people the younger patricians too that element in the city which made most vaunt of noble birth and was most showy had always been amazingly devoted to the man and adhering to him now when their presence did him no good fanned his anger by their sympathetic vexation and sorrow for he was their leader and willing teacher of the art of war in their campaigns and inspired them in their victories with a zeal for valor which had no tinge of mutual jealousy in the meantime grain came to rome a great part of it bought in italy but an equal amount sent as a present from Syracuse, where Gilo was tyrant. Most of the people were consequently in great hope, expecting that the city would be delivered both from its scarcity and its discord. The Senate, accordingly, was convened at once, and the people flocking about the Senate House awaited the result of its deliberations. They expected that the market price for grain would now be moderate, and that what had been sent as a present would be distributed gratis. For there were some in the Senate who so advised that body. But Marcius rose in his place and vehemently attacked those who favored the multitude, calling them demagogues and betrayers of the aristocracy and declaring that they were nourishing to their own harm the evil seeds of boldness and insolence which had been sown among the rabble. These they should have choked when they first sprang up, and not have strengthened the people by such a powerful magistracy as the tribunate. But now their body was formidable because it got everything that it desired, allowed no constraint upon its will, and refused to obey the consuls, but had their own leaders in anarchy, whom they styled their rulers. To sit there, moreover, 
voting such a people largesses and supplies like those greeks where democracy is the most extreme he said was nothing more nor less than maintaining them in their disobedience to the common destruction of all for they surely will not say that they are getting these as a grateful return for the military services which they omitted and the secessions by which they renounce their country and the calumnies against the senate which they have countenanced they will rather be confident that your fears drive you to subserviency and flattery when you make them these gifts and concessions and will set no limit to their disobedience nor cease from their quarrels and seditions such action on our part would therefore be sheer madness but if we are wise we shall take their tribunate away from them for it makes the consulship null and void and divides the city this is no longer one as before but has been cut in two so that we can never grow together again or be of one mind or cease afflicting and confounding one another with many such words as these Marcius was beyond measure successful in filling the younger senators and almost all the wealthy ones with his own fierce enthusiasm and they cried out that he was the only man in the city who disdained submission and flattery but some of the older senators opposed him suspecting the outcome and the outcome was wholly bad for the tribunes were present and when they saw that the proposal of martius was likely to prevail they ran out among the crowd with loud cries calling upon the plebeians to rally to their help then there was a stormy session of the assembly and when the speech of martius was reported to it the people were carried away with fury and almost burst in upon the senate but the tribunes made their formal denunciation of Martius, and summoned him by messenger to come before them and make his defense. And when he insolently drove away the officers who brought their message, they went themselves, attended by the aediles, to bring him by force, and tried to lay hands upon his person. But the patricians, banding together, drove the tribunes away and actually beat the aediles by this time then evening had fallen which put an end to the tumult but as soon as it was day the exasperated people came running together from all quarters into the forum when the consuls saw this they were alarmed for the city and convening the senate urged them to consider how by reasonable proposals and suitable resolutions they might soothe and pacify the multitude since it was not a time for ambitious rivalry nor would they be wise in contending for their dignity but the crisis was severe and critical and demanded measures that were considerate and humane the majority of the senate acceding to these views the consuls went out and reasoned with the people as well as they could and tried to mollify them answering their accusations in a reasonable manner and making only a moderate use of admonition and rebuke as regarded the price of provisions and market supplies they declared there should be no difference between them accordingly the greater part of the people showed signs of relenting and it was evident from their decorous and sober attention that they were on the way to be controlled and won over then the tribunes rose and declared that since the senate was now acting soberly the people in their turn would make such concessions as were fair and honorable they insisted however that martius should make answer to the following charges could he deny that he had instigated the senate to violate the constitution and abrogate the powers of the people when summoned to appear before him had he not refused and finally 
by insulting and beating the aediles in the forum had he not done all in his power to incite the citizens to arms and bring about a civil war they made this demand with a desire either that Marcius should be publicly humiliated, if, contrary to his nature, he curbed his haughty spirit and sued for the favor of the people, or, if he yielded to his natural promptings, that he should do something which would justify their wrath against him and make it implacable. The latter is what they rather expected and they rightly estimated the man's character. For he came and stood before them as one who would defend himself, and the people were quiet and silent in his presence. But when, instead of the more or less deprecatory language expected by his audience, he began not only to employ an offensive boldness of speech, which at last became actual denunciation, but also to show by the tone of his voice and the cast of his countenance that his fearlessness was not far removed from disdain and contempt. Then the people were exasperated, and gave evident signs that his words roused their impatience and indignation. Upon this, Sicinius, the boldest of the tribunes, after a brief conference with his colleagues, made formal proclamation that Marcius was condemned to death by the tribunes of the people, and ordered the aediles to take him up to the Tarpeian rock at once, and cast him down the cliff below. But when the aediles laid hold of his person, it seemed, even to many of the plebeians, a horrible and monstrous act. The patricians, moreover, utterly besides themselves, distressed and horror-stricken, rushed with loud cries to his aid. Some of them actually pushed away the officers making the arrest, and got Marcius among themselves. Some stretched out their hands in supplication of the multitude, since words and cries were of no avail amid such disorder and confusion. At last the friends and kindred of the tribunes, perceiving that it was impossible without slaying many patricians, to lead Marcius away and punish him, persuaded them to remit what was unusual and oppressive in his sentence, not to use violence and put him to death without a trial, but to surrender him and refer his case to the people. Then Sicinius, becoming calm, asked the patricians what they meant by taking Marcius away from the people, when it wished to punish him. But the patricians asked in their turn, What then is your purpose, and what do ye mean, by thus dragging one of the foremost men of Rome without a trial, to a savage and illegal punishment? Well then, said Sicinius, ye shall not have any such excuse for facetious quarrel with the people, for they grant your demand that the man have a trial. And we cite thee, Martius, to appear before the citizens on the third market-day ensuing, and convince them, if you can, of your innocence, assured that they will decide your case by vote. For the time being, then, the patricians were satisfied with this truce, and went away in glad possession of Martius. But in the time which intervened before the third market-day, for the Romans hold their markets every ninth day, calling them therefore Nundine. A campaign was undertaken against the city of Antium, which led them to hope that the issue might be avoided altogether. The campaign would last long enough, they thought, for the people to become tractable after their rage had languished or altogether disappeared by reason of their occupation with the war. But presently, when the citizens returned home after a speedy settlement of their dispute with Antium, the patricians were in frequent conclave, being full of fear, and deliberating how they might not surrender Martius, and yet prevent the popular leaders from throwing the people again into tumult and disorder. 
Appius Claudius, indeed, who was counted among those most hostile to the claims of the people, said with all solemnity that the Senate would destroy itself and utterly betray the government of the city if it should suffer the people to wield their vote in judgment on the patricians. But the oldest senators, and those most inclined to favor the people, maintained on the contrary that it would not be rendered harsh or severe by its exercise of this power, but mild and humane. For, since it did not despise the Senate, but rather thought itself despised by that body, the prerogative of trying a senator would be a solace to its feelings, and a mark of honor, so that as soon as it proceeded to vote, it would lay aside its wrath. Marcius, therefore, seeing that the Senate was in suspense between its kindly feelings towards him and its fear of the people, asked the tribunes what the accusations against him were, and on what charge he would be tried if they led him before the people. They replied that the charge against him was usurpation, and that they would prove him guilty of planning a usurpation of the government. Thereupon he rose of his own accord, and said he was going at once before the people to make his defense, and would deprecate no manner of trial, nor, should he be found guilty, any form of punishment. Only, said he, see that ye confine yourselves to the charge mentioned, and do not play false with the Senate. The tribunes agreed to this, and on these terms the trial was held. But when the people were come together in the first place, the tribunes insisted that the votes be cast not by centuries, but by tribes, thus making the indigent and officious rabble, which had no thought of honor, superior in voting power to the wealthy and well-known citizens of the military class. In the second place, abandoning the charge of usurpation, which could not be proven, they dwelt again upon the speech which Martius had previously made in the Senate, when he protested against the lowering of the market price of grain, and urged them to take the tribunate away from the people. They also added a fresh charge against him, namely his distribution of the spoils which he had taken from the country of Antium. These, they said, he had not turned into the public treasury, but had distributed them among those who made the campaign with him. By this accusation Martius is said to have been more disturbed than by all the rest, for he had not expected it, and was not ready at once with an answer which would satisfy the people, but began to praise those who had made the campaign, whereupon he was clamorously interrupted by those who had not made it, and they were the more numerous. In the end, therefore, the vote was taken by tribes, and a majority of three condemned him. The penalty assigned was perpetual banishment. After the result was announced, the people went off in greater relation and delight than they had ever shown for any victory in battle over their enemies. But the Senate was in distress, and dire dejection, repenting now and vexed to the soul that they had not done and suffered all things, rather than allow the people to insult them in the exercise of such great powers. And there was no need now of dress or other marks of distinction in telling one class from another, but it was clear at once that he who rejoiced was a plebeian, and he who was vexed a patrician. Albeit Martius himself, who was neither daunted nor humbled, but in mien, port, and countenance fully composed, seemed the only man among all the distressed patricians who was not touched by his evil plight. And this was not due to calculation or gentleness, or to a calm endurance of his fate, but he was stirred by rage and deep resentment, and this, although the many know it not, is pain. For when pain is transmuted into anger, 
it is consumed as it were by its flames and casts off its own humility and sloth wherefore the angry man makes a show of activity as he who has a fever is hot his spirit being so to speak afflicted with throbbing distension and inflation and that such was his condition Marcius showed right quickly by his conduct. He went home, where his mother and his wife met him with wailings and loud lamentations, and after embracing them and bidding them to bear with equanimity the fate that had come upon them, he straightway departed and went to the city gate. Thither all the patricians in a body escorted him, but without taking anything or asking for anything, he departed, having only three or four of his clients with him. For a few days he remained by himself at some country place, torn by many conflicting counsels, such as his anger suggested to him, purposing no good or helpful thing at all, but only how he might take vengeance on the Romans. At last he determined to incite some neighboring nation to a formidable war against them. Accordingly, he set out to make trial of the Balsians first, knowing that they were still abundantly supplied with men and money, and thinking that they had been not so much crippled in power by their recent defeats as filled with contentious wrath against the Romans. Now there was a certain man of Antium, Tullus Ophidius by name, who by reason of his wealth and bravery and conspicuous lineage had the standing of a king among all the Volscians. By this man Martius knew himself to be hated as no other Roman was, for they had often exchanged threats and challenges in the battles which they had fought, and such emulous boastings as the ambitious ardor of youthful warriors prompts had given rise to a mutual hatred of their own in addition to that of their peoples however since he saw that tullus had a certain grandeur of spirit and that he more than all the other volscians was eager to retaliate upon the romans if they gave him any opportunity Martius bore witness to the truth of him, who said, With anger it is hard to fight, for whatsoever it wishes, that it buys, even at the cost of life. For, putting on such clothing and attire as would make him seem to any one who saw him, least like the man he was, like Odysseus, he went into the city of his deadly foes. It was evening, and many met him, but no man knew him. He proceeded, therefore, to the house of Tullus, and slipping in unawares took his seat at the hearth, in silence, covered his head, and remained there motionless. The people of the house were amazed, and did not venture to raise him up, for his mien and his silence gave him a certain dignity. But they told Tullus, who was at supper, what a strange thing had happened. Tullus rose from table and came to him, and asked him who he was, and why he was come. At this, then, Martius uncovered his head, and after a slight pause, said, If thou dost not recognize me, Tullus, but disbelievest thine eyes, I must be my own accuser. I am Caius Martius, he who has wrought thee and the Volscians most harm, and the surname of Coriolanus which I bear permits no denial of this. I have won no other prize for all the toils and perils which I have undergone than the name which is a badge of my enmity to your people. This indeed cannot be taken away from me, but of everything else I have been stripped through the envy and insolence of the Roman people, and the cowardly treachery of the magistrates and those of my own order. I have been driven into exile, too, and have become a suppliant at thy hearth, 
not for the sake of security and safety, for why should I come hither if I were afraid of death, but with a desire to take vengeance on those who have driven me forth, which I take at once when I put myself in thy power. If, then, thou art eager to assail thine enemies, come, good sir, take advantage of my calamities, and make my individual misfortune the good fortune of all the Volskins. I shall fight better for you than I have against you, in just so far as those who know the secrets of their enemies fight better than those who do not. But if thou hast given up hope, neither do I wish to live nor is it for thine advantage to spare one who has long been an enemy and a foe, and now is unprofitable and useless. When Tullus heard this, he was wonderfully pleased, and giving him his right hand said, Rise up, Martius, and be of good courage. In giving thyself to us, thou bringest us a great good and thou mayest expect a greater one still from the Volsians. Then he entertained Martius at table with every mark of kindness, and during the ensuing days they took counsel together concerning the war. But at Rome, owing to the hatred of the people by the patricians, who were especially embittered by the condemnation of Martius, there were great commotions, and many signs from heaven were reported by seers, priests, and private persons, which could not be ignored. One of these is said to have been as follows. There was one Titus Latinus, a man of no great prominence, but of quiet and modest life in general, and free from superstitious fears, as he was also, and yet more, from vain pretensions. This man dreamed that Jupiter appeared to him, and bade him tell the Senate that the dancer, whom they had appointed to head his procession, was a bad one, and gave him the greatest displeasure. After having this vision, Titus said, he gave it no thought at all at first, but after he had seen it a second and a third time, and still neglected it, he had suffered the loss of an excellent son by death, and had himself become suddenly palsied. This story he told after having been brought into the Senate on a litter, and no sooner had he told it, they say, than he at once felt the strength return to his body, and rose up, and went away, walking without aid. In amazement, then, the senators made a careful investigation of the matter. Now what had happened was this. A certain man had handed over one of his slaves to other slaves, with orders to scourge him through the forum, and then put him to death. While they were executing this commission, and tormenting the poor wretch, whose pain and suffering made him writhe and twist himself horribly, the sacred procession in honor of Jupiter chanced to come up behind. Many of those who took part in it were, indeed, scandalized at the joyless sight and the unseemly contortions of the victim, but no one made any protest. They merely heaped abuse and curses on the head of the master who was inflicting such a cruel punishment. For in those days the Romans treated their slaves with great kindness, because they worked and even ate with them themselves and were therefore more familiar and gentle with them, and it was a severe punishment for a slave who had committed a fault, if he was obliged to take the piece of wood with which they prop up the pole of a wagon, and carry it around through the neighborhood, for he who had been seen undergoing this punishment no longer had any credit in his own or neighboring households, and he was called Fursifer, for what the Greeks call a prop or support is called fursa by the Romans. End of Caius Martius Coriolanus, Part 2
of Plutarch's Parallel Lives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Volume 4 of Plutarch's Parallel Lives of the Noble Greeks and Romans Translated by Bernadotte Perrin Caius Martius Coriolanus, Part 3 When, therefore, Latinus had reported his vision to the senators, and they were at a loss to know who the unpleasant and bad dancer was who had headed the procession referred to, some of them were led, owing to the extraordinary nature of his punishment, to think of the slave who had been scourged through the forum and then put to death. Accordingly, with the concurrence of the priests, the master of the slave was punished, and the procession and spectacles in honor of the god were exhibited anew. Now it would seem that Numa, who in other respects also was a very wise director of sacred rites, had very properly sought to secure the people's reverent attention by means of the following ordinance. When, namely, magistrates or priests perform any religious function, a herald goes before, crying with a loud voice, Hoc age. The meaning of this cry is, Mind this, and it warns the people to give heed to the sacred rites, and suffer no task or demand of business to intervene, implying that men perform most of their duties under some sort of compulsion and by constraint. And it is customary for the Romans to renew sacrifices and processions, and spectacles, not only for such a reason as the above, but also for trivial reasons. For instance, if one of the horses drawing the sacred chariots called tense gives out, or, again, if the charioteer takes hold of the reins with his left hand, they decree that the procession be renewed, and in later ages a single sacrifice has been performed thirty times, because again and again some failure or offence was thought to occur. Such is the reverent care of the Romans in religious matters. But Martius and Tullus were secretly conferring at Antium with the chief men, and were urging them to begin the war while the Romans were torn by internal dissensions, and when shame restrained them from this course, because they had agreed to a truce and cessation of hostilities for two years, the Romans themselves furnished them with a pretext, by making proclamation at the spectacles and games, because of some suspicion or slanderous report, that the visiting Volsians must leave the city before sunset. Some say that this was due to a deceitful stratagem of Martius, who sent a man to the consuls in Rome, bearing the false charge that the Volsians purposed to fall upon the Romans at the spectacles and set the city on fire. This proclamation made all the Volsians more embittered against the Romans, and Tullus, magnifying the incident and goading them on, at last persuaded them to send ambassadors to Rome and demand back the territories and the cities which had been taken from the Volsians in war. But the Romans, after hearing the ambassadors, were full of indignation, and replied that the Volsians might be first to take up arms, but the Romans would be last to lay them down. Upon receiving this answer, Tullus called a general assembly of his people, and after they had voted for the war, advised them to call in Martius, cherishing no resentment against him, but firmly convinced that he would be more helpful as an ally than he had been injurious as a foe. Martius was therefore called in, and held a conference with the assembly. They saw from his speech that he was as eloquent as his exploits in arms had taught them that he was warlike 
and were convinced of his surpassing intelligence and daring. So they appointed him general with Tullus, and gave him full powers to conduct the war. Fearing, then, that the time needed to equip and marshal the Volsians would be so long as to rob him of his best opportunity for action, he left orders with the magistrates and chief men of the city to assemble and provide the remaining forces and supplies that were requisite, while he himself, after persuading the most ardent spirits to march forth as volunteers with him, and not stop for formal enrollment, burst into the Roman territory of a sudden, when no one expected it. Consequently he secured such abundance of booty, that the Volsians had more than they could possibly do to use it in their camp or carry it off home. But the abundant supplies secured, and the great injury and damage done to the enemy's country, were, in his eyes, the most insignificant result of that expedition. Its chief result, and his main object in making it, was to furnish the people of Rome with fresh charges against the patricians. For, while he maltreated and destroyed everything else, he kept a vigorous watch over the lands of the patricians, and would not suffer anyone to hurt them or take anything from them. This led to still further accusations and broils between the parties in the city. The patricians accused the people of unjustly driving out an influential man, and the people charged the patricians with bringing Martius up against them in a spirit of revenge, and then enjoying the spectacle of what others suffered by the war, while the war itself protected their own wealth and property outside the city. After Martius had accomplished his purposes, and greatly helped the Volsians towards courage and scorn of their enemies, he led his forces back in safety. The entire force of the Volsians was assembled with speed and alacrity, and was then seen to be so large that they determined to leave a part of it behind, for the security of their cities, and with the other part to march against the Romans. Moreover, Martius left it to the choice of Tullus which of the two divisions he would command. Then Tullus, remarking that Martius was clearly in no wise inferior to himself in valour, and had enjoyed a better fortune in all his battles, bade him leave the division that was to take the field, and he himself would remain behind to guard the cities and provide what was requisite for the army abroad. With a stronger force than before, then, Martius set out first against Caesarei, a city which was a colony of Rome. This surrendered to him of its own accord, and he did it no harm. Next he laid waste the country of the Latins, where he expected that the Romans would engage him in defense of the Latins, who were their allies, and by frequent messengers were calling upon them for help. But the commons were indifferent to the appeal. The consuls were unwilling to risk a campaign during the short time left of their term of office, and therefore the Latin envoys were dismissed. Under these circumstances Martius led his forces against their cities, and taking by assault those which offered resistance to him, namely Tolarium, Lavicum, Pedum, and later Bola, he made slaves of the inhabitants and plundered their property. But for those who came over to him of their own accord he showed much concern, and that they might suffer no harm, even against his wishes, he encamped as far as he could from them, and held aloof from their territory. But after he had taken Bola, a city not more than twelve miles away from Rome, where he got much treasure and put almost all the adults to the sword, and after the Volsians, even who had been ordered to remain in their cities, grew impatient, and came trooping in arms to Martius, 
declaring that he was the sole and only general whom they would recognize as their leader then his name was great throughout all italy and men thought with amazement how the valor of a single man upon his changing sides had effected such a marvellous turn in affairs at rome however all was disorder its citizens refused to fight and spent their whole time in cabals and factious disputes with one another until tidings came that the enemy had laid close siege to lavinium where the sacred symbols of the ancestral gods of the romans were stored up and from which their nation took its origin since that was the first city which aeneas founded this produced an astonishing and universal change of opinion in the commons, as well as one which was altogether strange and unexpected in the patricians. For the commons were eager to repeal the sentence against Martius, and invite him back to the city, whereas the senate, on assembling and considering the proposition, rejected and vetoed it, either because they were angrily bent on opposing all the people's desires, or else because they were unwilling that Martius should owe his restoration to the kindness of the people, or because they were now angry at Martius himself, seeing that he was enduring all alike, although he had not been ill-treated by all, and showed himself an enemy of his whole country, although he knew that the most influential and powerful men in it sympathized with him, and shared in his wrongs. When this decision of the Senate was made public, the people was powerless. It could not by its vote enact a law without a previous decree of the Senate. But Martius, when he heard of it, was yet more exasperated, and raising the siege of Lavinium, marched against Rome in wrath, and encamped at the so-called Fosse Cluiliae, only five miles distant from the city. Although the sight of him produced terror and great confusion there, still it put a stop for the present to their dissensions, for no one longer, whether consul or senator, dared to oppose the people in the matter of restoring Martius. On the contrary, when they saw the women running frantic in the city, and the aged men resorting to the sacred shrines with suppliant tears and prayers, and everywhere an utter lack of courage and saving counsels, then all agreed that the people had done well to seek a reconciliation with Martius, but that the Senate had made a total mistake in beginning then to indulge its wrath and revengeful spirit, when it had been well to lay such feelings aside. It was therefore unanimously decided to send ambassadors to Martius, offering him the privilege of returning to his country, and begging him to stop his war upon them. Moreover, the messengers from the Senate were kinsmen and friends of Martius, and expected to be treated with great friendliness in their first interview with a man who was a relative and associate of theirs. But matters turned out quite otherwise, for after being led through the camp of the enemy, they found him seated in great state, and looking insufferably stern. Surrounded by the chief men of the Volsians, he bade the Romans declare their wishes. They did so, in reasonable and considerate language, and with a manner suitable to their position. And, when they had ceased, he made an answer which, so far as it concerned himself, was full of bitterness and anger at their treatment of him. And in behalf of the Volsians, as their general, he ordered the restitution of the cities and territory which had been torn from them in war, and the passage of a decree granting the Volsians, as allies, equal civic rights, as had been done for the Latins. 
for no respite from the war would be secure and lasting he said except it be based on just and equal rights moreover he gave them thirty days for deliberation and when the ambassadors were gone he immediately withdrew his forces from the country this was the first ground of complaint against him which was laid hold of by those of the balsians who had long been jealous of him and uneasy at the influence which he had acquired among these was tullus also not because he had been personally wronged at all by martius but because he was only too human for he was vexed to find his reputation wholly obscured and himself neglected by the volsians who thought that martius alone was everything to them and that their other leaders should be content with whatever share of influence and authority he might bestow upon them this was the reason why the first seeds of denunciation were sown in secret and now banding together the malcontents shared their resentment with one another and called the withdrawal of martius a betrayal not so much of cities and armies as of golden opportunities which proved the salvation or the loss of these as well as of everything else for he had granted a respite of thirty days from war although in war the greatest changes might occur in much less time than this and yet martius did not spend this time in idleness but fell upon the enemy's allies harassed and ravaged their territories and captured seven of their large and populous cities and the romans did not venture to come to their aid but their spirits were full of hesitation and their attitude toward the war was that of men who are completely benumbed and paralyzed and when the time had passed and martius was at hand again with his entire force they sent out another embassy to entreat him to moderate his wrath withdraw the volsian army from the country and then make such proposals and settlements as he thought best for both nations for the romans would make no concessions through fear but if he thought that the volsians ought to obtain certain favors all such would be granted them if they laid down their arms martius replied that as general of the volsians he would make no answer to this but as one who was still a citizen of rome he advised and exhorted them to adopt more moderate views of what justice required and come to him in three days with the ratification of his previous demands but if they should decide otherwise they must know well that it was not safe for them to come walking into his camp again with empty phrases when the embassy had returned and the senate had heard its report it was felt that the city was tossing on the billows of a great tempest and therefore the last and sacred anchor was let down a decree was passed that all the priests of the gods and the celebrants or custodians of the mysteries and those who practiced the ancient and ancestral art of divination from the flight of birds that all these should go to martius arrayed as was the custom of each in the performance of their sacred rites and should urge him in the same manner as before to put a stop to the war and then to confer with his fellow citizens regarding the volsians he did indeed admit this embassy into his camp but made no other concession nor did he act or speak more mildly but told them to make a settlement on his former terms or else accept the war accordingly when the priests had returned it was decided to remain quietly in the city guarding its walls and repulsing the enemy should he make an attack they put their hopes in time especially 
and in the vicissitudes of fortune, since they knew not how to save themselves by their own efforts, but turmoil, terror, and rumours of evil possessed the city. At last something happened that was like what Homer often mentions, although people generally do not wholly believe it. For when some great and unusual deed is to be done, that poet declares in his stately manner, He then was inspired by the goddess, flashing-eyed Athene. And again, But some immortal turned his mind by lodging in his heart a fear of what the folk would say. And again, Either through some suspicion, or else a god so bade him do, but people despise Homer, and say that with his impossible exploits and incredible tales, he makes it impossible to believe in every man's power to determine his own choice of action. This, however, is not what Homer does, but those acts which are natural, customary, and the result of reasoning, he attributes to our own volition and he certainly says frequently, But I formed a plan within my lordly heart. And also, So he spake, and Peleus's son was sore distressed, and his heart, within his shaggy breast, between two courses was divided. And again, But him no whit could she persuade from his integrity, the fiery-hearted Bellerophon while in exploits of a strange and extraordinary nature, requiring some rush of inspiration and desperate courage, he does not represent the god as taking away, but as prompting a man's choice of action, nor yet as creating impulses in a man, but rather conceptions which lead to impulses and by these his action is not made involuntary, but his will is set in motion, while courage and hope are added to sustain him. For either the influence of the gods must be wholly excluded from all initiating power over our actions, or in what other way can they assist and cooperate with men? They certainly do not mould our bodies by their direct agency, nor give the requisite change to the action of our hands and feet, but rather by certain motives, conceptions, and purposes, they rouse the active and elective powers of our spirits, or, on the other hand, divert and check them. Now in Rome, at the time of which I speak, various groups of women visited the various temples, but the greater part of them, and those of highest station, carried their supplications to the altar of Jupiter Capitolinus. Among these was Valeria, a sister of that Publicola, who had done the Romans so many eminent services both as warrior and statesman. Publicola, indeed, had died some time before, as I have related in his life. But Valeria was still enjoying her repute and honour in the city, where her life was thought to adorn her lineage. This woman, then, suddenly seized with one of those feelings which I have been describing, and laying hold of the right expedient, with a purpose not uninspired of heaven, rose up herself, bade the other women all rise, and came with them to the house of Volumnia, the mother of Martius. After entering and finding her seated with her daughter-in-law, and holding the children of Martius on her lap, Valeria called about her the women who had followed, and said, We whom thou seest here, Volumnia, and thou, Virgilia, are come as women to women, obeying neither senatorial edict nor consular command, but our God, as it would seem, taking pity on our supplication, put into our hearts, 
an impulse to come hither to you and beseech you to do that which will not only be the salvation of us ourselves and of the citizens besides but also lift you who consent to do it to a more conspicuous fame than that which the daughters of the sabines won when they brought their fathers and husbands out of war into friendship and peace arise come with us to martius and join with us in supplicating him bearing this just and true testimony in behalf of your country that although she has suffered much wrong at his hands she has neither done nor thought of doing harm to you in her anger but restores you to him even though she is destined to obtain no equitable treatment at his hands these words of valeria were seconded by the cries of the other women with her and volumnia gave them this answer o oh, women not only have we an equal share with you in the common calamities but we have an additional misery of our own in that we have lost the fame and virtue of martius and see his person protected in command rather than preserved from death by the arms of our enemies and yet it is the greatest of our misfortunes that our native city is become so utterly weak as to place her hopes in us for i know not whether the man will have any regard for us since he has none for his country which he once set before mother and wife and children however take us and use us and bring us to him if we can do nothing else we can at least breathe out our lives in supplications for our country after this she took the children and virgilia and went with the other women to the camp of the volsians the sight of them and the pitifulness of it produced even in their enemies reverence and silence now it chanced that martius was seated on a tribunal with his chief officers when accordingly he saw the women approaching he was amazed and when he recognized his mother who walked at their head he would fain have persisted in his previous inflexible and implacable course but mastered by his feelings and confounded at what he saw he could not endure to remain seated while they approached him but descended quickly from the tribunal and ran to meet them he saluted his mother first and held her a long time in his embrace and then his wife and children sparing now neither tears nor caresses but suffering himself as it were to be borne away by a torrent of emotion but when he was sated with this and perceived that his mother now wished to say something he brought to his side the counsellors of the Volsians, and heard Volumnia speak as follows. Thou seest, my son, even if we do not speak ourselves, and canst judge from the wretchedness of our garb and aspect, to what a pitiful state thy banishment has reduced us. And now be sure that we who come to thee are of all women most unhappy since fortune has made the sight which should have been most sweet most dreadful for us as i behold my son and this wife of thine her husband encamped against the walls of our native city and that which for the rest is an assuagement of all misfortune and misery namely prayer to the gods has become for us most impracticable for we cannot ask from the gods both victory for our country and at the same time safety for thee but that which any one of our foes might imprecate upon us as a curse this must be the burden of our prayers for thy wife and children must needs be deprived either of their country or of thee as for me 
I will not wait to have the war decide this issue for me while I live. But unless I can persuade thee to substitute friendship and concord for dissension and hostility, and so to become a benefactor of both parties, rather than a destroyer of one of them, then consider and be well assured that thou canst not assail thy country without first treading under foot the corpse of her who bore thee. For it does not behoove me to awake that day on which I shall behold my son, either led in triumph by his fellow citizens, or triumphing over his country. If, then, I asked you to save your country by ruining the Volscians, the question before thee would be a grievous one, my son, and hard to decide, since it is neither honourable for a man to destroy his fellow-citizens, nor just for him to betray those who have put their trust in him. But as it is, we ask only a relief from evils, something which would be salutary for both parties alike but more conducive to fame and honour for the Volsians, because their superiority in arms will give them the appearance of bestowing the greatest of blessings, namely peace and friendship, although they get these no less themselves. If these blessings are realised, it will be chiefly due to thee. If they are not, then thou alone will bear the blame from both nations. And though the issues of war are obscure, this is manifest, that if victorious, thou wilt only be thy country's destroying demon, and if defeated, the world will think that, to satisfy thy wrath, thou didst bring down the greatest calamities upon men who were thy benefactors and friends. While Volumnia was saying this, Martius listened without making any answer, and after she had ceased also, he stood a long time in silence. Volumnia therefore began once more. Why art thou silent, my son? Is it right to yield everything to wrath and resentment? but wrong to gratify a mother in a prayer as this? Or is the remembrance of his wrongs becoming to a great man, while the remembrance with reverence and honour of the benefits which children have received from their parents is not the duty of a great and good man? Surely for no man were it more seemly to cherish gratitude than for thee who dost so bitterly proceed against ingratitude. And yet, although thou hast already punished thy country severely, thou hast not shown thy mother any gratitude. It were, therefore, a most pious thing in thee to grant me, without any compulsion, so worthy and just a request as mine. But since I cannot persuade thee, why should I spare my last resource? And with these words she threw herself at his feet, together with his wife and children. Then Martius, crying out, What hast thou done to me, my mother? lifted her up, and pressing her right hand warmly, said, Thou art victorious, and thy victory means good fortune to my country but death to me, for I shall withdraw vanquished, though by thee alone. When he had said this, and had held a little private conference with his mother and his wife, he sent them back again to Rome, as they desired, and on the next morning led away his Volsians, who were not all affected in the same way, nor equally pleased by what had happened for some found fault both with him and with what he had done. But others, who were favourably disposed towards a peaceful settlement of the dispute, with neither, while some, though displeased with his proceedings, 
nevertheless could not look upon Martius as a bad man, but thought it pardonable in him to be broken down by such strong compulsions. No one, however, opposed him, but all followed him obediently, though rather out of admiration for his virtue than regard for his authority. But the Roman people showed more plainly, when they were set free from the war, the greatness of their fear and peril while it lasted. For as soon as those who manned the walls decried the Volsians drawing their forces off, every temple was thrown open, and the people crowned themselves with garlands, and offered sacrifices as if for victory. But the joy of the city was most apparent in the honor and loving favor which both the Senate and the whole people bestowed upon the women, declaring their belief that the city's salvation was manifestly due to them. When, however, the Senate passed a decree that whatsoever they asked for themselves in the way of honor or favor should be furnished and done for them by the magistrates, they asked for nothing else besides the erection of a temple of woman's fortune, the expense of which they offered to contribute of themselves, if the city would undertake to perform at the public charge all the sacrifices and honors such as are due to the gods. The Senate commended their public spirit, and erected the temple and its image at the public charge, but they none the less contributed money themselves, and set up a second image of the goddess, and this, the Romans say, as it was placed in the temple, uttered some such words as these, Dear to the gods, O women, is your pious gift of me. These words were actually uttered twice as the story runs, which would have us believe what is difficult of belief, and probably never happened. For that statues have appeared to sweat and shed tears, and exude something like drops of blood, is not impossible, since wood and stone often contract a mold which is productive of moisture, and cover themselves with many colors, and receive tints from the atmosphere. And there is nothing in the way of believing that the deity uses these phenomena sometimes as signs and portents. It is possible also that statues may emit a noise like a moan or a groan by reason of a fracture or a rupture, which is more violent if it takes place in the interior. But that articulate speech and language so clear and abundant and precise should proceed from a lifeless thing is altogether impossible, since not even the soul of man or the deity without a body duly organized and fitted with vocal parts has ever spoken and conversed. But where history forces our assent with numerous and credible witnesses, we must conclude that an experience different from that of sensation arises in the imaginative part of the soul, and persuades men to think it sensation. As, for instance, in sleep, when we think we see and hear, although we neither see nor hear. However, those who cherish strong feelings of good will and affection for the deity, and are therefore unable to reject or deny anything of this kind, have a strong argument for their faith in the wonderful and transcendent character of the divine power. For the deity has no resemblance whatsoever to man, either in nature, activity, skill, or strength, nor, if he does something that we cannot do, or contrives something that we cannot contrive, is this contrary to reason, but rather since he differs from us in all points, in his works most of all, is he unlike us, and far removed from us. But most of the deity's powers, 
as Heraclitus says, escape our knowledge through incredulity. As for Martius, when he came back to Antium from his expedition, Tullus, who had long hated him and been oppressed with jealousy of him, plotted to take him off at once, believing that if his enemy escaped him now, he would never give him another chance to seize him. Having therefore arrayed a large party against him, he bade him lay down his command and give the Volsians an account of his administration. But Martius, afraid of being reduced to private station when Tullus was in command, and exercising the greatest influence among his own countrymen, said he would resign his command to the Volsians if they bade him do so, since it was at their general bidding that he had assumed it, and that he was ready, and would not refuse even before that, to give a full account of his administration to all the people of Antium who desired it. An assembly was therefore held, at which the popular leaders who had been set to the work rose and tried to embitter the multitude against him. But when Martius rose to speak, the more disorderly part of his audience grew quiet, out of reverence for him, and gave him opportunity to speak fearlessly, while the best of the men of Antium, and those that were especially pleased with peace, made it clear that they would listen to him with favor, and give a just decision. Tullus, therefore, began to fear the effect of the man's plea in self-defense, for he was one of the most powerful speakers, and his earlier achievements secured him a gratitude which outweighed his later fault. Nay, more, the very charge against him was but so much proof of the great gratitude which was his due. For they would not have thought themselves wrong in not getting Rome into their power, had not the efforts of Martius brought them near to taking it. Accordingly, the conspirators decided to make no more delay, and not to test the feelings of the multitude. But the boldest of them, crying out that the Volsians must not listen to the traitor, nor suffer him to retain his command, and play the tyrant among them, fell upon him in a body and slew him, and no man present offered to defend him. However, that the deed was not wrought with the approval of the majority of the Volsians, was seen at once from their coming out of their cities in concourse to his body, to which they gave honorable burial, adorning his tomb with arms and spoils, as that of a chieftain and general. But when the Romans learned of his death, they paid him no other mark either of honor or resentment, but simply granted the request of the women that they might mourn for him ten months, as was customary when any one of them lost a father or a son or a brother. For this was the period fixed for the longest mourning, and it was fixed by Numa Pompilius, as is written in his life. The loss of Martius was keenly felt at once by the Volsian state, for, in the first place, they quarrelled with the Aquians, who were their allies and friends, over the supreme command, and carried their quarrel to the length of bloodshed and slaughter. In the second place, they were defeated in battle by the Romans, wherein Tullus was slain, and the very flower of their forces was cut to pieces, so that they were glad to accept most disgraceful terms, becoming subjects of Rome, and pledging themselves to obey her commands. End of Caius Martius Coriolanus, Part 3of Volume 4 of Plutarch's Parallel Lives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Burlinson.
Volume Four of Plutarch's Parallel Lives of the Noble Greeks and Romans, translated by Bernadotte Perrin. Comparison of Alcibiades and Coriolanus. Now that all the deeds of these men are set forth, so far as we consider them worthy of recollection and record, it is plain that their military careers do not incline the balance either way very decidedly for both alike gave many signal proofs of daring and valour as soldiers, as well as of skill and foresight as commanders, except that some may give the preference to Alcibiades, because he was continually successful and victorious in many struggles by sea as well as by land, and declare him therefore the more consummate general. It is certainly true of each that, when he was at home and in command, he always conducted his country's cause with manifest success, and, contrarywise, inflicted even more manifest injury upon it when he went over to the enemy. As statesmen, if the exceeding wantonness of Alcibiades, and the stain of dissoluteness and vulgarity upon all his efforts, to win the favour of the multitude, won the loathing of sober-minded citizens, it was equally true that the utter ungraciousness of Martius, together with his pride and oligarchical demeanour, won the hatred of the Roman people. Neither course, then, is to be approved, although the man who seeks to win the people by his favours is less blameworthy than those who heap insults on the multitude, in order to avoid the appearance of trying to win them. For it is a disgrace to flatter the people for the sake of power, but to get power by acts of terror, violence, and oppression is not only a disgrace, it is also an injustice. Now that Martius is usually thought to have been rather simple in his nature, and straightforward, while Alcibiades was unscrupulous in his public acts, and false, is very clear, and Alcibiades is particularly denounced for the malicious deceit by which he cheated the Lacedaemonian ambassadors, as Thucydides relates, and put an end to the peace. But this policy of his, although it did plunge the city again into war, made it nevertheless strong and formidable, by reason of the alliance with Mantinea and Argos, which Alcibiades secured for it. And yet Martius himself also used deceit to stir up war between the Romans and Volscians, when he brought a false charge against the visitors to the games, as Dionysius relates and the motive for his action makes it the worse of the two. For he was not influenced by ambition, or by rivalry in a political struggle, as Alcibiades was, but simply gave way to his anger, from which passion, as Dion says, no one ever gets a grateful return, and threw many districts of Italy into confusion and needlessly sacrificed many innocent cities to his rage against his country. It is true, indeed, that Alcibiades also, through his anger, was the cause of great calamities to his countrymen. But just as soon as he saw that they were repentant, he showed them his good will, and after he had been driven away a second time, he did not exult over the mistakes of their generals, nor look with indifference upon their bad and perilous plans, but did precisely what Aristides is so highly praised for doing to Themistocles. He came to the men who were then in command, although they were not his friends, and told them plainly what they ought to do. Marcius, however, in the first place, did injury to his whole city, although he had not been injured by the whole of it. But the best and strongest part of it shared his wrongs and his distress. In the second place, 
by resisting and not yielding to the many embassies and supplications with which his countrymen tried to heal his single wrath and folly he made it clear that he had undertaken a fierce and implacable war for the overthrow and destruction of his country not that he might recover and regain it further in this point it may be said there was a difference between them namely that alcibiades when he went over to the side of the athenians was moved by fear and hatred of the spartans who were plotting to take his life whereas it was dishonorable for marcius to leave the volscians in the lurch when they were treating him with perfect fairness for he was appointed their leader and had the greatest credit and influence among them unlike alcibiades whom the lacedaemonians misused rather than used who wandered about aimlessly in their city and again was tossed to and fro in their camp and at last threw himself into the hands of tissaphernes unless indeed he was all the while paying him court in order that the athens to which he longed to return might not be utterly destroyed furthermore in the matter of money we are told that alcibiades often got it ill by taking bribes and spent it ill in luxury and dissipation whereas Martius could not be persuaded to take it even when it was offered to him as an honor by his commanders and for this reason he was especially odious to the multitude in the disputes with the people concerning debts because they saw that it was not for gain but out of insolence and scorn that he acted despitefully towards the poor antipater writing in one of his letters about the death of aristotle the philosopher says in addition to all his other gifts the man had also that of persuasion and the absence of this gift in martius made his great deeds and virtues obnoxious to the very men whom they benefited since they could not endure the arrogant pride of the man and that self-will which is as plato says the companion of solitude alcibiades on the contrary understood how to treat in a friendly manner those who met him and we cannot wonder that when he was successful his fame was attended with goodwill and humor and flowered luxuriantly since some of his errors even had often charm and felicity this was the reason why in spite of the great and frequent harm done by him to the city he was nevertheless many times appointed leader and general while martius when he stood for an office which was his due in view of his valorous achievements was defeated and so it was that the one could not make himself hated by his countrymen even when he was doing them harm while the other was after all not beloved even while he was admired for martius did not as a commander obtain any great successes for his city but only for his enemies against his country whereas alcibiades was often of service to the athenians both as a private soldier and as a commander when he was at home he mastered his adversaries to his heart's content it was when he was absent that their calumnies prevailed martius on the contrary was with the romans when they condemned him and with the volscians when they slew him the deed was not in accordance with justice or right it is true and yet his own acts supplied an excuse for it because after rejecting the terms of peace publicly offered and suffering himself to be persuaded by the private solicitations of the women he did not put an end to hostilities but allowed the war to continue while he threw away forever its golden opportunity for he should have won the consent of those who had put their trust in him 
before retiring from his position, if he had the highest regard for their just claims upon him. If, on the other hand, he cared nothing for the Volsians, but was prosecuting the war merely to satisfy his own anger, and then stopped it abruptly, the honorable course had been not to spare his country for his mother's sake, but his mother together with his country. Since his mother and his wife were part and parcel of the native city which he was besieging, but after giving harsh treatment to public supplications, entreaties of embassies, and prayers of priests, then to concede his withdrawal as a favor to his mother was not so much an honor to that mother as it was a dishonor to his country, which was thus saved by the pitiful intercession of a single woman, and held unworthy of salvation for its own sake. Surely the favor was invidious and harsh, and really no favor at all, and unacceptable to both parties, for he retired without listening to the persuasions of his antagonists, and without gaining the consent of his comrades in arms. The cause of all this lay in his unsociable, very overweening and self-willed disposition which of itself is offensive to most people, and when combined with an ambitious spirit, becomes altogether savage and implacable. Such men pay no court to the multitude, professing not to want their honors, and then are vexed if they do not get them. Certainly there was no tendency to importune or court the favor of the multitude in men like Metellus, Aristides, and Epimondus. But, owing to their genuine contempt for what a people has the power to give and take away, though they were repeatedly ostracized, defeated at elections, and condemned in courts of justice, they cherished no anger against their countrymen for their ingratitude, but showed them kindness again when they repented and were reconciled with them when they asked it. Surely he who least courts the people's favor ought least to resent their neglect, since vexation over failure to receive their honors is most apt to spring from an excessive longing after them. Well then, Alcibiades would not deny that he rejoiced to be honored, and was displeased to be overlooked and he therefore tried to be agreeable and pleasant to his associates. But the overweening pride of Martius would not suffer him to pay court to those who had the power to honor and advance him, while his ambition made him feel angry and hurt when he was neglected. These are the blameworthy traits in the man, but all the rest are brilliant and, for his temperance and superiority to wealth, he deserves to be compared with the best and purest of the Greeks, not with Alcibiades, who, in these regards, was the most unscrupulous of men, and the most careless of the claims of honor. End of Alcibiades and Coriolanus of Volume 4 of Plutarch's Parallel Lives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Burlinson. Volume 4 of Plutarch's Parallel Lives of the Noble Greeks and Romans. Translated by Bernadotte Perrin. Lysander Part One, The treasury of the Acanthians at Delphi bears this inscription, Brasidas and the Acanthians, with spoil from the Athenians. For this reason many think that the marble figure standing within the edifice by the door is a statute of Brasidas. 
but it really represents Lysander, with his hair very long, after the ancient custom, and growing a generous beard. For it is not true, as some state, that because the Argives, after their great defeat, shaved their heads for sorrow, the Spartans, in contrary fashion, let their hair grow in exultation over their victory. Nor was it because the Bacchiade, when they fled from Corinth to Lacedaemon, looked mean and unsightly from having shaved their heads, that the Spartans, on their part, became eager to wear their hair long. But this custom also goes back to Lycurgus, and he is reported to have said that a fine head of hair makes the handsome more comely to look upon, and the ugly more terrible. The father of Lysander, Aristocleitus, is said to have been of the lineage of the Heracleidae, though not of the royal family. But Lysander was reared in poverty, and showed himself as much as any man conformable to the customs of his people. Of a manly spirit, too, and superior to every pleasure, excepting only that which their good deeds bring to those who are successful and honoured. To this pleasure it is no disgrace for the youth in Sparta to succumb. Indeed, from the very first they wish their boys to be sensitive towards public opinion, distressed by censure, and exalted by praise. And he who is insensible and stolid in these matters is looked down upon as without ambition for excellence, and a cumberer of the ground. Ambition, then, and the spirit of emulation were firmly implanted in him by his Laconian training, and no great fault should be found with his natural disposition on this account. But he seems to have been naturally subservient to men of power and influence, beyond what was usual in a Spartan, and content to endure an arrogant authority for the sake of gaining his ends a trait which some hold to be no small part of political ability. And Aristotle, when he sets forth that great natures, like those of Socrates and Plato and Heracles, have a tendency to melancholy, writes also that Lysander, not immediately, but when well on in years, was a prey to melancholy. But what is most peculiar in him is that, though he bore poverty well, and though he was never mastered nor even corrupted by money, yet he filled his country full of wealth, and the love of wealth, and made her cease to be admired for not admiring wealth, importing as he did an abundance of gold and silver after the war with Athens although he kept not a single drachma for himself. And when Dionysius, the tyrant, sent his daughters some costly tunics of Sicilian make, he would not receive them, saying he was afraid they would make his daughters look more ugly. But a little later, when he was sent as ambassador to the same tyrant from the same city, and was presented by him with two robes, and ordered to choose which of them he would, and carry it to his daughter, he said that she could choose better herself, and went off with both of them. The Peloponnesian War had now been carried on for a long time, and after their disaster in Sicily, it was expected that the Athenians would straightway lose their control of the sea, and presently give up the struggle altogether. But Alcibiades, returning from exile, and taking the command, wrought a great change, and made his countrymen again a match for their enemies by sea. The Lacedaemonians, accordingly, were frightened again, and summoning up fresh zeal for the war, which required, as they thought, an able leader and a more powerful armament, sent out Lysander to take command upon the sea. When he came to Ephesus, 
he found the city well disposed to him and very zealous in the spartan cause although it was then in a low state of prosperity and in danger of becoming utterly barbarized by the admixture of persian customs since it was enveloped by lydia and the king's generals made it their headquarters he therefore pitched his tent there and ordered the merchant vessels from every quarter to land their cargoes there and made preparations for the building of triremes thus he revived the traffic of their harbours and the business of their market and filled their houses and workshops with profits so that from that time on and through his efforts the city had hopes of achieving the stateliness and grandeur which it now enjoys when he learned that cyrus the king's son was come to sardis he went up to confer with him and to accuse tissaphernes who though he was commissioned to aid the lacedaemonians and drive the athenians from the sea was thought to be remiss in his duty through the efforts of alcibiades showing lack of zeal and destroying the efficiency of the fleet by the meagre subsidies which he gave now cyrus was well pleased that tissaphernes who was a base man and privately at feud with him should be accused and maligned by this means then as well as by his behaviour in general lysander made himself agreeable and by the submissive deference of his conversation above all else he won the heart of the young prince and roused him to prosecute the war with vigour at a banquet which cyrus gave him as he was about to depart the prince begged him not to reject the tokens of his friendliness but to ask plainly for whatever he desired since nothing whatsoever would be refused him since then said lysander in reply thou art so very kind i beg and entreat thee cyrus to add an obol to the pay of my sailors that they may get four obols instead of three cyrus accordingly delighted with his public spirit gave him ten thousand darics out of which he added the obol to the pay of his seamen and by the renown thus won soon emptied the ships of his enemies for most of their seamen came over to those who offered higher pay and those who remained were listless and mutinous and gave daily trouble to their officers however although he had thus injured and weakened his enemies lysander shrank from a naval battle through fear of alcibiades who was energetic had a greater number of ships and in all his battles by land and sea up to that time had come off victorious but after this alcibiades sailed away from samos to phocea leaving antiochus his pilot in command of the fleet and antiochus as if in bold mockery of lysander put into the harbour of ephesus with two triremes and rowed ostentatiously past his ships as they lay drawn up on shore with noise and laughter lysander was incensed and launching at first only a few of his triremes pursued him then seeing that the athenians were coming to the rescue he manned others and at last the action became general lysander was victorious too captured fifteen triremes and set up a trophy thereupon the people of athens flying into a passion deposed alcibiades from his command and finding himself slighted and abused by the soldiers of samos he left the camp and sallied off to the chersonese this battle then although actually not a great one was made memorable by its bearing on the fortunes of alcibiades lysander now summoned from their various cities to ephesus men whom he saw to be the most eminent for confidence and daring and sowed in their minds 
the seeds of the revolutionary decadarchies afterwards instituted by him urging and inciting them to form political clubs in their several cities and apply themselves to public affairs assuring them that as soon as the athenian empire was destroyed they could rid themselves of their democracies and become themselves supreme in power moreover by actual benefits he gave them all a confidence in this future promoting those who were already his friends and allies to large enterprises and honors and commands and taking a share himself in their injustice and wickedness in order to gratify their rapacity therefore all attached themselves to him courted his favor and fixed their hearts upon him expecting to attain all their highest ambitions if only he remained in power therefore they neither looked kindly upon callicratidas at the first when he came to succeed lysander in the admiralty nor afterwards when he had shown by manifest proofs that he was the justest and noblest of men were they pleased with the manner of his leadership which had a certain doric simplicity and sincerity they did indeed admire his virtue as they would the beauty of a hero's statue but they yearned for the zealous support of lysander and missed the interest which he took in the welfare of his partisans so that when he sailed away they were dejected and shed tears lysander made these men yet more disaffected towards callicratidas he also sent back to sardis what remained of the money which cyrus had given him for the navy bidding callicratidas ask for it himself if he wished and see to the maintenance of his soldiers and finally as he sailed away he called callicratidas to witness that the fleet which he handed over to him was in command of the sea but he wishing to prove the emptiness and vanity of this ambitious boast said in that case keep samos on the left sail to miletus and there hand the triremes over to me surely we need not fear to sail past the enemy at samos if we are masters of the sea to this lysander answered that callicratidas and not he was in command of the ships and sailed off to peloponnesus leaving callicratidas in great perplexity for neither had he brought money from home with him nor could he bear to lay the cities under forced contribution when they were already in an evil plight the only course left therefore was to go to the doors of the king's generals as lysander had done and ask for money for this he was of all men least fitted by nature being of a free and lofty spirit and one who thought any and every defeat of greeks at the hands of greeks more becoming to them than visits of flattery to the houses of barbarians who had much gold but nothing else worth while constrained however by his necessities he went up into lydia proceeded at once to the house of cyrus and ordered word to be sent in that callicratidas the admiral was come and wished to confer with him and when one of the doorkeepers said to him but cyrus is not at leisure now stranger for he is at his wine callicratidas replied with the utmost simplicity no matter i will stand here and wait till he has had his wine this time then he merely withdrew after being taken for a rustic fellow and laughed at by the barbarians but when he was come a second time to the door and was refused admittance he was indignant and set off for ephesus invoking many evils upon those who first submitted to the mockery of the barbarians and taught them to be insolent because of their wealth 
and swearing roundly to the bystanders that as soon as he got back to sparta he would do all he could to reconcile the greeks with one another in order that they might themselves strike fear into the barbarians and cease soliciting their power against each other but callicratidas after cherishing purposes worthy of lacedaemon and showing himself worthy to compete with the most eminent of the greeks by reason of his righteousness magnanimity and valour not long afterwards lost the sea fight at Arginusae and vanished from among men then their cause declining the allies sent an embassy to sparta and asked that lysander be made admiral declaring that they would grapple much more vigorously with the situation if he were their commander cyrus also sent to make the same request now the lacedaemonians had a law forbidding that the same man should be admiral twice and yet they wished to gratify their allies they therefore invested a certain arrakis with the title of admiral and sent out lysander as vice-admiral nominally but really with supreme power so he came out as most of those who had political power and influence in the cities had long desired for they expected to become still stronger by his aid when the popular governments had been utterly overthrown but to those who loved simplicity and nobility in the character of their leaders lysander compared with callicratidas seemed to be unscrupulous and subtle a man who tricked out most of what he did in war with the varied hues of deceit extolling justice if it was at the same time profitable but if not adopting the advantageous as the honourable course and not considering truth as inherently better than falsehood but bounding his estimate of either by the needs of the hour those who demanded that the descendants of heracles should not wage war by deceit he held up to ridicule saying that where the lion's skin will not reach it must be patched out with the foxes of such a sort were his dealings with miletus according to the record for when his friends and allies whom he had promised to aid in overthrowing the democracy and expelling their opponents changed their minds and became reconciled to their foes openly he pretended to be pleased and to join in the reconciliation but in secret he reviled and abused them and incited them to fresh attacks upon the multitude and when he perceived that the uprising was begun he quickly came up and entered the city where he angrily rebuked the first conspirators whom he met and set upon them roughly as though he were going to punish them but ordered the rest of the people to be of good cheer and to fear no further evil now that he was with them but in this he was playing a shifty part wishing the leading men of the popular party not to fly but to remain in the city and be slain and this was what actually happened for all who put their trust in him were slaughtered Furthermore, there is a saying of Lysander's recorded by Androcleides which makes him guilty of the greatest recklessness in the matter of oaths. It was his policy, according to this authority, to cheat boys with knuckle bones, but men with oaths. Thus, imitating Polycrates of Samos, not a proper attitude in a general towards a tyrant nor yet a laconian trait to treat the gods as one's enemies are treated nay more outrageously still since he who overreaches his enemy by means of an oath confesses that he fears that enemy but despises god well then cyrus summoned lysander to sardis 
and gave him this and promised him that ardently protesting to gratify him that he would actually squander his own fortune if his father gave him nothing for the spartans and if all else failed he said he would cut up the throne on which he sat when giving audience a throne covered with gold and silver and finally as he was going up into media to wait upon his father he assigned to lysander the tribute of the cities and entrusted his own government to him and embracing him in farewell and begging him not to fight the athenians at sea until he was come back and promising to come back with many ships from phoenicia and cilicia he set out to go up to the king then lysander who could neither fight a naval battle on equal terms nor remain idle with the large fleet at his disposal put out to sea and reduced some of the islands and touching at aegina and salamis overran them then he landed in attica and saluted aegis who came down in person from decalea to meet him and displayed to the land forces there the strength of his fleet with the mien of one who sailed where he pleased and was master of the sea but on learning that the athenians were pursuing him he fled by another route through the islands to asia finding the hellespont unguarded he himself attacked lampasicus from the sea with his ships while thorax cooperating with the land forces assaulted the walls he took the city by storm and gave it up to his soldiers to plunder meanwhile the athenian fleet of a hundred and eighty triremes had just arrived at eleus in the chersonese and learning that lampsacus had fallen they straightway put in at sestos there they took in provisions and then sailed along to agispotomy over against their enemies who were still in station at lampsacus the athenians were under the command of several generals among whom was philocles the man who had recently persuaded the people to pass a decree that their prisoners of war should have the right thumb cut off that they might not be able to wield a spear though they might ply an oar for the time being then all rested expecting that on the morrow the fleets would engage but lysander was planning otherwise and ordered his seamen and pilots as though there would be a struggle at daybreak to go on board their triremes in the early morning and take their seats in order and in silence awaiting the word of command and that the land forces also in the same manner remain quietly in their ranks by the sea when the sun rose however and the athenians sailed up with their ships in line and challenged to battle although he had his ships drawn up in line to meet them and fully manned before it was light he did not put out from his position but sending dispatch boats to the foremost of his ships ordered them to keep quiet and remain in line not getting into confusion nor sailing out to meet the enemy and so about midday when the athenians sailed back he did not allow his men to leave their ships until two or three triremes which he sent to reconnoitre came back after seeing that the enemy had disembarked on the following day this was done again and on the third and at last on the fourth so that the athenians became very bold and contemptuous believing that their enemies were huddling together in fear at this juncture alcibiades who was living in his own fortress on the chersonese rode up to the athenian army and censured the generals first for having pitched their camp in a bad and even dangerous place 
on an open beach where there was no roadstead, and, second, for the mistake of getting their provisions from distant Sestos, when they ought to sail round the coast a little way to the harbour and city of Sestos, where they would be at a longer remove from their enemies, who lay watching them with an army commanded by a single man, the fear of whom led it to obey his every order promptly. These were the lessons he gave them, but they would not receive them, and Titius actually gave him an insolent answer, saying that he was not general now, but others. Alcibiades, accordingly, suspecting that some treachery was afoot among them, went away. But on the fifth day, when the Athenians had sailed over to the enemy and back again, as was now their wont, very carelessly and contemptuously, Lysander, as he sent out his reconnoitering ships, ordered their commanders, as soon as they saw that the Athenians had disembarked, to put about and row back with all speed, and when they were halfway across, to hoist a brazen shield at the prow as a signal for the onset. And he himself sailed round and earnestly exhorted the pilots and triarchs to keep all their crews at their post, sailors and soldiers alike, and as soon as the signal was given, to row with ardour and vigour against the enemy. When, therefore, the shield was hoisted on the lookout ships, and the trumpet on the admiral's ship signalled the attack, the ships sailed forth, and the land forces ran their fastest along the shore to seize the promontory. The distance between the two continents at this point is fifteen furlongs, and such was the zealous ardour of the rowers that it was quickly consumed. Conan, the Athenian general, who was the first to see from the land the onset of the fleet, suddenly shouted orders to embark, and, deeply stirred by the threatening disaster, called upon some, besought others, and forced others still to man the triremes but his eager efforts were of no avail, since the men were scattered. For just as soon as they had disembarked, since they expected no trouble, some went to market, some walked about the country, some lay down to sleep in their tents, and some began to get their suppers ready, being as far as possible removed from any thought of what was to happen, through the inexperience of their commanders. The shouts and splashing oars of the oncoming enemy were already heard, when Conan, with eight ships, sailed stealthily away, and making his escape, proceeded to Cyprus, to Evagoras. But the Peloponnesians fell upon the rest of the ships, some of which they took entirely empty, and others they disabled while their crews were still getting aboard and the men, coming up unarmed and in staggering fashion, perished at their ships, or, if they fled by land, their enemies, who had disembarked, slew them. Lysander took three thousand men prisoners, together with their generals, and captured the whole fleet, excepting the perilous, and the ships that had made their escape with Conan. So, after plundering his enemy's camp and taking their ships in tow, he sailed back to Lamsacus, to the sound of pipes and hymns of victory. He had wrought a work of the greatest magnitude, with the least toil and effort, and had brought to a close in a single hour a war which, in length, and the incredible variety of its incidents and fortunes, surpassed all its predecessors. Its struggles and issues had assumed ten thousand changing shapes, and it had cost Helos more generals than all her previous wars together, and yet it was brought to a close by the prudence and ability of one man. Therefore some actually thought the result 
due to divine intervention. There were some who declared that the Dioscuri appeared as twin stars on either side of Lysander's ship, just as he was sailing out of the harbour against the enemy, and shone out over the rudder sweeps. And some say, also, that the falling of the stone was a portent of this disaster, for, according to the common belief, a stone of vast size had fallen from heaven at Agaspontomy, and it is shown to this day by the dwellers in the Chersonese, who hold it in reverence. Anaxagoras is said to have predicted that if the heavenly body should be loosened by some slip or shake, one of them might be torn away, and might plunge and fall down to earth, and he said that none of the stars was in its original position, for being of stone and heavy, their shining light is caused by friction with the revolving ether, and they are forced along in fixed orbits by the whirling impulse which gave them their circular motion and this was what prevented them from falling to our earth in the first place, when cold and heavy bodies were separated from universal matter. But there is a more plausible opinion than this, and its advocates hold that shooting stars are not a flow or emanation of ethereal fire, which the lower air quenches at the very moment of its kindling, nor are they an ignition and blazing up of a quantity of lower air which has made its escape into the upper regions, but they are plunging and falling heavenly bodies, carried out of their course by some relaxation in the tension of their circular motion, and falling not upon the inhabited region of the earth, but for the most part outside of it, and into the great sea, and this is the reason why they are not noticed. But Diamachus, in his treatise on religion, supports the view of Anaxagoras. He says that before the stone fell, for seventy-five days continually, there was seen in the heavens a fiery body of vast size, as if it had been a flaming cloud, not resting in one place, but moving along with intricate and irregular motions, so that fiery fragments, broken from it by its plunging and erratic course, were carried in all directions and flashed fire, just as shooting stars do. But when it had fallen in that part of the earth, and the inhabitants, after recovering from their fear and amazement, were assembled about it, no action of fire was seen, nor even so much as a trace thereof, but a stone lying there, of large size, it is true, but one which bore almost no proportion at all to the fiery mass seen in the heavens. Well, then, that Diamachus must needs have indulgent readers is clear. But if his story is true, he refutes utterly those who affirm that a rock which winds and tempests had torn from some mountain top was caught up and borne along like a spinning top, and that at the point where the whirling impetus given to it first relaxed and ceased, there it plunged and fell. Unless, indeed, what was seen in the heavens for many days was really fire the quenching and extinction of which produced a change in the air resulting in unusually violent winds and agitations, and these brought about the plunge of the stone. However, the minute discussion of this subject belongs to another kind of writing. End of Lysander, Part 1 of Volume 4 of Plutarch's Parallel Lives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Burlinson. Volume 4 of Plutarch's Parallel Lives of the Noble Greeks and Romans Translated by Bernadotte Perrin Lysander, Part 2 Lysander, after the three thousand Athenians whom he had taken prisoners, had been condemned to death by the special council of allies, calling Philocles their general, asked him what punishment he thought should be visited upon him for having given his fellow-citizens such counsel concerning Greeks. But he, not one whit softened by his misfortunes, bade him not play the prosecutor in a case where there was no judge, but to inflict, as victor, the punishment he would have suffered if vanquished. Then, after bathing and putting on a rich robe, he went first to the slaughter, and showed his countrymen the way, as Theophrastus writes. After this, Lysander sailed to the various cities, and ordered all the Athenians whom he met to go back to Athens, for he would spare none, he said, but would slaughter any whom he caught outside the city. He took this course, and drove them all into the city together, because he wished that scarcity of food and a mighty famine should speedily afflict the city, in order that they might not hinder him by holding out against his siege with plenty of provisions. He also suppressed the democratic and the other forms of government, and left one Lacedaemonian harmost in each city, and ten rulers chosen from the political clubs which he had organized throughout the cities. This he did alike in the cities which had been hostile, and in those which had become his allies, and sailed along in leisurely fashion, in a manner establishing for himself the supremacy over Hellas. For in his appointments of the rulers he had regard neither to birth nor wealth, but put control of affairs into the hands of his comrades and partisans, and made them masters of rewards and punishments. He also took part himself in many massacres, and assisted in driving out the enemies of his friends. Thus he gave the Greeks no worthy specimen of Lacedaemonian rule. Nay, even the comic poet Theopompus was thought absurd in likening the Lacedaemonians to tavern women, because they gave the Greeks a very pleasant sip of freedom, and then dashed the wine with vinegar, for from the very first the taste was harsh and bitter, since Lysander not only would not suffer the people to be masters of their affairs, but actually put the cities into the hands of the boldest and most contentious of the oligarchs. After he had spent some little time in this business, and had sent messengers to Lacedaemon to report that he was sailing up with two hundred ships, he made a junction in Attica with the forces of Aegis and Posanius, the kings, believing that he would speedily capture the city. But since the Athenians held out against them, he took his ships and crossed again to Asia. Here he suppressed the governments of all the remaining cities in like manner, and set up decadarches, many citizens being slain in each city, and many banished. He also drove out all the Samians, and handed their cities over to the men whom they had banished. Moreover, when he had taken Sestos out of the hands of the Athenians, he would not permit the Sestians to dwell there, but gave the city and its territory to be divided, among men who had been pilots and boatswains under him. And this was the first step of his which was resisted by the Lacedaemonians, who restored the Cestians again to their country. But there were other measures of Lysander upon which all the Greeks looked with pleasure, when, for instance, 
the Aginetans, after a long time, received back their own city, and when the Meleans and Cyaneans were restored to their homes by him, after the Athenians had been driven out and had delivered back the cities. And now when he learned that the people of Athens were in a wretched plight from famine, he sailed into the Piraeus, and reduced the city, which was compelled to make terms on the basis of his commands. It is true, one hears it said by Lacedaemonians, that Lysander wrote to the ephors thus, Athens is taken, and that the ephors wrote back to Lysander, Taken were enough. But this story was invented for its neatness's sake. The actual decree of the ephors ran thus, this is what the Lacedaemonian authorities have decided. Tear down the Piraeus with the long walls. Quit all the cities and keep to your own land. If you do these things and restore your exiles, you shall have peace, if you want it. As regards the number of your ships, whatsoever shall be decided there, this do. This edict was accepted by the Athenians on the advice of Theramenes, the son of Hagnon, who, they say, being asked at this time by Cleomenes, one of the young orators, if he dared to act and speak the contrary to Themistocles, was surrendering those walls to the Lacedaemonians, which that statesman had erected in defiance of the Lacedaemonians, replied, but I am doing nothing, young man, that is contrary to Themistocles, for the same walls which he erected for the safety of the citizens, we shall tear down for their safety. And if walls made cities prosperous, then Sparta must be in the worst plight of all, since she has none. Lysander, accordingly, when he had taken possession of all the ships of the Athenians except twelve, and of their walls, on the sixteenth day of the month Munichion, the same on which they conquered the barbarian in the sea fight at Salamis, took measures at once to change their form of government. And when the Athenians opposed him bitterly in this, he sent word to the people that he had caught the city violating the terms of its surrender, for its walls were still standing although the days were past within which they should have been pulled down. He should therefore present their case anew for the decision of the authorities, since they had broken their agreements. And some say that in very truth a proposition to sell the Athenians into slavery was actually made in the assembly of the allies, and that at this time Arianthus the Theban also made a motion that the city be razed to the ground, and the country about it left for sheep to graze. Afterwards, however, when the leaders were gathered at a banquet, and a certain Phocian sang the first chorus in the Electra of Euripides, which begins with, O thou daughter of Agamemnon, I am come, Electra, to thy rustic court, all were moved to compassion, and felt it to be a cruel deed to abolish and destroy a city which was so famous and produced such poets. So then, after the Athenians had yielded in all points, Lysander sent for many flute-girls from the city, and assembled all those who were already in the camp, and then tore down the walls and burned up the triremes, to the sound of the flute, while the allies crowned themselves with garlands and made merry together, counting that day as the beginning of their freedom. Then, without delay, he also made changes in the form of government, establishing thirty rulers in the city and ten in Piraeus. Further, he put a garrison into the Acropolis, and made Calibius, a Spartan, its harmost. He it was who once lifted his staff to smite Autolycus, the athlete, whom Xenophon makes the chief character in his symposium. And when Autolycus seized him by the legs and threw him down, 
Lysander did not side with Calibius in his vexation, but actually joined in censuring him, saying that he did not understand how to govern free men. But the thirty, to gratify Calibius, soon afterwards put Autolycus to death. Lysander, after settling these matters, sailed for Thrace himself, but what remained of the public monies, together with all the gifts and crowns which he had himself received, many people, as was natural, offering presents to a man who had the greatest power, and who was, in a manner, master of Hellas, he sent off to Lacedaemon by Gylippus, who had held command in Sicily. But Gylippus, as it is said, ripped open the sacks at the bottom, and after taking a large amount of silver from each, sewed them up again, not knowing that there was a writing in each indicating the sum it held. And when he came to Sparta, he hid what he had stolen under the tiles of his house, but delivered the sacks to the ephors, and showed the seals upon them. When, however, the ephors opened the sacks and counted the money, its amount did not agree with the written lists, and the thing perplexed them, until a servant of Gylippus made the truth known to them, by his riddle of many owls sleeping under the tiling. For most of the coinage of the time, as it seems, bore the effigy of an owl, owing to the supremacy of Athens. Gylippus, then, after adding a deed so disgraceful and ignoble as this to his previous great and brilliant achievements, removed himself from Lacedaemon, and the wisest of the Spartans being led by this instance in particular to fear the power of money, which they said was corrupting influential as well as ordinary citizens, reproached Lysander and fervently besought the ephors to purify the city of all the silver and the gold as imported curses. The ephors deliberated on the matter, and it was Siraphidus, according to Theopompus, or Phlogidus, according to Ephorus, who declared that they ought not to receive gold and silver coinage into the city, but to use that of the country. Now this was of iron, and was dipped in vinegar as soon as it came from the fire, that it might not be worked over, but be made brittle and intractable by the dipping. Besides, it was very heavy and troublesome to carry, and a great quantity and weight of it had but little value. Probably, too, all the ancient money was of this sort some peoples using iron spits for coins, and some bronze. Whence it comes that even to this day many small pieces of money retain the name of obolai, or spits, and six obolai make a drachma, or handful, since that was as many as the hand could grasp. But since Lysander's friends opposed this measure, and insisted that the money remain in the city, it was resolved that money of this sort could be introduced for public use, but that if any private person should be found in possession of it, he should be punished with death, just as though Lycurgus had feared the coin, and not the covetousness which the coin produced and this vice was not removed by allowing no private person to possess the money, so much as it was encouraged by allowing the city to possess money, its use thereby acquiring dignity and honor. Surely it was not possible for those who saw money publicly honored to despise it privately as of no service or to consider as worthless for the individual's private use that which was publicly held in such repute and esteem. Moreover, it takes far less time for public practices to affect the customs of private life than it does for individual lapses and failings to corrupt entire cities. For it is natural that the parts should rather be perverted along with the whole, when that deteriorates, 
but the diseases which flow from a part into the whole find many correctives and aids in the parts which remain sound and so these magistrates merely set the fear of the law to guard the houses of the citizens that money might have no entrance there but did not keep their spirits undaunted by the power of money and insensible to it they rather inspired them all with an emulous desire for wealth as a great and noble object of pursuit on this point however we have censured the lacedaemonians in another treatise out of the spoils lysander set up at delphi bronze statues of himself and each of his admirals as well as golden stars of the dioscuri which disappeared before the battle of leuctra and in the treasury of brasidas and the acanthians there was stored a trireme two cubits long made of gold and ivory which cyrus sent lysander as a prize for his victory moreover anaxadrides the delphian writes that a deposit of lysander's was also stored there consisting of a talent of silver and fifty-two minas and eleven staters besides a statement that is inconsistent with the generally accepted accounts of his poverty at any rate lysander was at this time more powerful than any greek before him had been and was thought to cherish a pretentious pride that was greater even than his power for he was the first greek as durus writes to whom the cities erected altars and made sacrifices as to a god the first also to whom songs of triumph were sung one of these is handed down and begins as follows the general of sacred hellas who came from wide-spaced sparta will we sing o oh, io paying the samians too voted that their festival of hera should be called lysandrea and the poet charles was kept in his retinue to adorn his achievements with verse while with antilochus who composed some verses in his honour he was so pleased that he filled his cup with silver and gave it to him and when antimachus of colophon and a certain niceratus of heraclea competed with one another at the lysandrea in poems celebrating his achievements he awarded the crown to niceratus and antimachus in vexation suppressed his poem but plato who was then a young man and admired antimachus for his poetry tried to cheer and console him in his chagrin at this defeat telling him that it is the ignorant who suffer from their ignorance just as the blind do from their blindness however when aristonous the harper who had been six times victor at the pythian games told lysander in a patronizing way that if he should be victorious again he would have himself proclaimed under lysander's name that is lysander replied as my slave now to the leading men and to his equals the ambition of lysander was annoying merely but since owing to the court that was paid to him great haughtiness and severity crept into his character along with his ambition there was no such moderation as would become a popular leader either in his rewards or punishments but the prizes he awarded to his friends and allies were irresponsible lordships over cities and absolute sovereignties while the sole punishment that could satisfy his wrath was the death of his enemy not even exile was allowed nay at a later time fearing lest the active popular leaders of miletus should go into exile and desiring to bring from their retreats those also who were in hiding he made oath that he would do them no harm but when the first put faith in him and the second came forth he delivered them all over to the oligarchs for slaughter 
being no less than eight hundred of both classes in the other cities also untold numbers of the popular party were slain since he killed not only for his own private reasons but also gratified by his murders the hatred and cupidity of his many friends everywhere and shared the bloody work with them wherefore at cockley's the lacedaemonian won great approval when he said that helas could not have borne two lysanders now this same utterance was made by archistratus concerning alcibiades also as theophrastus tells us but in his case it was insolence and wanton self-will that gave most offence whereas lysander's power was made dreadful and oppressive by the cruelty of his disposition the lacedaemonians paid little heed to the rest of his accusers but when phronabasus who was outraged by lysander's pillaging and wasting his territory sent men to sparta to denounce him the ephors were incensed and when they found thorax one of lysander's friends and fellow-generals with money in his private possession they put him to death and sent a dispatch scroll to lysander ordering him home the dispatch scroll is of the following character when the ephors send out an admiral or a general they make two round pieces of wood exactly alike in length and thickness so that each corresponds to the other in its dimensions and keep one themselves while they give the other to their envoy these pieces of wood they call skytale whenever then they wish to send some secret and important message they make a scroll of parchment long and narrow like a leathern strap and wind it round their skytale leaving no vacant space thereon but covering its surface all round with the parchment after doing this they write what they wish on the parchment just as it lies wrapped about the skytail and when they have written their message they take the parchment off and send it without the piece of wood to the commander he when he has received it cannot otherwise get any meaning out of it since the letters have no connection but are disarranged unless he takes his own skytail and winds the strip of parchment about it so that when its spiral course is restored perfectly and that which follows is joined to that which precedes he reads round the staff and so discovers the continuity of the message and the parchment like the staff is called skytail as the thing measured bears the name of the measure but lysander when the dispatch scroll reached him at the hellespont was much disturbed and since he feared the denunciations of pharnabasis above all others he hastened to hold a conference with him hoping to compose their quarrel at this conference he begged pharnabasis to write another letter about him to the magistrates stating that he had not been wronged at all and had no complaints to make but in this playing the cretan against a cretan as the saying is he misjudged his opponent for pharnabasis after promising to do all that he desired openly wrote such a letter as lysander demanded but secretly kept another by him ready written and when it came to putting on the seals he exchanged the documents which looked exactly alike and gave him the letter which had been secretly written accordingly when lysander arrived at sparta and went as the custom is into the senate house he gave the ephors the letter of pharnabasis convinced that the greatest of the complaints against him was thus removed for pharnabasis was in high favor with the lacedaemonians because he had been of all the king's generals most ready to help them in the war but when the ephors after reading the letter showed it to him and he understood that odysseus then is not the only 
man of guile for the time being he was mightily confounded and went away but a few days afterwards on meeting the magistrates he said that he was obliged to go up to the temple of amon and sacrifice to the god the sacrifices which he had vowed before his battles now some say that when he was besieging the city of aphite in thrace amon really stood by him in his sleep wherefore he raised the siege declaring that the god had commanded it and ordering the aphiteans to sacrifice to amon and was eager to make a journey into libya and propitiate the god but the majority believed that he made the god a pretext and really feared the ephors and was impatient of the yoke at home and unable to endure being under authority and therefore longed to wander and travel about somewhat like a horse which comes back from unrestricted pasturage in the meadows to his stall and is put once more to his accustomed work ephorus it is true assigns another reason for this absence abroad which i shall mention by and by after he had with great difficulty procured his release by the ephors he set sail but the kings when he had gone abroad became aware that by means of the societies which he had formed he had the cities entirely in his power and was master of halos they therefore took measures for deposing his friends everywhere and restoring the management of affairs to the people however fresh disturbances broke out in connection with these changes and first of all the athenians from file attacked the thirty and overpowered them lysander therefore came home in haste and persuaded the lacedaemonians to aid the oligarchies and chastise the democracies accordingly they sent to the thirty first of all a hundred talents for the war and lysander himself as general but the kings were jealous of him and feared to let him capture athens a second time they therefore determined that one of them should go out with the army and pausanias did go out ostensibly in behalf of the tyrants against the people but really to put a stop to the war in order that lysander might not again become master of athens through the efforts of his friends this object then he easily accomplished and by reconciling the athenians and putting a stop to their discord he robbed lysander of his ambitious hopes a short time afterwards however when the athenians revolted again he himself was censured for taking the curb of the oligarchy out of the mouth of the people and letting them grow bold and insolent again while lysander who won fresh repute as a man who exercised his command in downright fashion not for the gratification of others nor yet to win applause but for the good of sparta end of lysander part two Eleven of Volume Four of Plutarch's Parallel Lives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Burlinson. Volume Four of Plutarch's Parallel Lives of the Noble Greeks and Romans. Translated by Bernadotte Perrin. Lysander, Part Three. He was harsh of speech also, and terrifying to his opponents. For instance, when the Argives were disputing about boundaries, and thought they made a juster plea than the Lacedaemonians, he pointed to his sword and said to them, He who is master of this, discourses best about boundaries and when a megarian 
in some conference with him, grew bold in speech, he said, Thy words, a stranger, lack a city. And when the Boeotians tried to play a double game with him, he asked them whether he should march through their territory with spears upright or leveled. And once, when the Corinthians had revolted, and on coming to their walls, he saw that the Lacedaemonians hesitated to make an assault, a hare was seen leaping across the moat. Whereupon he said, Are ye not ashamed to fear enemies who are so lazy that hares sleep on their walls? When Aegis the king died, leaving a brother, Agesalius, and a reputed son, Leotychides, Lysander, who had been a lover of Agesalius, persuaded him to lay claim to the kingdom, on the ground that he was a genuine descendant of Heracles. For Leotychides was accused of being a son of Alcibiades, who had secret commerce with Timaea, the wife of Aegis, while he was living in exile at Sparta. Now Aegis, as they tell us, being convinced by a computation of time that his wife had not conceived by him, ignored Leotychides and manifestly repudiated him up to the last. But when he was carried sick to Herea and was about to die, he yielded to the entreaties of the young man himself and of his friends, and declared in the hearing of many that Leotychides was his own son, and after begging those who were present to bear witness of this to the Lacedaemonians, died. Accordingly they did so bear witness in favor of Leotychides. Moreover, Agesalius, who was otherwise illustrious, and had Lysander as a champion, was injured in his claim by Diopathes, a man in high repute for his interpretation of oracles, who published the following prophecy with reference to the lameness of Agesalius. Bethink thee now, O Sparta, although thou art very proud, lest from thee, sound of foot, there spring a maimed royalty. For long will unexpected toils oppress thee, and onward rolling billows of man-destroying war. Many, therefore, out of deference to the oracle, inclined to Laetychides, but Lysander declared that Diopathes did not interpret the prophecy correctly, for it did not mean that the god would be displeased if one who was lame should rule the Lacedaemonians, but the kingdom should be maimed if bastards and ill-born men should be kings in a line with the posterity of Heracles. By such arguments, and because he had a very great influence, he prevailed, and Agesalius became king. At once, then, Lysander tried to rouse and incite him to make an expedition into Asia, suggesting hopes that he would put down the Persians and become a very great man. He also wrote letters to his friends in Asia, bidding them ask Agesalius of the Lacedaemonians as general for their war against the barbarians. They obeyed, and sent ambassadors to Lacedaemon with the request, and thus an honor not inferior to that of being made king was obtained for Agesalius through the efforts of Lysander. But with ambitious natures which are otherwise not ill-qualified for command, jealousy of their equals in reputation is no slight obstacle to the performance of noble deeds. For they make those their rivals in the path of virtue, whom they might have as helpers. Agesalius did indeed take Lysander with him among his thirty counsellors, intending to treat him with special favour as his chief friend. But when they were come into Asia, the people there, who were not acquainted with him, 
conferred with him but rarely and briefly, whereas Lysander, in consequence of their large intercourse with him in former times, had them always at his door and in his train, those who were his friends coming out of deference, and those whom he suspected out of fear. And just as in tragedies it naturally happens that an actor who takes the part of some messenger or servant is in high repute and plays leading roles, while the one who bears the crown and scepter is not even listened to when he speaks, so in this case the whole honour of the government was associated with the counsellor, and there was left for the king only the empty name of power. It is true, perhaps, that there should have been some gentle handling of this excessive ambition, and that Lysander should have been reduced to the second place, but entirely to cast off and insult for fame's sake a benefactor and a friend was not worthy of the character of Agesalius. In the first place, then, he did not give him opportunities for achievement, nor even assign him to a command, and secondly, those in whose behalf he perceived that Lysander was earnestly exerting himself, these he always sent away with less reward than an ordinary suitor, or wholly unsuccessful, thus quietly undoing and chilling his influence. So when Lysander missed all his aims, and saw that his interested efforts for his friends were an obstacle to their success, he not only ceased to give them his own aid, but begged them not to wait upon him nor pay him their court, but to confer with the king, and with such as had more power to benefit those who showed them honour than was his at present. Most of those who heard this refrained from troubling him about their affairs, but did not cease paying him their court, nay, rather, by waiting upon him in the public walks and places of exercise, they gave Agesalius even more annoyance than ever, because he envied them the honour. Therefore, though he offered most of the Spartans commands in the field and governments of cities, he appointed Lysander his carver of meats, and presently, as if by way of insult to the Ionians, he said, Let them be off, and pay their court now to my carver of meats. Accordingly, Lysander determined to have a conference with him, at which a brief and laconic dialogue passed between them. Verily, Thou knowest well, Agesalius, how to abase friends. To which Agesalius, Yes, if they would be greater than I, but those who increase my power should also share in it. Well, perhaps thy words, Agesalius, are fairer than thy deeds, but I beg thee, even because of the strangers who have their eyes upon us, to give me a post under thy command where thou believest that I shall be least annoying to thyself, and more serviceable than now. Upon this he was sent as ambassador to the Hellespont, and though he was angry with Agesalius, he did not neglect to do his duty, but induced Spithridates the Persian, a high-minded man with forces at his command, to revolt from Pharnabazus with whom he was at odds, and brought him to Agesalius. The king made no farther use of Lysander, however, in the war, and when his time had expired, he sailed back to Sparta without honour, not only enraged at Agesalius, but hating the whole form of government more than ever, and resolved to put into execution at once, and without delay, the plans for a revolutionary change which he is thought to have devised and concocted some time before. They were as follows. Of the Heracleidae who united with the Darians and came down into Peloponnesus, 
there was a numerous and glorious stock flourishing in sparta however not every family belonging to it participated in the royal succession but the kings were chosen from two houses only and were called Eurypontidae and Agiade. The rest had no special privileges in the government because of their high birth, but the honors which result from superior excellence lay open to all who had power and ability. Now Lysander belonged to one of these families, and when he had risen to great fame for his deeds, and had acquired many friends and great power, he was vexed to see the city raised in power by his efforts, but ruled by others, who were of no better birth than himself. He therefore planned to take the government away from the two houses, and restore it to all the Heracleidae in common, or, as some say, not to the Heracleidae, but to the Spartans in general, in order that its high prerogatives might not belong to those only who were descended from Heracles, but to those who, like Heracles, were selected for superior excellence, since it was this which raised him to divine honors. And he hoped that when the kingdom was awarded on this principle, no Spartan would be chosen before himself. In the first place, then, he undertook and made preparations to persuade the citizens by his own efforts, and committed to memory a speech written by Cleon, the Halicarnassian, for the purpose. In the second place, seeing that the novelty and magnitude of his innovation demanded a more audacious support, he brought stage machinery to bear upon the citizens, as it were, by collecting and arranging responses and oracles of Apollo, convinced that Cleon's clever rhetoric would not help him at all unless he should first terrify and subdue his countrymen by vague religious fear and superstitious terror, and then bring them under the influence of his argument. Well, then, Ephorus tells us that after an attempt to corrupt the Pythian priestess, and after a second failure to persuade the priestesses of Dodona by means of Pericles, he went up to the temple of Amon and had a conference with the gods' interpreters there, at which he offered them much money, but that they took this ill, and sent certain messengers to Sparta to denounce him. And further, that when Lysander was acquitted of their charges, the Libyans said as they went away, But we will pass better judgments than yours, O Spartans, when ye come to dwell with us in Libya. For they knew that there was a certain ancient oracle bidding the Lacedaemonians to settle in Libya. But since the whole plot and concoction was no insignificant one, nor yet carelessly undertaken, but made many important assumptions, like a mathematical demonstration, and proceeded to its conclusion through premises which were difficult and hard to obtain, we shall follow in our description of it the account of one who was both a historian and a philosopher. There was a woman in Pontus who declared that she was with child by Apollo. Many disbelieved her, as was natural, but many also lent an ear to her, so that when she gave birth to a male child, many notable persons took an interest in its care and rearing. For some reason or other, the name given to the boy was Silenus. Lysander took these circumstances for his foundation, and supplied the rest of his cunning fabric himself making use of not a few, nor yet insignificant, champions of the tale, who brought the story of the boy's birth into credit without exciting suspicion. They also brought back another response from Delphi, and caused it to be circulated in Sparta, 
which declared that sundry very ancient oracles were kept in secret writings by the priests there and that it was not possible to get these nor even lawful to read them unless some one born of apollo should come after a long lapse of time give the keepers an intelligible token of his birth and obtain the tablets containing the oracles the way being thus prepared silenus was to come and demand the oracles as apollo's son and the priests who were in the secret were to insist on precise answers to all their questions about his birth and finally persuaded forsooth that he was the son of apollo were to show him the writing then silenus in the presence of many witnesses was to read aloud the prophecies especially the one relating to the kingdom for the sake of which the whole scheme had been invented and which declared that it was more for the honour and interest of the spartans to choose their kings from the best citizens but when at last silenus was grown to be a youth and was ready for the business lysander's play was ruined for him by the cowardice of one of his actors or co-workers who just as he came to the point lost his courage and drew back however all this was actually found out not while lysander was alive but after his death and he died before agesilaus returned from asia after he had plunged or rather had plunged hellas into the boeotian war for it is stated in both ways and some hold him responsible for the war others the thebans and others both together it is charged against the thebans that they cast away the sacrifices at aulus and that because androcleides and amphitheus had been bribed with the king's money to stir up a war in greece against the lacedaemonians they set upon the phocians and ravaged their country it is said on the other hand that lysander was angry with the thebans because they alone laid claim to a tenth part of the spoils of the war while the rest of the allies held their peace and because they were indignant about the money when he sent to sparta but above all because they first put the athenians in the way of freeing themselves from the thirty tyrants whom he had set up whose terrorizing power the lacedaemonians had increased by decreeing that fugitives from athens might be brought back from every place of refuge and that all who impeded their return should be declared enemies of sparta in reply to this the thebans issued counter decrees akin in spirit to the beneficent deeds of heracles and dionysus to the effect that every house and city in boeotia should be open to such athenians as needed succour and that whosoever did not help a fugitive under arrest should be fined a talent and that if any one should carry arms through boeotia against the tyrants in athens no theban would either see him or hear about it and they did not merely vote such hellenic and humane decrees without at the same time making their deeds correspond to their edicts but thrasybulus and those who with him occupied phile set out from thebes to do so and the thebans not only provided them with arms and money but also with secrecy and a base of operations such then were the grounds of complaint which lysander had against the thebans and since he was now of an altogether harsh disposition owing to the melancholy which persisted into his old age he stirred up the ephors and persuaded them to fit out an expedition against the thebans and assuming the command he set out on the campaign afterwards the ephors sent out pausanias the king also with an army 
now it was the plan that pausanias should make a circuit by way of mount Cithaeron, and then invade boeotia while lysander marched through phocius to meet him with a large force he took the city of orchomenus which came over to him of its own accord and assaulted and plundered lebedea then he sent a letter to pausanias bidding him move from Plataea and join forces with him at Haliartus, and promising that he himself would be before the walls of Haliartus at break of day. This letter was brought to Thebes by some scouts, into whose hands its bearer fell. The Thebans, therefore, entrusted their city to a force of Athenians which had come to their aid and while they themselves set out early in the night, and succeeded in reaching Haliartus a little before Lysander, and a considerable part of them entered the city. Lysander at first decided to post his army on a hill, and wait for Pausanias. Then, as the day advanced, being unable to remain inactive, he took his arms, encouraged his allies, and led them along the road in column towards the wall of the city. But those of the Thebans who had remained outside, taking the city on their left, advanced upon the rear of their enemy, at the spring called Sisusa. Here, as the story goes, his nurses bathed the infant Dionysus after his birth, for the water has the colour and sparkle of wine, is clear and very pleasant to the taste. And not far away the Cretan storax shrub grows in profusion, which the Haliartians regard as a proof that Radamanthus once dwelt there, and they show his tomb, which they call Alea. And nearby is also the memorial of Alcmene, for she was buried there, as they say, having lived with Radamanthus after the death of Amphitryon. But the Thebans inside the city, drawn up in battle array with the Haliartians, kept quiet for some time. When, however, they saw Lysander with his foremost troops approaching the wall, they suddenly threw open the gate and fell upon them and killed Lysander himself with his soothsayer, and a few of the rest. For the greater part of them fled swiftly back to the main body. And when the Thebans made no halt, but pressed hard upon them, the whole force turned to the hills in flight, and a thousand of them were slain. Three hundred of the Thebans also lost their lives, by pursuing their enemies into rough and dangerous places. These had been accused of favouring the Spartan cause, and in their eagerness to clear themselves of this charge in the eyes of their fellow citizens, they exposed themselves needlessly in the pursuit, and so threw away their lives. Tidings of the disaster were brought to Pausanias while he was on the march from Plataea to Thespiae, and putting his army in battle array, he came to Haliartus. Thrasybulus also came from Thebes, leading his Athenians. But when Pausanias was minded to ask for the bodies of the dead under a truce, the elders of the Spartans could not brook it, and were angry among themselves, and coming to the king, they protested that the body of Lysander must not be taken up under cover of a truce, but by force of arms, in open battle for it, and that if they conquered, then they would give him burial, but if they were vanquished, it would be a glorious thing to lie dead with their general. Such were the words of the elders. But Pausanias saw that it would be a difficult matter to conquer the Thebans, flushed as they were with victory, and that the body of Lysander lay near the walls, so that its recovery would be difficult without a truce, even if they were victorious. 
he therefore sent a herald and after making a truce led his forces back and as soon as they had come beyond the boundary of boeotia with lysander's body they buried it in the friendly soil of their allies the panopeans where his monument now stands by the road leading from delphi to Chaeronia. here the army bivouacked and it is said that a certain phocian recounting the action to another who was not in it said that the enemy fell upon them just after lysander had crossed the hoplites then a spartan who was a friend of lysander asked in amazement what he meant by hoplites for he did not know the name indeed it was there said the phocian that the enemy slew the foremost of us for the stream that flows past the city is called hoplites on hearing this the spartan burst into tears and said that man could not escape his destiny for lysander as it appears had received an oracle running thus be on thy guard i bid thee against a sounding hoplites and an earth-born dragon craftily coming behind thee some however say that the hoplites does not flow before haliartus but is a winter torrent near coronea which joins the philorus and then flows past that city in former times it was called hoplius but now isomantus moreover the man of haliartus who killed lysander neocorus by name had a dragon as emblem on his sword and to this it was supposed the oracle referred and it is said that the thebans also during the peloponnesian war received an oracle at the sanctuary of ismenus which indicated beforehand not only the battle at delium but also this battle at haliartus thirty years later it ran as follows when thou huntest the wolf with the spear watch closely the border or Calides too the hill which foxes never abandon now by border the god meant the region about delium where boeotia is coterminous with attica and by orchalides the hill which is now called alopicus or fox hill in the parts of haliartus which stretched towards mount helicon now that lysander had met with such an end at the outset the spartans were so indignant about it that they summoned the king to trial for his life but he evaded it and fled to tegea where he spent the rest of his days as a suppliant in the sanctuary of athena for the poverty of Lysander, which was discovered at his death, made his excellence more apparent to all, since from the vast wealth and power in his hands, and from the great homage paid him by cities and the great king, he had not, even in the slightest degree, sought to amass money for the aggrandizement of his family. This is the testimony of Theopompus. Who is more to be trusted when he praises than when he blames for he takes more pleasure in blaming than in praising but after some time had passed according to ephorus some dispute arose at sparta with her allies and it became necessary to inspect the writings which lysander had kept by him for which purpose agesilius went to his house and when he found the book containing the speech on the constitution which argued that the kingship ought to be taken from the europontidae and agiadae and made accessible to all spartans alike and that the choice should be made from the best of these he was eager to produce the speech before his countrymen and show them what the real character of lysander's citizenship had been but Lacratitas, a prudent man, and at that time the principal ephor, 
held Agesalius back, saying that they ought not to dig Lysander up again, but rather to bury the speech along with him, since it was composed with such a subtle persuasiveness. However, they paid him many honors at his death. In particular, they imposed a fine upon the men who had engaged to marry his daughters, and then, after Lysander's death, when he was discovered to be poor, had renounced the engagement. The reason given for the fine was that the men had paid court to Lysander while they thought him rich, but when his poverty showed them that he was a just and good man, they forsook him, for there was, as it appears, a penalty at Sparta not only for not marrying at all, and for a late marriage, but also for a bad marriage, and to this last they subjected those especially who sought alliance with the rich, instead of with the good and with their own associates. Such then are the accounts we have found given of Lysander. End of Lysander Part 3of Volume 4 of Plutarch's Parallel Lives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Berlinson. Volume 4 of Plutarch's Parallel Lives of the Noble Greeks and Romans. Translated by Bernadotte Perrin. Sulla, Part One. Lucius Cornelius Sulla belonged to a patrician or noble family, and one of his ancestors, Rufinus, is said to have been consul, although he was not so conspicuous for this honor as for the dishonor which he incurred. For he was found to be possessed of more than ten pounds of silver plate, contrary to the law and was for this reason expelled from the Senate. His posterity became at once obscure, and continued so, nor did Sulla himself enjoy a wealthy parentage. When he was a youth he lived in lodgings at a low price, and this was afterwards cast in his teeth when men thought him unduly prosperous. For instance, we are told that when he was putting on boastful airs after his campaign in Libya, a certain nobleman said to him, How canst thou be an honest man, when thy father left thee nothing, and yet thou art so rich? For although the Romans of that time no longer retained their ancient purity and uprightness of life, but had degenerated, and yielded to the appetite for luxury and extravagance, they nevertheless held in equal opprobrium those who lost an inherited wealth, and those who forsook an ancestral poverty. And afterwards, when he had at last become absolute in power, and was putting many to death, a freedman, who was thought to be concealing one of the proscribed, and was therefore to be thrown down the Tarpeian rock, cast it in his teeth that they had long lived together in one lodging-house, himself renting the upper rooms at two thousand sesterces, and Sulla the lower rooms at three thousand. The difference in their fortunes, therefore, was only a thousand sesterces, which are equivalent to two hundred and fifty Attic drachmas. Such, then, is the account we find of Sulla's earlier fortune. His personal appearance, in general, is given by his statues. But the gleam of his grey eyes, which was terribly sharp and powerful, was rendered even more fearful by the complexion of his face, this was covered with coarse blotches of red, interspersed with white. For this reason, they say, 
His surname was given him because of his complexion, and it was in allusion to this that a scurrilous gesture at Athens made the verse, Sulla is a mulberry sprinkled o'er with meal. Nor is it out of place to mention such testimonies in the case of a man said to have been by nature so fond of raillery, that when he was still young and obscure, he spent much time with actors and buffoons, and shared their dissolute life. And when he had made himself supreme master, he would daily assemble the most reckless stage and theatre folk to drink and bandy jests with them, although men thought that he disgraced his years, and although he not only dishonoured his high office, but neglected much that required attention. For when Sulla was once at table, he refused to be serious at all but although at other times he was a man of business and wore an austere look, he underwent a complete change as soon as he betook himself to good fellowship and drinking, so that comic singers and dancers found him anything but ferocious, and ready to listen and yield to every request. It was this laxity, as it seems, which produced in him a diseased propensity to amorous indulgence, and an unrestrained voluptuousness, from which he did not refrain even in his old age, but continued his youthful love for Metrobius, an actor. He also had the following experience. He began by loving a common but wealthy woman, Nicopolis by name, and such was the charm of his intimacy and youthful grace, that in the end he was beloved by her, and was left her heir when she died. He also inherited the property of his stepmother, who loved him as her own son. By these means he became moderately well off. Having been appointed quaestor to Marius in his first consulship, he sailed with him to Libya, to make war upon Jugurtha. He was put in charge of the camp, and won great credit for himself, especially by improving a favourable opportunity, and making a friend of Bacchus, the king of Numidia. For he hospitably entertained ambassadors of the king, who had escaped from Numidian robbers, and sent them on their way with gifts and a safe escort. Now Bacchus had for a long time hated and feared his son-in-law Jugurtha, who had been defeated and had fled to him for safety, and was then plotting against him. He therefore invited Sulla to come to him, wishing to have the seizure and surrender of Jugurtha effected through Sulla, rather than through himself. Sulla imparted the matter to Marius, and taking with him a few soldiers, underwent the greatest peril. He put faith in a barbarian, and one who was faithless towards his own relations, and to secure his surrender of another, placed himself in his hands. However, Bacchus, now that he had both in his power, and had laid himself under the necessity of proving false to one or the other, although he vacillated long, finally decided upon his original betrayal, and handed Jugurtha over to Sulla. It is true that the one who celebrated a triumph for this was Marius, but those who envied him attributed the glory of the success to Sulla, and this secretly annoyed Marius. And, indeed, Sulla himself was naturally vainglorious, and now that he had for the first time emerged from his lowly and obscure condition, and become of some account among his countrymen, and was enjoying a taste of honour, he was arrogant enough to have a representation of his exploit engraved on a seal-ring which he wore, and continued to use it ever after. 
The device was Bacchus delivering and Sulla receiving Jugurtha. Of course this distressed Marius, but since he considered Sulla to be beneath his envy, he used him in his campaigns, during his second consulship as legate or lieutenant, and during his third as military tribune, and through his agency performed many successful services. For instance, as legate, Sulla captured Coppolus, chieftain of the Tectosages, and as tribune, he persuaded the great and populous nation of the Marsi to become friends and allies of Rome. But perceiving that Marius was vexed with him for these successes, and that he was no longer glad to give him opportunities for action, but opposed his advancement, he attached himself to Catullus, the colleague of Marius in the consulship, a worthy man, but too sluggish for arduous contests. By him he was entrusted with the leading and most important enterprises, and rose to power and fame. He not only subdued in war a large portion of the barbarians of the Alps, but when provisions ran low, he undertook the task of furnishing them, and made them so abundant that the soldiers of Catullus lived in plenty, and had some to spare for those of Marius. At this, as Sulla himself says, Marius was greatly distressed. So slight and puerile were the first foundations and occasions of that hatred between them, which afterwards led them through civil bloodshed and irreparable discords to tyranny and the confusion of the whole state. This proved that Euripides was a wise man, and acquainted with the distempers of civil government, when he exhorted men to beware of ambition as a deity most injurious and fatal to its votaries. Sulla now thought that the reputation which he had won in war was sufficient to justify political activities, and therefore at once exchanged military service for public life offered himself as a candidate for the city praetorship, and was defeated. The responsibility for his defeat, however, he lays upon the populace. They knew, he says, about his friendship with Bacchus, and expected that if he should be made aedile before his praetorship, he would treat them to splendid hunting scenes, and combats of Libyan wild beasts and therefore appointed others to the praetorship, in order to force him into the aedileship. But subsequent events would seem to show that Sulla does not confess the real reason for his failure. For in the following year he obtained the praetorship, partly because he was subservient to the people, and partly because he used money to win their support. And so it happened that, during his praetorship, when he angrily told Caesar that he would use his own authority against him, Caesar laughed and said, You do well to consider the office your own, for you bought it. After his praetorship, he was sent out to Cappadocia, ostensibly to reinstate Ariobazanes, but really to check the restless activities of Mithridates, who was adding to his dominion and power fully as much as he had inherited. Accordingly he took out with him no large force of his own, but made use of the allies, whom he found eager to serve him, and after slaying many of the Cappadocians himself, and yet more of the Armenians who came to their aid, he drove out Gordius, and made Ariobazanes king again. As he lingered on the banks of the Euphrates, he received a visit from Orobasis, a Parthian, who came as an ambassador from King Arsaces, 
although up to this time the two nations had held no intercourse with one another. This also is thought to have been part of Sulla's great good fortune, that he should be the first Roman with whom the Parthians held conference when they wanted alliance and friendship. On this occasion, too, it is said that he ordered three chairs to be set, one for Ariobazanes, one for Orobazus, and one for himself, and that he sat between them both and gave them audience. For this the king of Parthia afterwards put Orobazus to death, and while some people commended Sulla for the airs which he assumed with the barbarians, others accused him of vulgarity and ill-timed arrogance. It is also recorded that a certain man in the retinue of Orobasus, a Chaldean, after looking Sulla intently in the face, and studying carefully the movements of his mind and body, and investigating his nature according to the principles of his peculiar art, declared that this man must of necessity become the greatest in the world, and that even now the wonder was that he consented not to be first of all men. When Sulla came back to Rome, however, Censorinus brought suit against him for bribery, alleging that he had collected large sums of money, illegally, from a friendly and allied kingdom. However, Censorinus did not put in an appearance at the trial, but dropped his impeachment. Moreover, Sulla's quarrel with Marius broke out afresh on being supplied with fresh material by the ambition of Bacchus, who, desiring to please the people at Rome, and at the same time to gratify Sulla, dedicated on the capital some images bearing trophies, and beside them gilded figures representing Jugurtha being surrendered by Bacchus to Sulla. Thereupon Marius was very angry, and tried to have the figures taken down, but others were minded to aid Sulla in opposing this, and the city was all but in flames with their dispute, when the social war, which had long been smouldering, blazed up against the city and put a stop for the time being to the quarrel. In this war which proved of the greatest moment and most varied fortunes, and brought innumerable mischiefs and the gravest perils upon the Romans, Marius was unable to render any great service, and proved that military excellence requires a man's highest strength and vigor. Sulla, on the other hand, did much that was memorable, and achieved the reputation of a great leader among his fellow citizens, that of the greatest of leaders among his friends, and that of the most fortunate even among his enemies. But he did not feel about this as Timotheus the son of Conan did, who, when his adversaries ascribed his successes to fortune, and had him represented in a painting as lying asleep, while fortune cast her net about the cities, was rudely angry with those who had done this, because, as he thought, they were robbing him of the glory due to his exploits, and said to the people once, on returning from a campaign in which he was thought to have been successful, In this campaign, at least, men of Athens, fortune has no share. Upon Timotheus, then, who had shown himself so covetous of honor, the deity is said to have requited his youthful petulance, so that from that time on he did nothing brilliant, but miscarried in all his undertakings, gave offense to the people, and was finally banished the city. Whereas Sulla not only accepted with pleasure such felicitations and admiration, but actually joined in magnifying the aid of heaven in what he did, and gave the credit of it to fortune, either out of boastfulness, or because he had such a belief in the divine agency. 
for in his memoirs he writes that of the undertakings which men thought well advised those upon which he had boldly ventured not after deliberation but on the spur of the moment turned out for the better and further from what he says about his being well endowed by nature for fortune rather than for war he seems to attribute more to fortune than to his own excellence and to make himself entirely the creature of this deity since he accounts even his concord with metellus a man his equal in rank and a relative by marriage a piece of divine felicity for whereas he expected much annoyance from him as a colleague in office he found him much obliging and still further in the dedication of his memoirs to lucullus he advises him to deem nothing so secure as what the divine power enjoins upon him in his dreams and he relates that when he was dispatched with an army to the social war a great chasm in the earth opened near laverna from which a great quantity of fire burst forth and a bright flame towered up towards the heavens whereupon the soothsayers declared that a brave man of rare courage and surpassing appearance was to take the government in hand and free the city from its present troubles and sulla says that he himself was this man for his golden head of hair gave him a singular appearance and as for bravery he was not ashamed to testify in his own behalf after such great and noble deeds as he had performed so much then regarding his attitude towards the divine powers in other respects he seems to have been a very uneven character and at variance with himself he robbed much but gave more bestowed his honors unexpectedly as unexpectedly his insults fawned on those he needed but gave himself airs towards those who needed him so that one cannot tell whether he was more inclined by nature to disdain or flattery for as regards the irregularity of his punishments cudgelling to death as he did on any chance grounds and again gently submitting to the greatest wrongs ready to open to reconciliation after the most irreparable injuries but visiting small and insignificant offences with death and confiscation of goods here one might decide that he was naturally of a stern and revengeful temper but relaxed his severity out of calculating regard for his interests in this very social war for example when his soldiers with clubs and stones did to death a legate a man of praetorian dignity albinus by name he passed over without punishment this flagrant crime and solemnly sent the word about that he would find his men more ready and willing for the war on account of this transgression since they would try to atone for it by their bravery to those who censured the crime he paid no heed but purposing already to put down the power of marius and now that the social war was thought to be at an end to get himself appointed general against mithridates he treated the soldiers under him with deference when he returned to the city he was appointed consul with quintus pompeius in the fiftieth year of his age and made a most illustrious marriage with cecilia the daughter of metellus the pontifex maximus on the theme of this marriage many verses were sung in ridicule of him by the common people and many of the leading men were indignant at it deeming him as livy says unworthy of the woman although they had judged him worthy of the consulship and this was not the only woman whom he married but first when he was still a stripling he took ilia to wife 
and she bore him a daughter, then Aelia after her, and thirdly Cloelia, whom he divorced for barrenness, honourably, and with words of praise, to which he added gifts. But since he married Metella only a few days afterwards, he was thought to have accused Cloelia unfairly. To Metella, however, he always showed great deference in all things, so that the Roman people, when it longed for the restoration of the exiled partisans of Marius, and Sulla refused it, in its need called upon Metella for aid. It was thought also that when he took the city of Athens, he treated its people more harshly because they had scurrilously abused Metella from the walls. But this was later. At the time of which I speak, deeming the consulship a slight matter in comparison with things to come, his thoughts soared to the Mithridatic War. But here he found a rival in Marius, who was possessed by ambition and a mad desire for fame, those never-aging passions. He was now unwieldy in body, and in the recent campaigns had given up service on account of his age, and yet set his heart upon foreign wars beyond the seas. And when Sulla had sent out for his camp on unfinished business, he himself kept at home, and contrived that most fatal sedition which wrought Rome more harm than all her wars together had done as indeed the heavenly powers foreshowed to them. For the fire broke forth of its own accord from the staves which supported the ensigns, and was with difficulty extinguished, and three ravens brought their young forth into the street and devoured them, and then carried the remains back again into their nest, and after mice had gnawed consecrated gold in a temple, the keepers caught one of them, a female, in a trap, and in the very trap she brought forth five young ones, and ate up three of them. But most important of all, out of a cloudless and clear air, there rang out the voice of a trumpet, prolonging a shrill and dismal note, so that all were amazed and terrified at its loudness. The Tuscan wise men declared that the prodigy foretokened a change of conditions, and the advent of a new age. For according to them there are eight ages in all, differing from one another in the lives and customs of men, and to each of these God has appointed a definite number of times and seasons, which is completed by the circuit of a great year and whenever this circuit has run out, and another begins, some wonderful sign is sent from earth or heaven, so that it is at once clear to those who have studied such subjects and are versed in them, that men of other habits and modes of life have come into the world, who are either more or less of concern to the gods than their predecessors were. All things, they say, undergo great changes, as one age succeeds another, and especially the art of divination. At one point it rises in esteem and is successful in its predictions, because manifest and genuine signs are sent forth from the deity, and again in another age it is in small repute, being off-hand for the most part, and seeking to grasp the future by means of faint and blind senses. Such at any rate was the tale told by the wisest of the Tuscans, who were thought to know much more about it than the rest. Moreover, while the Senate was busied with the soothsayers about these prodigies, and holding its session in the temple of Bologna, a sparrow came flying in before the eyes of all, with a grasshopper in its mouth, a part of which it threw down and left there, and then went away with the other part. 
From this the diviners apprehended a quarrelsome dissension between the landed proprietors and the populace of the city and forum, for the latter is vociferous like a grasshopper, while the former haunt the fields like the sparrow. Marius now made alliance with Sulpicius, who was a tribune of the people, a man second to none in prime villainies, so that the question was not whom else he surpassed in wickedness, but in what he surpassed his own wickedness. For the combination of cruelty, effrontery, and rapacity in him was regardless of shame and of all evil since he sold the Roman citizenship to freedmen and aliens at public sale, and counted out the price on a money-table which stood in the forum. Moreover, he maintained three thousand swordsmen, and had about him a body of young men of the equestrian order, who were ready for everything, and whom he called his anti-senate. Further, though he got a law passed that no senator should incur a debt of more than two thousand drachmas, he himself left behind him after death a debt of three millions. This man was now let loose upon the people by Marius, and after confounding all things by force and the sword, he proposed certain vicious laws and particularly one offering to Marius the command in the Mithridatic War. To prevent voting on these, the consuls decreed suspension of public business, whereupon Sulpicius led a mob against them, as they were holding an assembly near the temple of Castor and Pollux, and, amongst many others, slew also the young son of Pompeius, the consul in the Forum but Pompeius himself made his escape unnoticed. Sulla, however, after having been pursued into the house of Marius, was forced to come forth and rescind the decree for suspension of public business, and it was because he did this that Sulpicius, though he deposed Pompeius, did not take the consulship away from Sulla, but merely transferred the expedition against Mithridates to the command of Marius. He also sent military tribunes at once to Nola, who were to take over the army there and conduct it to Marius. But Sulla succeeded in making his escape and reaching the camp first, and his soldiers, when they learned what had happened, stoned the tribunes to death in return for which Marius and his partisans in the city went to slaying the friends of Sulla and plundering their property. Then there were removals and flights, some passing continually from camp to city, and others from city to camp. The Senate was not its own master, but was governed by the dictates of Marius and Sulpicius and when it learned that Sulla was marching against the city, it sent two of the praetors, Brutus and Servilius, to forbid his advance. These men addressed Sulla with too much boldness, whereupon his soldiers would have gladly torn them to pieces, but contented themselves with breaking their faces, stripping them of their senatorial togas, insulting them in many ways, and then sending them back to the city. Here a terrible dejection was produced by the mere sight of them, stripped of their praetorial insignia, and by their announcement that the sedition could no longer be checked, but must run its course. Marius and his partisans then busied themselves with preparations, while Sulla, at the head of six full legions, moved with his colleague from Nola, his army, as he saw, being eager to march at once against the city, although he himself wavered in his own mind, and feared the danger. But after he had offered a sacrifice, Postumius the soothsayer learned what the omens were, 
and stretching out both hands to Sulla, begged that he might be bound and kept a prisoner until the battle, assuring him that he was willing to undergo the extremest penalty if all things did not speedily come to a good issue for him. It is said also that to Sulla himself there appeared in his dreams a goddess whom the Romans learned to worship from the Cappadocians, whether she is Luna or Minerva or Bellona. This goddess, as Sulla fancied, stood by his side and put into his hand a thunderbolt, and naming his enemies one by one, bade him smite them with it, and they were all smitten and fell and vanished away. Encouraged by the vision, he told it to his colleague, and at break of day led on towards Rome. When he had reached Pictae, he was met by a deputation from the city, which begged him not to advance to an immediate attack, since the Senate had voted that he should have all his rights. He therefore agreed to encamp there, and ordered his officers to measure out the ground as was usual for the camp, so that the deputation returned to the city, believing that he would do so. But no sooner were they gone than he sent forward Lucius Basilus and Caius Mummius, who seized for him the city gate and the walls on the Esquiline hill. Then he himself followed hard after them with all speed. Basilus and his men burst into the city and were forcing their way along, when the unarmed multitude pelted them with stones and tiles from the roofs of the houses, stopped their further progress, and crowded them back to the wall. But by this time Sulla was at hand, and seeing what was going on, shouted orders to set fire to the houses, and seizing a blazing torch, led the way himself, and ordered his archers to use their firebolts, and shoot them up at the roofs. This he did not from any calm calculation, but in a passion, and having surrendered to his anger the command over his actions, since he thought only of his enemies, and without any regard or even pity for friends and kindred and relations, made his entry by the aid of fire, which made no distinction between the guilty and the innocent. Meanwhile Marius, who had been driven back to the temple of Tellus, made a proclamation calling the slaves to his support under promise of freedom. But the enemy coming on, he was overpowered and fled from the city. End of Sulla Part 1《of Plutarch's Parallel Lives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Burlinson. Volume 4 of Plutarch's Parallel Lives of the Noble Greeks and Romans. Translated by Bernadotte Perrin. Sulla, Part Two. Sulla now called together the Senate, and had a sentence of death passed on Marius himself, and a few others, among whom was Sulpicius, the tribune of the people. But Sulpicius was killed, after he had been betrayed by a servant, to whom Sulla first gave his freedom, and then had him thrown down the Tarpeian rock. Moreover, he set a price on the head of Marius, an act both ungrateful and impolitic, since it was in his house that he had found refuge, and surrendered himself a little before this, and had been let off safe. And yet had Marius at that time not let Sulla go, but given him up to death at the hands of Sulpicius, he might have been absolute master in Rome. 
Nevertheless, he spared his life, and when after a few days he had given him the same opportunity, he did not obtain like mercy. By these proceedings, Sulla won the secret dislike of the Senate, but the people's hatred and indignation was made manifest to him by their acts. For instance, they ignominiously rejected Nonius, his nephew, and Servius, who were his candidates for offices, and appointed others, whose preferment they thought would be most vexing to him. But he pretended to be pleased at this, saying that the people, in doing as it pleased, enjoyed a freedom which was due to him, and out of deference to the hatred of the multitude, allowed Lucius Cinna, a man of the opposite faction, to be invested with the consulship, after binding him by solemn oaths to be favorable to his policies. And Cinna went up to the capital with a stone in his hand, and took the oaths, and then, after praying that if he did not maintain his good will towards Sulla, he might be cast out of the city, as the stone from his hand, he threw the stone upon the ground in the sight of many people. But as soon as he had entered upon his office, he tried to subvert the existing order of things, and had an impeachment prepared against Sulla, and appointed Virginius, a tribune of the people, to be his accuser. But Sulla, ignoring alike accuser and court, set out against Mithridates. And it is said that about the time when Sulla was moving his armament from Italy, Mithridates, who was staying at Pergamum, was visited with many other portents from heaven, and that a victory with a crown in her hand, which the Pergamenians were lowering towards him by machinery of some sort, was broken to pieces just as she was about to touch his head, and the crown went tumbling from her hand to the ground in the midst of the theatre, and was shattered. Whereat the people shuddered, and Mithridates was greatly dejected, although at that time his affairs were prospering beyond his hopes. For he himself had wrested Asia from the Romans, and Bithynia and Cappadocia from their kings, and was now set down in Pergamum, dispensing riches, principalities, and sovereignties to his friends. And of his sons, one was in Pontus and Bosporus, holding without any opposition the ancient realm as far as the deserts beyond Lake Makotus, while Ariarathes was overrunning Thrace and Macedonia with a large army, and trying to win them over. His generals, too, with forces under them, were subduing other regions, and the greatest of them, Archelaus, who with his fleet controlled the entire sea, was subjugating the Cyclades, and all the other islands which lie to the east of Cape Malaya, and was in possession of Euboea itself, while from his headquarters at Athens he was bringing into revolt from Rome the peoples of Greece as far as Thessaly, although he met with slight reverses at Cheronia. For here he was confronted by Brutius Sura, who was a lieutenant of Sentius, the praetor of Macedonia and a man of superior courage and prudence. This man, as Archelaus came rushing like a torrent through Boeotia, opposed him most fiercely, and after thrice giving him battle at Cheronia, repulsed him, and drove him back to the sea. But when Lucius Lucullus ordered him to give place to Sulla, who was coming, and to leave the conduct of the war to him, as the Senate had voted, he at once abandoned Boeotia, and marched back to Sentius, although his efforts were proving successful beyond hope, and although the nobility of his bearing was making Greece well disposed towards a change of allegiance. 
However, these were the most brilliant achievements of Brutius. As for Sulla, he at once received deputations and invitations from the other cities, but Athens was compelled by the tyrant Aristion to side with Mithridates. Against this city, therefore, Sulla led up all his forces, and investing the Piraeus, laid siege to it, bringing to bear upon it every sort of siege engine, and making all sorts of assaults upon it. And yet, if he had been patient a little while, he might have captured the upper city without hazard, since it lacked the necessities of life, and was already reduced by famine to the last extremity. But since he was eager to get back home, and feared the spirit of revolution there, he ran many risks, fought many battles, and made great outlays that he might hasten on the way, in which, not to speak of his other munitions, the operation of the siege engines called for ten thousand pairs of mules, which were employed daily for this service. And when timber began to fail, owing to the destruction of many of the works, which broke down of their own weight, and to the burning of those which were continually smitten by the enemy's firebolts, he laid hands upon the sacred groves and ravaged the academy, which was the most wooded of the city's suburbs, as well as the Lyceum. And since he needed much money also for the war, he diverted to his uses the sacred treasures of Helos, partly from Epidaurus and partly from Olympia, sending for the most beautiful and most precious of the offerings there. He wrote also to the Amphictians at Delphi that it was better to have the treasures of the gods sent to him, for he would either keep them more safely, or, if he spent them, would restore as much. And he sent Caphus the Phocian, one of his friends, with the letter, bidding him receive each article by weight. Caphus came to Delphi, but was loath to touch the sacred objects, and shed many tears in the presence of the Amphictyons over the necessity of it. And when some of them declared they heard the sound of the god's lyre in the inner sanctuary, Caphus, either because he believed them, or because he wished to strike Sulla with superstitious fear, sent word to him about it. But Sulla wrote back jocosely, expressing his amazement that Caphus did not understand that singing was done in joy, not anger. His orders were therefore to take boldly, assured that the god was willing and glad to give. Accordingly, the rest of the treasure was sent away without the knowledge of the most, certainly of the Greeks. But the silver jar, the only one of the royal gifts which still remained, was too large and heavy for any beast of burden to carry, and the Amphictyons were compelled to cut it into pieces. As they did so, they called to mind how Titus Flaminius and Manius Aelius, and now Aemilius Paulus, of whom one had driven Antiochus out of Greece, and the others had subdued in war the kings of Macedonia. These had not only spared the sanctuaries of the Greeks, but had even made additional gifts to them, and greatly increased their honor and dignity. But these were lawful commanders of men, who were self-restrained, and had learned to serve their leaders without a murmur, and they were themselves kingly in spirit, and simple in their personal expenses, and indulged in moderate and specified public expenditures, deeming it more disgraceful to flatter their soldiers than to fear their enemies. The generals of this later time, however, who won their primacy by force, not merit, and who needed their armies for service against one another, rather than against the public enemy, 
were compelled to merge the general in the demagogue, and then, by purchasing the services of their soldiers, with lavish sums to be spent on luxurious living, they unwittingly made their whole country a thing for sale, and themselves slaves of the basest men, for the sake of ruling over the better. This was what drove out Marius, and then brought him back again against Sulla. This made Cinna, the assassin of Octavius, and Fimbria of Flaccus. And it was Sulla who, more than any one else, paved the way for these horrors, by making lavish expenditures upon the soldiers under his own command, that he might corrupt and win over those whom others commanded, so that in making traitors of the rest, and profligates of his own soldiers, he had need of much money, and especially for this siege. For he was possessed by some dreadful and inexorable passion for the capture of Athens, either because he was fighting with a sort of ardor against the shadow of the city's former glory, or because he was provoked to anger by the scurrilous abuse which had been showered from the walls upon himself and Metella by the tyrant Aristion, who always danced in mockery as he scoffed. This man's spirit was compounded of licentiousness and cruelty. He had made himself a sink for the worst of the diseases and passions of Mithridates, and in these her last days he had fixed himself, like a fatal malady, upon a city which had previously passed safely through countless wars and many usurpations and seditions. This man, although at the time a bushel of wheat sold in the city for a thousand drachmas, and although men made food for themselves of the fever few which grew on the Acropolis, and boiled down shoes and leather oil flasks to eat, was himself continually indulging in drinking bouts and revels by daylight, was dancing in armor and making jokes to deride the enemy, while he suffered the sacred lamp of the goddess to go out for lack of oil. And when the chief priestess begged him for a twelfth of a bushel of wheat, he sent her so much pepper. And when the senators and priests came to him in suppliant array, and entreated him to take pity on the city, and come to terms with Sulla, he scattered them with a volley of arrows. But after a long time, at last, with much ado, he sent out two or three of his fellow revelers to treat for peace, to whom Sulla, when they made no demands which could save the city, but talked in lofty strains about Theseus and Eumolpus and the Persian wars, said, Be off, my dear sirs, and take these speeches with you for I was not sent to Athens by the Romans to learn its history, but to subdue its rebels. But at this juncture, as it is said, certain soldiers in the Ceramicus overheard some old men talking with one another, and abusing the tyrant, because he did not guard the approaches to the wall at the Heptacalcum, at which point alone it was possible and easy for the enemy to get over. When this was reported to Sulla, he did not make light of it, but went thither by night, and after seeing that the place could be taken, set himself to the work, and Sulla himself says in his memoirs that Marcus Ateus was the first man to mount the wall, and that when an enemy confronted him, he gave him a downward cut on the helmet with his sword, and shattered the weapon. He did not, however, yield ground, but remained and held his own. At any rate, the city was taken at this point, as the oldest Athenians used to testify, and Sulla himself, 
after he had thrown down and levelled with the ground the wall between the Piraic and the sacred gate, led his army into the city at midnight. The sight of him was made terrible by blasts of many trumpets and bugles, and by the cries and yells of the soldiery now let loose by him for plunder and slaughter, and rushing through the narrow streets with drawn swords. There was therefore no counting of the slain, but their numbers are to this day determined only by the space that was covered with blood. For without mention of those who were killed in the rest of the city, the blood that was shed in the marketplace covered all the Ceramicus inside the Dipolon gate. Nay, many say that it flowed through the gate and deluged the suburb. But although those who were thus slain were so many, there were yet more who slew themselves, out of yearning pity for their native city, which they thought was going to be destroyed. For this conviction made the best of them give up in despair and fear to survive, since they expected no humanity or moderation in Sulla. However, partly at the instance of the exiles Mydeus and Caliphon, who threw themselves at his feet in supplication, and partly because all the Roman senators who were in his following interceded for the city, being himself also by this time sated with vengeance, after some words in praise of the ancient Athenians, he said that he forgave a few for the sake of many, the living for the sake of the dead. He took Athens, as he says himself in his memoirs, on the Calends of March, a day which corresponds very nearly with the first of the month Anisterion. In this month, as it happens, the Athenians perform many rites commemorating the destruction and devastation caused by the flood, believing that the ancient deluge occurred at about this time. On the capture of the town, the tyrant took refuge in the Acropolis, and was besieged there by Curio, who was appointed to this task. He held out for a considerable time, but was driven by the pangs of thirst to give himself up. And the deity at once gave a manifest token in the matter, for at the very hour of the day when Curio brought his prisoner down, clouds gathered in an open sky, and a quantity of rain fell and filled the Acropolis with water. Not long after, Sulla took the Piraeus also, and burnt most of it, including the arsenal of Philo, a marvellous work. Meanwhile, Taxiles, the general of Mithridates had come down from Thrace and Macedonia with a hundred thousand footmen, ten thousand horse, and ninety scythe-bearing four-horse chariots, and summoned Archelaus to join him. Archelaus still lay with his feet at Munichia, and was neither willing to quit the sea, nor eager to join battle with the Romans, but planned to protract the war and cut off their supplies. But Sulla understood the situation much better than Archelaus did, and therefore transferred his forces into Boeotia, away from regions that were far from fertile, and unable to maintain a population even in time of peace. Most people thought that he had erred in his calculations, because he had abandoned Attica, which was a rough country, and ill-suited for cavalry movements, and thrown himself into the plains and open districts of Boeotia, although he saw that the strength of the barbarians consisted in chariots and cavalry, but in flying from scarcity and famine, as has been said, he was compelled to pursue the danger arising from battle. And furthermore, he was anxious about Hortensius, a bold and capable general 
who was leading a force from Thessaly to Sulla, while the barbarians were closely watching for him in the passes. For these reasons, Sulla transferred his army into Boeotia. But Hortensius was rescued by Caphus, a countryman of mine, and conducted by different routes, of which the barbarians were ignorant, past Parnassus to a spot just below Tithera. This was not so large a city then as it is now, but a fortress surrounded on all sides by steep cliffs, into which those of the Phocians, who in ancient times fled before the advance of Xerxes, betook themselves and were saved. Having encamped here, Hortensius repulsed the enemy by day, and at night descended to Patronus by difficult paths, and made a junction with Sulla, who came to meet him with his army. When they had thus united their forces, they occupied a hill which rose out of the midst of the plains of Veletea, a fertile hill, thickly grown with trees, and supplied with water at its base. Philoboetus is its name, and its situation and natural advantages are most highly praised by Sulla. As they lay encamped there, they appeared to the enemy altogether few in numbers, for they were not more than fifteen hundred horse, and less than fifteen thousand foot. Wherefore the rest of his generals overpowered the objections of Archelaus, and drew up for battle, filling the plain with their horses, chariots, shields, and bucklers. The air could not contain the shouts and clamor of so many nations forming in array. At the same time also the pomp and ostentation of their costly equipment was not without its effect, and use in exciting terror. Indeed, the flashing of their armor, which was magnificently embellished with gold and silver, and the rich colors of their Median and Scythian vests, intermingled with bronze and flashing steel, presented a flaming and fearful sight as they surged to and fro, so that the Romans huddled together behind their trenches, and Sulla, unable by any reasoning to remove their fear, and unwilling to force them into a fight from which they wanted to run away, had to sit still and endure as best he could the sight of the barbarians insulting him with boasts and laughter. This, however, was of service to him above all else, for, owing to their contempt of him, his opponents lapsed into great disorder, since even at their best they were not obedient to their generals, owing to the great number in command. Few of them, therefore, consented to remain within their entrenchments, but the largest part of the throng was lured away by plunder and pillage, and was scattered about the country many days' march from their camp. They are said to have destroyed the city of Panope, and to have attacked Lebedea and despoiled its oracle, although none of their generals ordered them to do so. But Sulla, though chafing and fretting while cities were destroyed before his eyes, would not suffer his soldiers to be idle, but led them out and forced them to dig ditches and divert the Cephasus from its channel, giving no man a respite, and showing himself an inexorable chastiser of those who were remiss, in order that they might be worn out at their tasks, and induced by their hardships to welcome danger. And so it fell out. For on the third day of their drudgery, as Sulla passed by, they begged and clamored to be led against the enemy. But Sulla said their words showed not a willingness to fight, but an unwillingness to labor. 
If, however, they were really disposed to fight, then he bade them take their arms and go at once yonder, pointing them to what had formerly been the Acropolis of the Peripotamil. At this time, however, the city had been destroyed, and only a rocky and precipitous crest remained, separated from Mount Hadilium by the breadth of the river Asus, which then falls into the Cephasus at the very base of the mountain, becomes impetuous in its flow after the confluence, and makes the citadel a strong place for a camp. For this reason, and because he saw the Chalcaspides, or bronze shields, of the enemy pushing their way towards it, Sulla wished to occupy the place first. And he did occupy it, now that he had found his soldiers eager for action. And when Archelaus, repulsed from this sight, set out against Chaeronia, and the Chaeronians in Sulla's army besought him not to abandon their city to its fate, he sent out Gabinius, one of his tribunes, with one legion, and let the Chaeronians also go, who wished, but were unable, to get into the city before Gabinius. So efficient was he, and more eager to bring succor than those who begged that succor should be given. Juba, however, says it was not Gabinius, but Arisius, who was thus sent. At any rate, so narrowly did my native city escape its peril. From Lebedea and the cave of Trophonius, favorable utterances and oracles announcing victory were now sent out to the Romans. Of these the inhabitants of the country have more to say, but Sulla himself has written in the tenth book of his memoirs how Quintus Titius, a prominent man among the Romans, doing business in Greece, came to him immediately after he had won his victory at Chaeronia, with tidings that Trophonius predicted for him a second battle and victory in that neighborhood within a short time. And after him, a legionary soldier, Salvinius by name, brought him from the god a statement of the issue which affairs in Italy were going to have. But both agreed about the source of their oracle, for they said they had beheld one who in beauty and majesty was like unto Olympian Jove. Sulla now crossed the Asus, and after advancing to the foot of Mount Hedilium, encamped over against Archelaus, who had thrown up strong entrenchments between Mounts Acontium and Hedilium at the so-called Asian Plain. The spot in which he encamped, moreover, is to this day called Archelaus after him. After one day's respite, Sulla left Morena behind with one legion and two cohorts, to obstruct the enemy if they attempted to draw up their forces, while he himself held sacrifices on the banks of the Cephasus, and, when the rites were over, moved on towards Chaeronia to pick up the forces stationed there, and to reconnoitre Thurium, as it is called, which had been already occupied by the enemy. This is a conical-shaped hill, with a craggy peak. We call it Orthopagus, and at its foot is the river Molus and a temple of Apollo Thurius. The god got this surname from Thuro, the mother of Chaeron, who was founder of Chaeronia, according to tradition. But some say that the cow which was given by Apollo to Cadmus as his guide appeared there and that the place is named as it is from her, for being the Phoenician word for cow. As Sulla drew near to Chaeronia, the tribune who had been stationed in the city, with his men in full armor, came to meet him, carrying a wreath of laurel. 
after Sulla had accepted this, greeted the soldiers, and animated them for the coming danger, two men of Chaeronia accosted him, Homoloicus and Axidemus, and engaged to cut off the troops in possession of Thurium if he would give them a few soldiers, for there was a path out of sight of the barbarians leading from the so-called Petracus along past the museum to that part of Thurium which was over their heads, and by taking this path it would not be difficult, they said, to fall upon them and either stone them to death from above or force them into the plain. After Gabinius had borne testimony to the men's courage and fidelity, Sulla ordered them to make the attempt, while he himself proceeded to form his line of battle, and to dispose his cavalry on either wing, taking command of the right himself, and assigning the left to Morena. His lieutenants, Galba and Hortensius, with cohorts of reserves, stationed themselves on the heights in the rear, to guard against attacks on the flanks, for the enemy were observed to be making their wing flexible and light, for evolution with large bodies of horse and light infantry, purposing to extend it and envelop the Romans. Meanwhile the Chaeronians, over whom Arisius had been placed in command by Sulla, made their way unnoticed around Thorium, and then showed themselves suddenly, producing great confusion and rout among the barbarians, and slaughter at one another's hands for the most part, for they did not hold their ground, but rushed down the steeps, falling upon their own swords and crowding one another down the precipices, while their enemies pressed upon them from above and smote their exposed bodies, so that three thousand of them fell on Thurium. Of the fugitives, some were met by Murena, who had already formed his army, and were cut off and slain. Others pushed their way towards the camp of their friends, and falling pell-mell upon their lines, filled the greater part of them with terror and confusion and inflicted a delay upon their generals which was especially harmful to them. For Sulla promptly charged upon them while they were in confusion, and by abridging the space between the armies with the speed of his approach, robbed the scythe-bearing chariots of their efficiency. For these are of most avail after a long course, which gives them velocity and impetus for breaking through an opposing line. But short starts are ineffectual and feeble, as in the case of missiles which do not get full propulsion. And this proved true now in the case of the barbarians. The first of their chariots were driven along feebly and engaged sluggishly, so that the Romans, after repulsing them, clapped their hands and laughed and called for more, as they were wont to do at the races in the circus. Thereupon the infantry forces engaged, the barbarians holding their pikes before them at full length, and endeavoring, by locking their shields together, to keep their line of battle intact, while the Romans threw down their javelins drew their swords, and sought to dash the pikes aside, that they might get at their enemies as soon as possible, in the fury that possessed them. For they saw drawn up in front of the enemy fifteen thousand slaves, whom the king's generals had set free by proclamation in the cities, and enrolled among the men-at-arms. And a certain Roman centurion, is reported to have said that it was only at the Saturnalia, so far as he knew, that slaves participated in the general license. These men, however, owing to the depth and density of their array, and the unnatural courage with which they held their ground, 
were only slowly repulsed by the Roman men-at-arms, but, last, the fiery bolts and the javelins, which the Romans in the rear ranks plied unsparingly, threw them into confusion, and drove them back. End of Sulla, Part 2 Part 14 of Volume 4 of Plutarch's Parallel Lives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Burlinson. Volume 4 of Plutarch's Parallel Lives of the Noble Greeks and Romans. Translated by Bernadotte Perrin. Sulla, Part 3. Archelaus now extended his right wing to envelop Sulla's line, whereupon Hortensius sent his cohorts against him on a quick run, intending to attack his flank. But Archelaus wheeled swiftly against him his two thousand horsemen, and Hortensius, forced aside by superior numbers, was keeping close to the hills, separating himself little by little from the main line, and getting surrounded by the enemy. When Sulla heard of this, he came swiftly to his aid from the right wing, which was not yet engaged. But Archelaus, guessing the truth from the dust raised by Sulla's troops, gave Hortensius the go-by, and, wheeling, set off for the right wing whence Sulla had come, thinking to surprise it without a commander. At the same time, Morena also was attacked by Taxiles with his bronze shields, so that when shouts were borne to his ears from both places, and re-echoed by the surrounding hills, Sulla halted, and was at a loss to know in which of the two directions he ought to betake himself. But having decided to resume his own post, he sent Hortensius with four cohorts to help Morena, while he himself, bidding the fifth cohort to follow, hastened to the right wing. This, of itself, had already engaged Archelaus on equal terms, but when Sulla appeared, they drove the enemy back at all points, obtained the mastery, and pursued them to the river and Mount Contium in a headlong flight. Sulla, however, did not neglect Morena in his peril, but set out to aid the forces in that quarter. He saw, however, that they were victorious, and then joined in the pursuit. Many of the barbarians, then, were slain in the plain, but most were cut to pieces as they rushed for their entrenchments, so that only ten thousand out of so many myriads made their escape into Chalcis. But Sulla says he missed only fourteen of his soldiers, and that afterwards, towards evening, two of these came in. He therefore inscribed on his trophies the names of Mars, Victory, and Venus, in the belief that his success in the war was due no less to good fortune than to military skill and strength. This trophy of the battle in the plain stands on the spot where the troops of Archelaus first gave way, by the brook Molus, but there is another planted on the crest of Thurium, to commemorate the envelopment of the barbarians there, and it indicates in Greek letters that Homoloicus and Anaxidamus were the heroes of the exploit. The festival in honor of this victory was celebrated by Sulla in Thebes, where he prepared a stage near the fountain of Oedipus. But the judges were Greeks, 
invited from the other cities since towards the thebans he was irreconcilably hostile he also took away half of their territory and consecrated it to the pythian apollo and olympian zeus giving orders that from its revenues the monies should be paid back to the gods which he had taken from them after this learning that flaccus a man of the opposite faction had been chosen consul and was crossing the ionian sea with an army ostensibly against mithridates but really against himself he set out towards thessaly in order to meet him but when he was come to the city of Melitea, tidings reached him from many quarters that the regions behind him were ravaged again by an army of the king which was no smaller than the former for dorileus having put in at Chalcis with a large fleet on which he brought eighty thousand of the best trained and disciplined men in the army of mithridates at once burst into boeotia and occupied the country he was eager to entice sulla to battle disregarding the protests of archelaus and giving it out that in the previous battle so many myriads had not perished without treachery sulla however turning swiftly back showed dorileus that archelaus was a man of prudence and best acquainted with the roman valor so that after a slight skirmish with sulla near Kilfossium, he was first of those who thought it expedient not to decide the issue by a battle but rather to wear out the war by dint of time and treasure nevertheless archelaus was much encouraged by the nature of the country about orchomenus where they were encamped since it was most favorable as a battlefield for an army superior in cavalry for all of the plains of boeotia this is the largest and fairest and beginning from the city of orchomenus it spreads out smooth and treeless as far as the marshes in which the river Melos loses itself. This rises close under the city of Orchomenus, and is the only Greek river that is copious and navigable at its sources. Moreover, it increases towards the time of the summer solstice, like the Nile, and produces plants like those which grow there, only stunted and without fruit. Its course is short, however, and the greater part of it disappears at once in blind and marshy lakes, while a small portion of it unites with the Sipasus, somewhere near the palace in which the stagnant water is reputed to produce the famous reed for flutes. When the two armies had encamped near each other, Archelaus lay still, but Sulla proceeded to dig trenches on either side, in order that, if possible, he might cut the enemy off from the solid ground which was favorable for cavalry, and force them into the marshes. The enemy, however, would not suffer this, but when their generals sent them forth, charged impetuously and at full speed, so that not only Sulla's laborers were dispersed, but also the greater part of the corps drawn up to protect them was thrown into confusion and fled. Then Sulla threw himself from his horse, seized an ensign, and pushed his way through the fugitives against the enemy, crying, For me, O Romans, an honorable death here! But you, when men ask you where you betrayed your commander, remember to tell them at Archomenus. The fugitives rallied at these words, and two of the cohorts on his right wing came to his aid. These he led against the enemy and routed them. Then he fell back a little distance, 
and after giving his men breakfast, again proceeded to fence the enemy's entrenchments off with his ditches. But they attacked him again in better order than before. Diogenes, the stepson of Archelaus, fought gallantly on their right wing, and fell gloriously, and their archers, being hard pressed by the Romans, so that they had no room to draw their bows, took their arrows by handfuls, struck with them as with swords at close quarters, and tried to beat back their foes, but were finally shut up in their entrenchments, and had a miserable night of it with their slain and wounded. Next day Sulla again led his soldiers up to the enemy's fortifications, and continued trenching them off, and when the greater part of them came out to give him battle, he engaged with them, and routed them. And such was their panic, that no resistance was made, and he took their camp by storm. The marshes were filled with their blood and the lake with their dead bodies, so that even to this day many bows, helmets, fragments of steel breastplates, and swords of barbarian make are found embedded in the mud, although almost two hundred years have passed since this battle. Such, then, are the accounts given of the actions at Caronia and Orchomenus. Now, since Cinna and Carbo at Rome were treating the most eminent men with injustice and violence, many of these had fled from their tyranny and were repairing to Sulla's camp as to a harbor of refuge. And in a little time he had about him a semblance of a senate, Metella also, who had with difficulty stolen herself and her children away came with tidings that his house and his villas had been burned by his enemies, and with entreaties that he would come to the help of his partisans at home. But while he was in doubt what to do, and could neither consent to neglect his country when she was outraged, nor see his way clear to go away and leave unfinished so great a task as the war with Mithridates, there came to him a merchant of Delos, named Archelaus, who secretly brought from Archelaus the king's general certain vague hopes and propositions. The matter was so welcome to Sulla that he was eager to have a personal conference with Archelaus, and they had a meeting on the sea coast near Delium, where the temple of Apollo is. Archelaus began the conference by urging Sulla to abandon Asia and Pontus and sail for the war in Rome, on condition of receiving money, triremes, and as large a force as he wished from the king. Sulla rejoined by bidding him take no further thought for Mithridates, but assume the crown himself in his stead becoming an ally of the Romans, and surrendering to them his ships. And when Archelaus expressed his abhorrence of such treason, Sulla said, So then, thou, Archelaus, who art a Cappadocian, and a slave of a barbarian king, or, if thou wilt, his friend, wilt not consent to a disgraceful deed for such great rewards? But, to me, who am a Roman commander, and Sulla, thou darest to propose treachery. As if thou wert not that Archelaus who fled from Caeronia with a few survivors out of one hundred and twenty thousand men, and who lay hid for two days in the marshes of Orchomenes, and who left Boeotia impassable for the multitude of dead bodies. Upon this, Archelaus changed his tone, and as a humble suppliant besought him to desist from the war and be reconciled with Mithridates. Sulla granted the request, and terms of agreement were made as follows. 
Mithridates was to renounce Asia and Paphlagonia, restore Bithynia to Nicomedes, and Cappadocia to Ariobarzanes, pay down to the Romans two thousand talents, and give them seventy bronze-armoured ships with their proper equipment. Sulla, on his part, was to confirm Mithridates in the rest of his dominions, and get him voted an ally of the Romans. When these agreements had been made, Sulla turned back and proceeded by way of Thessaly and Macedonia towards the Hellespont, having Archelaus with him and in honour. And when Archelaus fell dangerously ill at Larissa, Sulla stopped his march and cared for him as if he had been one of his own commanding officers. This raised the suspicion that the action at Caronia had not been fairly fought, as well as the fact that Sulla released the other friends of Mithridates, whom he had taken captive, but put to death Aristion the tyrant alone, by poison, who was at enmity with Archelaus. The strongest ground for the suspicion, however, was his gift to the Cappadocian of about two thousand acres of land in Euboea, and his bestowing upon him the title of friend and ally of the Romans. At any rate, on these points, Sulla defends himself in his memoirs. At this time also ambassadors from Mithridates arrived, and when they declared that he accepted the other terms, but demanded that Paphlagonia be not taken away from him, and that as to the ships no agreement whatsoever should be made, Sulla flew into a passion, and said, What say ye? Mithridates maintains his claim to Paphlagonia, and refuses to give the ships, when I thought he would prostrate himself humbly before me, if I should leave him but that right hand of his, with which he took the lives of so many Romans. However, he will quickly talk in another strain after I have crossed into Asia, now he sits in Pergamum and directs a war which he has not seen. The ambassadors, accordingly, were frightened, and held their peace, but Archelaus entreated Sulla, and tried to soften his anger, laying hold of his right hand and weeping, and finally he obtained Sulla's consent to send him in person to Mithridates, for he said that he would have the peace ratified on Sulla's terms, or, if he could not persuade the king, would kill himself. Upon these assurances Sulla sent him away, and then himself invaded the country of the Medi, and after ravaging the most of it, turned back again into Macedonia, and received Archelaus at Philippi. Archelaus brought him word that all was well, but that Mithridates insisted on a conference with him. Fimbria was chiefly responsible for this, who, after killing Flaccus, the consul of the opposite faction, and overpowering the generals of Mithridates, was marching against the king himself. For this terrified Mithridates, and he chose rather to seek the friendship of Sulla. They met accordingly at Dardanus, in the Troad, Mithridates having two hundred ships there, equipped with oars, twenty thousand men-at-arms from his infantry force, six thousand horse, and a throng of scythe-bearing chariots. Sulla, on the other hand, having four cohorts and two hundred horse. When Mithridates came towards him and put out his hand, Sulla asked him if he would put a stop to the war on the terms which Archelaus had made. And as the king was silent, Sulla said, But surely it is the part of suppliants to speak first, while victors need only to be silent. 
Then Mithridates began a defense of himself, and tried to shift the blame for the war partly upon the gods, and partly upon the Romans themselves. But Sulla cut him short, saying that he had long ago heard from others, but now knew of himself, that Mithridates was a very powerful orator, since he had not been at a loss for plausible arguments to defend such baseness and injustice as his. Then he reproached him bitterly, and denounced him for what he had done, and asked him again if he would keep the agreements made through Archelaus. And when he said that he would, then Sulla greeted him with an embrace and a kiss, and later, bringing to him Ariobarzanes and Nicomedes the kings, he reconciled with them. Mithridates, accordingly, after handing over to Sulla seventy ships and five hundred archers, sailed away to Pontus. But Sulla perceived that his soldiers were incensed at the peace which he had made. They thought it a terrible thing to see the most hostile of kings, who had caused one hundred and fifty thousand of the Romans in Asia to be massacred on a single day, go sailing off with wealth and spoils from Asia, which he had for four years continued to plunder and levy taxes on. He therefore defended himself to them by saying that he would not have been able to carry on war with Mithridates and Fimbria too, if they had both joined forces against him. Then he set out from thence against Fimbria, who was encamped near Thysteria, and halting his army nearby, began to fortify his camp. But the soldiers of Fimbria came forth from their camp without any armor on, and welcomed Sulla's soldiers, and joined them eagerly in their labors. And when Fimbria saw this change in their allegiance, fearing that Sulla was irreconcilable, he laid violent hands on himself in the camp. Sulla now laid a public fine upon Asia of twenty thousand talents, and utterly ruined individual families by the insolent outrages of the soldiers quartered on them. For orders were given that the host should give his guest four tetradrachmas every day, and furnish him, and as many friends as he might wish to invite, with a supper, and that a military tribune should receive fifty drachmas a day, and two suits of clothing one to wear when he was at home, and another when he went abroad. Having put to sea with all his ships from Ephesus, on the third day he came to anchor in Piraeus. He was now initiated into the mysteries, and seized for himself the library of Apelicon the Tyan, in which were most of the treatises of Aristotle and Theophrastus at that time not yet well known to the public. But it is said that after the library was carried to Rome, Tyrannio the grammarian arranged most of the works in it, and that Andronicus the Rhodian was furnished by him with copies of them, and published them, and drew up the lists now current. The older peripatetics were evidently of themselves accomplished and learned men, but they seem to have had neither a large nor an exact acquaintance with the writings of Aristotle and Theophrastus, because the estate of Neleus of Sepsis, to whom Theophrastus bequeathed his books, came into the hands of careless and illiterate people. While Sulla was tarrying at Athens, his feet were attacked by numbness, and a feeling of heaviness, which Strabo says is premonitory gout. He therefore crossed the straits to Adepsus, and used the hot waters there, taking a holiday at the same time, 
and passing his time pleasantly with the theatrical artists. Once, as he was walking along the seashore, certain fishermen brought him some very fine fish. Being delighted with their gift, and learning that they were from Helle, what, said he, is any man of Helle still alive? For when he was pursuing the enemy after his victory at Orchomenes, he had destroyed three cities of Boeotia together, Anthedon, Larinna, and Helle. The men were speechless with terror, but Sulla smiled and bade them depart in peace, since they had brought with them no mean or despicable intercessors. The men of Hele say that this gave them courage to go back again in a body to their city. And now Sulla, having passed through Thessaly and Macedonia, down to the sea, was preparing to cross from Dyrrachium to Brundisium with twelve hundred ships. Nearby is Apollonia, and in its vicinity is the Nymphaeum, a sacred precinct, which sends forth in various places from its green dell and meadows streams of perpetually flowing fire. Here, they say, a satyr was caught asleep, such an one as sculptors and painters represent, and brought to Sulla, where he was asked, through many interpreters, who he was. And when at last he uttered nothing intelligible, but with difficulty omitted a hoarse cry that was something between the neighing of a horse and the bleating of a goat, Sulla was horrified and ordered him out of his sight. When Sulla was about to transport his soldiers, and was in fear lest when they had reached Italy they should disperse to their several cities, in the first place they took an oath of their own accord to stand by him, and to do no damage to Italy without his orders. And then, seeing that he needed much money, they made a free will offering and contribution, each man according to his abundance. Sulla, however, would not accept their offering, but after thanking them and rousing their courage, crossed over to confront, as he himself says, fifteen hostile commanders with four hundred and fifty cohorts. But the deity gave him most unmistakable foretokens of his successes. For after he had sacrificed at once, where he had landed at Tarentum, the victim's liver was seen to have an impression of a wreath of laurel, with two fillets hanging from it. And a little while before he crossed over from Greece, there was seen on Mount Tifetum in Campania, in the daytime, two great he-goats fighting together, and doing everything that men do when they fight a battle. But it proved to be an apparition, and gradually rising from earth, it dispersed itself generally in the air, like vague phantoms, and then vanished from sight. And not long after, in this very place, when Marius the Younger and Norbanus the Consul led large forces up against him, Sulla, without either giving out an order of battle or forming his own army in companies, but taking advantage of a vigorous general alacrity and a transport of courage in them, routed the enemy and shut up Norbanus in the city of Capua, after slaying seven thousand of his men. It was on account of this success, he says, that his soldiers did not disperse into their several cities, but held together and despised their opponents though these were many times more numerous. He says, moreover, that at Silvium a servant of Pontius met him in an inspired state, declaring that he brought him from Bellona triumph in war and victory, but that if he did not listen, the capital 
would be burnt. And this actually happened, he says, on the day which the man foretold, namely, the sixth day of Quintilia, which we now call July. And still further, at Fidentia, when Marcus Lucullus, one of Sulla's commanders with sixteen cohorts, confronted fifty cohorts of the enemy, although he had confidence in the readiness of his soldiers, still, as most of them were without arms, he hesitated to attack. But while he was waiting and deliberating, from the neighboring plain, which was a meadow, a gentle breeze brought a quantity of flowers and scattered them down upon his army. They settled of their own accord and enveloped the shields and helmets of the soldiers, so that to the enemy these appeared to be crowned with garlands. This circumstance made them more eager for the fray, and they joined battle, won the victory, killed eighteen thousand of the enemy, and took their camp. This Lucullus was a brother of the Lucullus, who afterwards subdued Mithridates and Tigranes. But Sulla, seeing that his enemies still surrounded him on all sides with many armies and large forces, had recourse to craft as well as force, and invited Scipio, the other consul, to make terms of peace. He accepted the proposal, and several meetings and conferences were held, but Sulla continually interposed some pretext for gaining time, and gradually corrupted Scipio's soldiers by means of his own, who were practiced in deceit and every kind of jugglery like their general himself for they entered the camp of their enemies, mingled freely with them, and gradually won them over to Sulla's cause, some at once with money, others with promises, and others still with persuasive flatteries. And finally, when Sulla drew near with twenty cohorts, his men greeted those of Scipio, who answered their greetings and went over to them. Scipio, who was left alone, was taken in his tent, but dismissed, while Sulla, who had used his twenty cohorts as decoy birds to catch the forty cohorts of the enemy, led them all back to his camp. It was on this occasion, too, that Carbo is said to have remarked that in making war upon the fox and the lion in Sulla, he was more annoyed by the fox. After this, at Signia, Marius, with eighty-five cohorts, challenged Sulla to battle. Now Sulla was very eager to have the issue settled on that day, for he had seen a vision in his dreams as follows. He thought he saw the elder Marius, who was long since dead, advising his son Marius to beware of the ensuing day, since it would bring him a great calamity. For this reason, then, Sulla was eager to fight a battle, and was trying to get Dolabella, who was encamped at some distance, to join him. But the enemy beset the roads and hemmed Sulla in, and his soldiers were worn out with fighting to open a passage. Much rain also came upon them while they were at work, and added to their distress. The tribunes therefore came to Sulla and begged him to defer the battle, showing him the soldiers prostrated with weariness and resting on their shields, which they had laid upon the ground. Sulla yielded reluctantly, and gave orders to pitch a camp, but just as his men were beginning to dig a trench and throw up the rampart before it, Marius attacked them confidently, riding ahead of his lines, and hoping to scatter his enemies while they were in disorder and confusion. There the deity fulfilled the words 
which Sulla had heard in his dreams, for Sulla's rage imparted itself to his soldiers, and, leaving off their work, they planted their javelins in the trench, drew their swords, and with a general shout came to close quarters with their enemies. These did not hold their ground long, but took to flight, and were slain in great numbers. Marius fled to Praeneste, but found the gate already closed. A rope was thrown down to him, however, and after fastening this around his waist, he was hoisted to the top of the wall. But there are some who say, and Fenestella is one of these, that Marius knew nothing of the battle, but was forced by loss of sleep and weariness to cast himself upon the ground in a shady place when the signal for battle was given, and there gave way to sleep, and was then roused with difficulty when the rout took place. In this battle, Sulla says he lost only twenty-three men, but killed twenty thousand of the enemy, and took eight thousand prisoners. His other plans were carried out with like success by his generals, Pompey, Crassus, Metellus, and Servilius, for with few or no reverses, these annihilated large forces of the enemy, so that Carbo, the chief supporter of the opposite faction, ran away from his own army by night and sailed off to Libya. End of Sulla, Part 3of Volume 4 of Plutarch's Parallel Lives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Burlinson. Volume 4 of Plutarch's Parallel Lives of the Noble Greeks and Romans. Translated by Bernadotte Perrin. Sulla, Part 4 In Sulla's last struggle, however, Telesinus the Samnite, like a third wrestler who sits by to contend with a weary victor, came near tripping and throwing him at the gates of Rome. For he had collected a large force, and was hastening, together with Lamponius the Lucanian, to Praeneste in order to relieve Marius from the siege. But when he learned that Sulla to his front, and Pompey to his rear, were hurrying up against him, since he was being hemmed in before and behind, valiant and highly experienced soldier that he was, he broke camp by night, and marched with all his army against Rome itself and he came within a little of breaking into the city in its unguarded state. Indeed, he was only nine furlongs from the Colline Gate when he bivouacked against it, highly encouraged and elated with hopes at the thought of having outgeneraled so many great commanders. And when at daybreak the noblest youth of the city rode out against him, he overwhelmed many of them, including Appius Claudius, a man of high birth and character. There was a tumult in the city, naturally, and shrieking of women, and running hither and thither, as though the city were taken by storm. When Balbus, sent forward by Sulla, was first seen riding up at full speed with seven hundred horsemen, he paused just long enough to let the sweat of the horses dry off, and then quickly bridled them again and attacked the enemy. At this juncture Sulla also made his appearance, and ordering his vanguard to take food at once, proceeded to form them in order of battle. 
Dolabella and Torquatus earnestly besought him to wait a little, and not to hazard the supreme issue with his men fatigued and spent, for they were to contend not with Carbo and Marius, but with Samnites and Lucanians, the most inveterate enemies of Rome and the most warlike of peoples. But he put them by and commanded the trumpets to sound the charge, though it was now getting on towards four o'clock in the afternoon. In the struggle which followed, and no other was so fierce, the right wing, where Crassus was posted, was brilliantly successful. But the left was hard-pressed, and in a sorry plight, when Sulla came to its assistance, mounted on a white horse that was mettlesome and very swift. By this horse two of enemy recognized him, and poised their spears for the cast. Sulla himself now did not notice this, but his groom did, and with a cut of the lash succeeded in sending Sulla's horse along, so that the spearheads just grazed its tail and fixed themselves in the ground. There is also a story that Sulla had a little golden image of Apollo from Delphi, which he always carried in his bosom when he was in battle, but that on this occasion he took it out and kissed it affectionately, saying, O Pythian Apollo, now that thou hast in so many struggles raised the fortunate Cornelius Sulla to glory and greatness, can it be that thou hast brought him to the gates of his native city, only to cast him down there, to perish most shamefully with his fellow countrymen? Thus invoking the god, they say, he entreated some of his men, threatened others, and lay hands on others still. But at last his left wing was completely shattered and with the fugitives he sought refuge in his camp, after losing many friends and acquaintances. Not a few also of those who had come out of the city to see the battle were trodden under foot and killed, so that it was thought that all was over with the city, and that the siege of Marius in Praeneste was all but raised. Indeed, many of the fugitives made their way thither, and urged Lucretius Ophella, who had been appointed to conduct the siege, to break camp with all speed since Sulla had fallen, and Rome was in the hands of the enemy. But when the night was now far advanced, messengers came to the camp of Sulla from Crassus, to fetch supper for him and his soldiers. For after conquering the enemy, he had pursued them into Antemne, and was encamped before that city. When, therefore, Sulla learned this, and also that the greater part of the enemy had been destroyed, he came to Antemne at the break of day. There three thousand of the inhabitants sent a deputation to him to sue for mercy, and he promised them safety if they would do some mischief to the rest of his enemies before coming to him. So they, trusting to his promise, attacked the rest of the people in the city, and many were slain by one another's hands. However, the survivors of both parties alike, to the number of six thousand, were collected by Sulla in the circus at Rome, and then the Senate was summoned by him to meet in the temple of Bellona, and at one and the same moment he himself began to speak in the Senate, and those assigned to the task began to cut to pieces the six thousand in the circus. The shrieks of such a multitude, who were being massacred in a narrow space, filled the air, of course, and the senators were dumbfounded. But Sulla, with the calm and unmoved countenance with which he had begun to speak, ordered them to listen to his words 
and not concern themselves with what was going on outside for it was only that some criminals were being admonished by his orders this gave even the dullest roman to understand that in the matter of tyranny there had been an exchange but not a deliverance marius the elder at any rate had been naturally harsh at the outset and power had intensified not altered his disposition but sulla had used his good fortune moderately at first and like a statesman and had led men to expect in him a leader who was attached to the aristocracy and at the same time helpful to the common people furthermore from his youth up he had been of a merry temper and easily moved to tears of pity naturally therefore his conduct fixed a stigma upon officers of great power which were thought to work a change in men's previous characters and render them capricious vain and cruel however whether this is a change and reversal of nature brought about by fortune or rather a revelation when a man is in authority of underlying baseness were matter for determination in some other treatise sulla now busied himself with slaughter and murders without number or limit filled the city many too were killed to gratify private hatreds although they had no relations with sulla but he gave his consent in order to gratify his adherents at last one of the younger men caius metellus made bold to ask sulla in the senate what end there was to be of these evils and how far he would proceed before they might expect such things to cease we do not ask thee he said to free from punishment those whom thou hast determined to slay but to free from suspense those whom thou hast determined to save and when sulla answered that he did not yet know whom he would spare well then said metellus in reply let us know whom thou intendest to punish this sulla said he would do some however say that it was not metellus but fufidius one of sulla's fawning creatures who made this last speech to him be that as it may sulla at once proscribed eighty persons without communicating with any magistrate and in spite of the general indignation after a single day's interval he proscribed two hundred and twenty others and then on the third day as many more referring to these measures in a public harangue he said that he was proscribing as many as he could remember and those who now escaped his memory he would proscribe at a future time he also proscribed any one who harbored and saved a proscribed person making death the punishment for such humanity without exception of brother son or parents but offering any one who slew a proscribed person two talents as a reward for his murderous deed even though a slave should slay his master or a son his father and what seemed the greatest injustice of all he took away all civil rights from the sons and grandsons of those who had been proscribed and confiscated the property of all moreover proscriptions were made not only in rome but also in every city of italy and neither temple of god nor hearth of hospitality nor paternal home was free from the stain of bloodshed but husbands were butchered in the embraces of their wedded wives and sons in the arms of their mothers those who fell victims to political resentment and private hatred 
were as nothing compared with those who were butchered for the sake of their property nay even the executioners were prompted to say that his great house killed this man his garden that man his warm baths another quintus aurelius a quiet and inoffensive man who thought his only share in the general calamity was to condole with others in their misfortunes came into the forum and read the list of the proscribed and finding his own name there said ah woe is me my alban estate is prosecuting me and he had not gone far before he was dispatched by some one who had hunted him down meanwhile marius the younger at the point of being captured slew himself and sulla coming to Praeneste, at first gave each man there a separate trial before he executed him. But afterwards, since time failed him, gathered them all together in one place, there were twelve thousand of them, and gave orders to slaughter them, his host alone receiving immunity. But this man, with a noble spirit, told Sulla that he would never owe his safety to the slayer of his country, and, joining his countrymen of his own accord, was cut down with them. But that which Lucius Catiline did was thought to be the most monstrous of all. This man, namely, had killed his brother before the civil struggle was decided, and now asked Sulla to proscribe the man as one still living, and he was proscribed. Then Catiline, returning this favor of Sulla's, killed a certain Marcus Marius, one of the opposite faction, and brought his head to Sulla as he was sitting in the forum, and then, going to the lustral water of Apollo which was near, washed the blood off his hands. But besides his massacres, the rest of Sulla's proceedings also gave offence, for he proclaimed himself dictator, reviving this particular office after a lapse of a hundred and twenty years. Moreover, an act was passed granting him immunity for all his past acts, and for the future, power of life and death, of confiscation, of colonization, of founding or demolishing cities, and of taking away or bestowing kingdoms at his pleasure. He conducted the sales of confiscated estates in such arrogant and imperious fashion, from the tribunal where he sat, that his gifts excited more odium than his robberies. He bestowed on handsome women, musicians, comic actors, and the lowest of freedmen, the territories of nations, and the revenues of cities, and women were married against their will to some of his favorites. In the case of Pompey the Great, at least, wishing to establish relationship with him, he ordered him to divorce the wife he had, and then gave him in marriage Aemilia, daughter of Scaurus and his own wife Metella, whom he tore away from Manius Glabrio, when she was with child by him, and the young woman died in childbirth at the house of Pompey. Lucretius Ophella, who had reduced Marius by siege, gave himself out as a candidate for the consulship, and Sulla at first tried to stop him. But when Ophella came down into the forum with a large and eager following, he sent one of the centurions in his retinue and slew him, himself sitting on a tribunal in the temple of Castor, and beholding the murder from above. The people in the forum seized the centurion and brought him before the tribunal, but Sulla bade them cease their clamor and said that he himself had ordered this deed and commanded them to let the centurion go. 
His triumph, however, which was imposing from the costliness and rarity of the royal spoils, had a greater ornament in the noble spectacle of the exiles. For the most distinguished and influential of the citizens, crowned with garlands, followed in the procession, calling Sulla their saviour and father, since indeed it was through him that they were returning to their native city, and bringing with them their wives and children. And when at last the whole spectacle was over, he gave an account of his achievements in a speech to the people, commemorating the instances of his good fortune with no less emphasis than his deeds of valour, and, finally, in view of these, he ordered that he receive the surname of Fortunate, for this is what the word Felix most nearly means. But he himself, in writing to the Greeks on official business, styled himself Epaphroditus, or Favorite of Venus, and on his trophies in our country his name is thus inscribed, Lucius Cornelius Sulla Epaphroditus. Besides this, when Metella bore him twin children, he named the male child Faustus and the female Fausta, for the Romans call what is auspicious and joyful Faustum, and to such an extent did he put more confidence in his good fortunes than in his achievements, that, although he had slain great numbers of the citizens, and introduced great innovations and changes in the government of the city, he laid down his office of dictator, and put the consular elections in the hands of the people, and when they were held he did not go near them himself, but walked up and down the forum like a private man, exposing his person freely to all who wished to call him to account. Contrary to his wishes, a certain bold enemy of his was likely to be chosen consul, Marcus Lepidus, not through his own efforts, but owing to the success which Pompey had in soliciting votes for him from the people. And so, when Sulla saw Pompey going away from the poles delighted with his victory, he called to him and said, What a fine policy this is of thine young man, to elect Lepidus in preference to Catullus, the most unstable instead of the best of men. Now surely it is high time for thee to be watchful, after strengthening thine adversary against thyself. And in saying this, Sulla was something of a prophet, for Lepidus speedily waxed insolent and went to war with Pompey and his party. On consecrating the tenth of all his substance to Hercules, Sulla feasted the people sumptuously, and his provision for them was so much beyond what was needed that great quantities of meats were daily cast into the river, and wine was drunk that was forty years old and upwards. In the midst of the feasting, which lasted many days, Metella lay sick and dying, and since the priests forbade Sulla to go near her, or to have his house polluted by her funeral, he sent her a bill of divorce, and ordered her to be carried to another house while she was still living. In doing this he observed the strict letter of the law, out of superstition but the law limiting the expense of the funeral, which law he had himself introduced, he transgressed, and spared no outlays. He transgressed also his own ordinances limiting the cost of banquets, when he tried to assuage his sorrow by drinking parties and convivial banquets, where extravagance and ribaldry prevailed. A few months afterwards there was a gladiatorial spectacle, and since the places for men and women in the theatre were not yet separated, but still promiscuous, it chanced that there was sitting near Sulla 
a woman of great beauty and splendid birth. She was a daughter of Messala, a sister of Hortensius, the orator, and her name was Valeria. And it so happened that she had recently been divorced from her husband. As she passed along behind Sulla, she rested her hand upon him, plucked off a bit of nap from his mantle, and then proceeded to her own place. When Sulla looked at her in astonishment, she said, It's nothing of importance, dictator, but I too wish to partake a little in thy felicity. Sulla was not displeased at hearing this. Nay, it was at once clear that his fancy was tickled, for he secretly sent and asked her name, and inquired about her family and history. Then followed mutual glances, continual turnings of the face to gaze, interchanges of smiles, and at last a formal compact of marriage. All this was perhaps blameless on her part, but Sulla, even though she was ever so chaste and reputable, did not marry her from any chaste and worthy motive. He was led away, like a young man, by looks and languishing airs, through which the most disgraceful and shameless passions are naturally excited. However, even though he had such a wife at home, he consorted with actresses, harpists, and theatrical people, drinking with them on couches all day long. For these were the men who had most influence with him now. Roscius the comedian, Sorex the arch-mime, and Metrobius the impersonator of women, for whom, though past his prime, he continued up to the last to be passionately fond, and made no denial of it. By this mode of life he aggravated a disease which was insignificant in its beginnings, and for a long time he knew not that his bowels were ulcerated. This disease corrupted his whole flesh also, and converted it into worms so that although many were employed day and night in removing them, what they took away was as nothing compared with the increase upon him. But all his clothing, baths, hand-basins, and food were infected with that flux of corruption, so violent was its discharge. Therefore he immersed himself many times a day in water, to cleanse and scour his person. But it was of no use, for the change gained upon him rapidly, and the swarm of vermin defied all purification. We are told that in very ancient times, Acastus, the son of Peleus, was thus eaten of worms and died, and in later times, Aleman, the lyric poet, Pherecydes, the theologian, Callisthenes of Olynthus, who was kept closely imprisoned, as also Mucius the jurist, and if mention is to be made of men who had no excellence to commend them, but were notorious for other reasons, it is said that the runaway slave who headed the servile war in Sicily, Eunice by name, was taken to Rome after his capture, and died there of this disease. Sulla not only foresaw his own death, but may be said to have written about it also. For he stopped writing the twenty-second book of his memoirs two days before he died, and he there says that the Chaldeans foretold him that, after an honorable life, he was to end his days at the height of his good fortunes. He says also that his son, who had died a little while before Metella, appeared to him in his dreams, clad in mean attire, and besought his father to put an end to anxious thoughts and come with him to his mother Metella, there to live in peace and quietness with her. However, 
he did not cease to transact the public business for instance ten days before he died he reconciled the opposing factions in dicacartia and prescribed a code of laws for their conduct of the city's government and one day before he died on learning that the magistrate there granius refused to pay a debt he owed the public treasury in expectation of his death he summoned him to his room stationed his servants about him and ordered them to strangle him but with the strain which he put upon his voice and body he ruptured his abscess and lost a great quantity of blood in consequence of this his strength failed and after a night of wretchedness he died leaving two young children by metella for it was after his death that valeria gave birth to a daughter who was called posthuma this being the name which the romans give to children who are born after their father's death many now joined themselves eagerly to lepidus purposing to deprive Sulla's body of the usual burial honours. But Pompey, although offended at Sulla, for he alone of all his friends was not mentioned in his will, diverted some of their purpose by his kindly influence and entreaties, and others by his threats, and then conveyed the body to Rome, and secured for it an honourable as well as a safe interment. And it is said that the women contributed such a vast quantity of spices for it, that apart from what was carried on two hundred and ten litters, a large image of Sulla himself, and another image of a lictor, was moulded out of costly frankincense and cinnamon. The day was cloudy in the morning, and the expectation was that it would rain. But at last, at the ninth hour, the corpse was placed upon the funeral pyre. Then a strong wind smote the pyre and roused a mighty flame, and there was just time to collect the bones for burial. While the pyre was smoldering and the fire was going out, when a heavy rain began to fall, which continued till night, Therefore his good fortune would seem to have lasted to the very end, and taken part in his funeral rites. At any rate, his monument stands in the Campus Martius, and the inscription on it, they say, is one which he wrote for it himself, and the substance of it is that no friend ever surpassed him in kindness, and no enemy in mischief. End of Sulla Part 4《of Volume 4 of Plutarch's Parallel Lives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Burlinson Volume 4 of Plutarch's Parallel Lives of the Noble Greeks and Romans Translated by Bernadotte Perrin Comparison of Lysander and Sulla And now, since we have completed this life also, let us come at once to the comparison. In this respect, then, they were alike, namely, that both were founders of their own greatness. But it was a peculiar virtue in Lysander that he obtained all his high offices with the consent of his fellow citizens, and when affairs were in a sound condition. He did not force anything from them against their will nor did he acquire any power which was contrary to the laws. But in a time of sedition the base man too is in honour. And so in Rome at that time, since the people was corrupt and their government in a distempered state, 
men of various origin rose to power. And it was no wonder that Sulla held sway, when such men as Glaucia and Saturninus drove such men as Metellus from the city, when some of the consuls were butchered in assemblies, when silver and gold purchased arms and men to wield them, and laws were enacted with fire and sword in defiance of all opposition. Now I do not blame the man who, in such a state of affairs, forced his way to supreme power, but I cannot regard his becoming first man, when the city was in such an evil plight, as a proof that he was also the best man. Whereas Lysander, since Sparta was at the height of good government and sobriety, when she sent him forth upon the greatest commands and undertakings, was virtually decided to be first of her first men, and best of her best. Lysander, therefore, though he often surrendered his power into the hands of his fellow-citizens, as often received it back again, since the honour accorded to virtue continued to rank highest in the state. But Sulla, when he had once been chosen leader of an army, remained in arms for ten years together, making himself now consul and now dictator, but always being a usurper. It is true indeed that Lysander attempted, as I have said, to change the form of government, but it was by milder and more legal methods than Sulla's, by persuasion, namely, not by force of arms, nor by subverting everything at once, as Sulla did, but by amending merely the appointment of the kings. And it seemed but natural justice, in a way, that the best of the best should rule in a city which had the leadership in Hellas by virtue of his excellence, and not of his noble birth. For just as a hunter looks for a dog, and not the whelp of a certain bitch, and a horseman for a horse, and not the foal of a certain mare, for what if the foal should prove to be a mule? So the statesman makes an utter mistake if he inquires not what sort of man the ruler is, but from whom he is descended. And indeed the Spartans themselves deposed some of their kings, for the reason that they were not kingly men, but insignificant nobodies. And if vice, even in one of the ancient family, is dishonourable, then it must be virtue itself, and not good birth, that makes virtue honourable. Moreover, the acts of injustice which one wrought were in behalf of his friends, while the others extended to his friends. For it is generally agreed that Lysander committed the most of his transgressions for the sake of his comrades, and that most of his massacres were perpetrated to maintain their power and sovereignty. But Sulla cut down the number of Pompey's soldiers out of jealousy, and tried to take away from Dolabella the naval command which he had given him and when Lucretius Ophella sued for the consulship as a reward for many great services, ordered him to be slain before his eyes, causing all men to regard him with fear and horror because of his murdering his dearest friends. Still further, in their pursuit of riches and pleasures, we discover that the purpose of one was more befitting a commander, that of the other more characteristic of a tyrant. For Lysander appears to have perpetrated no set of wantonness or youthful folly while he enjoyed such great authority and power. Nay, if ever man did, he avoided the praise and reproach of the proverb, lions at home but foxes abroad, 
so sober spartan and restrained was the way of life which he everywhere manifested but sulla allowed neither the poverty of his youth to set bounds to his desires nor the years of his old age but continued to introduce marriage and sumptuary laws for the citizens while he himself was living in lewdness and adultery as sallust says in these courses he so beggared and emptied the city of her wealth that he sold to allied and friendly cities their freedom and independence for money although he was daily confiscating and selling at public auction the wealthiest and greatest estates nay there was no measuring what he lavishly squandered and threw away upon his flatterers for what calculation or economy could be expected in his convivial associations and delights when on a public occasion with the people standing about at the sale of a large property he ordered the crier to knock it down to one of his friends at a nominal price and when another bidder raised the price and the crier announced the advance he flew into a rage saying it is a dreadful wrong my dear citizens and a piece of usurpation that i cannot dispose of my own spoils as i wish but lysander sent home for public use even the presents which had been given to him along with the rest of his spoils not that i commend what he did for he perhaps by his acquisition of money for sparta injured her more than sulla injured rome by robbing her of it but i offer this as a proof of the man's indifference to riches moreover each had a peculiar experience with his own city sulla who knew no restraint in his extravagance tried to bring the citizens into ways of sobriety while lysander filled his city with the passions to which he himself was a stranger the former erred therefore in falling below the standard of his own laws the latter in causing the citizens to fall below his own standard since he taught sparta to want what he himself had learned not to want such was their influence as statesmen but as regards contests in war achievements in generalship number of trophies and magnitude of dangers encountered sulla is beyond compare lysander it is true won two victories in as many naval battles and i will add to his exploits his siege of athens which was really not a great affair although the reputation of it was most brilliant what occurred in boeotia and at haliartus was due perhaps to a certain evil fortune but it looks as though he was injudicious in not waiting for the large forces of the king which had all but arrived from platea instead of allowing his resentment and ambition to lead him into an inopportune assault on the walls with the result that an inconsiderable and random body of men sallied out and overwhelmed him for he received his death wound not as cleombrotus did at leuctra standing firm against the enemy's onsets nor as cyrus did or epimonidas rallying his men and assuring the victory to them these all died the death of kings and generals but lysander threw away his life ingloriously like a common targeteer or skirmisher and bore witness to the wisdom of the ancient spartans in avoiding assaults on walled cities where not only an ordinary man but even a child or a woman may chance to smite and slay the mightiest warrior as achilles they say was slain by paris at the gates 
In Sulla's case, at any rate, it is no easy matter even to enumerate the pitched battles which he won and the myriads of enemies whom he slew. Rome itself he captured twice, and he took the Piraeus of Athens not by famine, as Lysander did, but by a series of great battles, after he had driven Archelaus from the land to the sea. It is important, too, that we consider the character of their antagonists, for I think it was the merest child's play to win a sea fight against Antiochus, Alcibiades' pilot, or to outwit Philocles, the Athenian demagogue. Inglorious foe whose only weapon is a sharpened tongue. Such men as these Mithridates would not have deigned to compare with his groom, nor Marius with his lictor. But of the dentists, consuls, generals, and demagogues who lifted themselves against Sulla, to pass by the rest, who among the Romans was more formidable than Marius? Who among the kings was more powerful than Mithridates? Who among the Italians was more warlike than Lamponius and Telesinus? And yet Sulla banished the first of these, subdued the second, and slew the others. But what is of more weight, in my opinion, than anything yet mentioned, Lysander achieved all his successes with the cooperation of the authorities at home. Whereas Sulla, though he was overpowered by a hostile faction, and in exile, at a time when his wife was being driven from home, his house being demolished, and his friends being slain, when he himself, too, was confronting countless myriads of enemies in Boeotia, and risking his life for his country, set up his trophy of victory, and not even when Mithridates offered him an alliance and forces to wield against his enemies at Rome, would he make any concession whatsoever, or show him kindness even. Nay, he would not so much as greet him or give him his hand, until he heard him say personally that he would relinquish Asia, hand over his ships, and restore Bithynia and Cappadocia to their rightful kings. No act of Sulla's whatsoever appears more honorable than this, or due to a loftier spirit because he set the public interests before his own, and, like dogs of noble breed, did not relax his bite or let go his hold until his adversary had yielded, and then only did he set out to avenge his own private wrongs. And besides all this, their treatment of Athens is of some weight in a comparison of their characters. Sulla, after taking the city, although it had fought against him to support the power and supremacy of Mithridates, restored her to freedom and independence, whereas Lysander, although she had fallen from such a great supremacy and empire, showed her no pity, but took away her democratic form of government and appointed most savage and lawless men to be her tyrants. We may now consider whether we shall err very much from the truth in pronouncing our verdict that Sulla won the more successes, while Lysander had the fewer failings, and in giving to the one the preeminence in self-control and moderation, to the other in generalship and valor. End of Volume 4 of Plutarch's Parallel Lives of the Noble Greeks and Romans, translated by Bernadotte Perrin.